Section one of the Piazza Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Piazza Tales by Herman Melville. Read by John Greenman. Chapter one The Piazza. With fairest flowers, whilst summer lasts and I live here, Fidele. When I removed into the country, it was to occupy an old-fashioned farmhouse which had no piazza, a deficiency the more regretted because not only did I like piazzas, as somehow combining the coziness of indoors with the freedom of outdoors, and it is so pleasant to inspect your thermometer there, but the country round about was such a picture that in berry time no boy climbs hill or crosses vale without coming upon easels planted in every nook and sunburnt painters painting there a very paradise of painters the circle of the stars cut by the circle of the mountains at least so looks it from the house though once upon the mountains no circle of them can you see had the site been chosen five rods off, this charmed ring would not have been. The house is old. Seventy years since, from the heart of the hearthstone hills, they quarried the Kaaba, or holy stone, to which, each Thanksgiving, the social pilgrims used to come. So long ago that, in digging for the foundation, the workmen used both spade and axe, fighting the troglodytes of those subterranean parts, sturdy roots of sturdy wood, encamped upon what is now a long landslide of sleeping meadow, sloping away from my poppy bed. Of that knit wood but one survivor stands, an elm, lonely through steadfastness. Whoever built the house, he builded better than he knew, or else Orion, in the zenith, flashed down his Damocles sword to him some starry night and said, Build there! For how otherwise could it have entered the builder's mind that, upon the clearing being made, such a purple prospect would be his? Nothing less than Greylock, with all his hills about him, like Charlemagne among his peers, now, for a house so situated in such a country, to have no piazza for the convenience of those who might desire to feast upon the view, and take their time and ease about it, seemed as much of an omission as if a picture gallery should have no bench. For what but picture galleries are the marble halls of these same limestone hills? Galleries hung month after month anew with pictures ever fading into pictures ever fresh and beauty is like piety you cannot run and read it tranquillity and constancy with nowadays an easy chair are needed for though of old when reverence was in vogue and indolence was not the devotees of nature doubtless used to stand and adore just as in the cathedrals of those ages the worshippers of a higher power did, yet in these times of failing faith and feeble knees we have the piazzas and the pew. During the first year of my residence the more leisurely to witness the coronation of Charlemagne, weather permitting, they crown him every sunrise and sunset, I chose me on the hillside bank nearby a royal lounge of turf a green velvet lounge with long moss-padded back while at the head strangely enough there grew but i suppose for heraldry three tufts of blue violets in a field argent of wild strawberries and a trellis with honeysuckle i set for canopy very majestical lounge indeed so much so that here, as with the reclining majesty of Denmark in his orchard, a sly earache invaded me. But if damps abound at times in Westminster Abbey, 
because it is so old, why not within this monastery of mountains, which is older? A piazza must be had. The house was wide, my fortune narrow, so that to build a panoramic piazza, one round and round, it could not be. Although, indeed, considering the matter by rule and square, the carpenters, in the kindest way, were anxious to gratify my furthest wishes at I've forgotten how much a foot. Upon but one of the four sides would prudence grant me what I wanted. Now which side? To the east, that long camp of the hearthstone hills fading far away towards Quito, and every fall a small white flake of something peering suddenly, of a coolish morning, from the topmost cliff, the season's new-dropped lamb, its earliest fleece, and then the Christmas dawn, draping those dim highlands with red-barred plaids and tartans, goodly sight from your piazza that goodly sight but to the north is charlemagne can't have the hearthstone hills with charlemagne well the south side apple trees are there pleasant of a balmy morning in the month of may to sit and see that orchard white budded as for a bridal and in october one green arsenal yard such piles of ruddy shot very fine i grant but to the north is charlemagne the west side look an upland pasture alleying away into a maple wood at top sweet in opening spring to trace upon the hillside otherwise gray and bare to trace i say the oldest paths by their streaks of earliest green sweet indeed i can't deny but to the north is charlemagne so charlemagne he carried it it was not long after eighteen forty eight and somehow about that time all round the world these kings uh, they had the casting vote and voted for themselves no sooner was ground broken than all the neighborhood neighbor dives in particular broke too into a laugh piazza to the north winter piazza wants of winter midnights to watch the aurora borealis i suppose hope he's laid in good store of polar muffs and mittens that was in the lion month of march not forgotten are the blue noses of the carpenters and how they scouted at the greenness of the cit who would build his sole piazza to the north but march don't last forever patience and august comes and then in the cool elysium of my northern bower i lazarus in abraham's bosom cast down the hill a pitying glance on poor old dives tormented in the purgatory of his piazza to the south but even in december this northern piazza does not repel nipping cold and gusty though it be and the north wind like any miller bolting by the snow in finest flower for then once more with frosted beard i pace the sleety deck weathering cape horn in summer too canute like sitting here one is often reminded of the sea for not only do long ground swells roll the slanting grain and little wavelets of the grass ripple over upon the low piazza as their beach and the blown down of dandelions is wafted like the spray and the purple of the mountains is just the purple of the billows and a still august noon broods upon the deep meadows as a calm upon the line but the vastness and the lonesomeness are so oceanic, and the silence and the sameness, too, that the first peep of a strange house rising beyond the trees is, for all the world, like spying on the Barbary coast an unknown sail. And this recalls my inland voyage to fairyland, a true voyage, but 
take it all in all, interesting as if invented. From the piazza, some uncertain object I had caught, mysteriously snugged away, to all appearance, in a sort of purpled breast pocket, high up in a hopper-like hollow or sunken angle among the northwestern mountains, yet whether really it was on the mountainside or the mountain top could not be determined, because, though viewed from favorable points, a blue summit, peering up away behind the rest, will, as it were, talk to you over their heads, and plainly tell you that, though he, the blue summit, seems among them, he is not of them, God forbid, and indeed would have you know that he considers himself, as to say truth, he has good right, by several cubits their superior, nevertheless, certain ranges here and there double-filed as in platoons, so shoulder and follow up upon one another, with their irregular shapes and heights, that from the piazza a nigher and lower mountain will, in most states of the atmosphere, effacingly shade itself away into a higher and further one, that an object bleak on the former's crest will, for all that, appear nested in the latter's flank. These mountains, somehow, they play at hide-and-seek, and all before one's eyes. But be that as it may, the spot in question was, at all events, so situated as to be only visible, and then but vaguely, under certain witching conditions of light and shadow. Indeed, for a year or more, I knew not there was such a spot, and might perhaps have never known, had it not been for a wizard afternoon in autumn, late in autumn, a mad poet's afternoon, when the turned maple woods in the broad basin below me, having lost their first vermilion tint, dully smoked like smoldering towns when flames expire upon their prey, and rumor had it that this smokiness in the general air was not all Indian summer, which was not used to be so sick a thing, however mild, but in great part was blown from far-off forests, for weeks on fire in Vermont, so that no wonder the sky was ominous as Hecate's cauldron, and two sportsmen, crossing a red stubble buckwheat field, seemed guilty Macbeth and foreboding Banquo, and the hermit's son, hutted in an Adelum cave, well towards the south, according to his season, did little else but, by indirect reflection of narrow rays, shot down a simplon pass among the clouds, just steadily paint one small, round, strawberry mole upon the wan cheek of northwestern hills. Signal as a candle, one spot of radiance, where all else was shade. Fairies there, thought I, some haunted ring where fairies dance. Time passed, and the following May, after a gentle shower upon the mountains, a little shower islanded in misty seas of sunshine, such a distant shower, and sometimes two and three and four of them all visible together in different parts, as I love to watch from the piazza, instead of thunderstorms, as I used to, which wrap old Greylock like a Sinai, till one thinks Swart Moses must be climbing among scathed hemlocks there. After, I say, that gentle shower, I saw a rainbow, resting its furtive end just where, in autumn, I had marked the mole. Fairies there, thought I, remembering that rainbows bring out the blooms, and that if one can but get to the rainbow's end, his fortune is made in a bag of gold. Yon rainbow's end, would I were there, thought I, and none the less I wished it, for now first noticing what seemed some sort of glen or grotto in the mountainside, at least whatever it was, viewed through the rainbow's medium, it glowed like the Potosi mine. But a workaday neighbor said, no doubt it was but some old barn, an abandoned one, its broadside beaten in, the acclivity its background. But I, though I had never been there, 
I knew better. A few days after, a cheery sunrise kindled a golden sparkle in the same spot as before. The sparkle was of that vividness. It seemed as if it could only come from glass. The building, then, if building after all it was, could at least not be a barn, much less an abandoned one, stale hay ten years musting in it. No, if aught built by mortal, it must be a cottage, perhaps long vacant and dismantled, but this very spring magically fitted up and glazed. Again one noon, in the same direction, I marked, over dimmed tops of terraced foliage, a broader gleam, as of a silver buckler held sunward over some croucher's head, which gleam, experience in like cases taught, must come from a roof newly shingled. This, to me, made pretty sure the recent occupancy of that far cot in fairyland. Day after day now, full of interest in my discovery, what time I could spare from reading the Midsummer Night's Dream and all about Titania, wishfully I gazed off towards the hills, but in vain. Either troops of shadows, an imperial guard with slow pace and solemn defiled along the steeps, or, routed by pursuing light, fled broadcast from east to west, old wars of Lucifer and Michael, or the mountains, though unvexed by these mirrored sham fights in the sky, had an atmosphere otherwise unfavorable for fairy views. I was sorry, the more so because I had to keep my chamber for some time after, which chamber did not face those hills. At length, when pretty well again, and sitting out in the September morning upon the piazza, and thinking to myself, when just after a little flock of sheep the farmer's banded children passed a nutting and said how sweet a day it was after all but what their fathers call a weather breeder and indeed was become so sensitive through my illness as that i could not bear to look upon a chinese creeper of my adoption and which to my delight climbing a post of the piazza had burst out in starry bloom but now, if you removed the leaves a little, showed millions of strange cankerous worms, which, feeding upon those blossoms, so shared their blessed hue as to make it unblessed evermore, worms, whose germs had doubtless lurked in the very bulb which so hopefully I had planted. In this ingrate peevishness of my weary convalescence was I sitting there, when, suddenly, looking off, I saw the golden mountain window, dazzling like a deep-sea dolphin. Fairies there, thought I, once more, the queen of fairies at her fairy window. At any rate, some glad mountain girl. It will do me good. It will cure this weariness to look on her. No more. I'll launch my yawl, ho, cheerly heart, and push away for fairyland, for rainbow's end in fairyland how to get to fairyland by what road i did not know nor could any one inform me not even one edmund spencer who had been there so he wrote me further than that to reach fairyland it must be voyaged to and with faith i took the fairy mountain's bearings and the first fine day when strength permitted got into my yawl high pummeled leather one cast off the fast and away I sailed, free voyager as an autumn leaf. Early dawn, and sallying westward, I sowed the morning before me. Some miles brought me nigh the hills, but out of present sight of them. I was not lost, for roadside goldenrods as guideposts pointed, I doubted not, the way to the golden window. Following them, I came to a lone and languid region, where the grass-grown ways were traveled, but by drowsy cattle that, less waked than stirred by day, seemed to walk in sleep. Browse they did not, the enchanted never eat. At least so says Don Quixote, that sagest sage that ever lived. 
On I went, and gained at last the fairy mountain's base, but saw yet no fairy ring. A pasture rose before me, letting down five moldering bars, so moistly green they seemed fished up from some sunken wreck, a wicked old Ares, long-visaged and with crumpled horn, came snuffing up, and then retreating, decorously led on along a milky way of white weed, past dim clustering Pleiades and Hyades of small forget-me-nots, and would have led me further still his astral path but for golden flights of yellow birds, pilots surely to the golden window, to one side flying before me from bush to bush towards deep woods, which woods themselves were luring, and somehow lured too by their fence banning a dark road, which, however dark, led up. I pushed through, when Ares, renouncing me now for some lost soul, wheeled, and went his wiser way, forbidding and forbidden ground to him. A winter wood road, matted all along with winter green, by the side of pebbly waters, waters the cheerier for their solitude. Beneath swaying fir boughs, petted by no season, but still green in all, on I journeyed, my horse and I, on by an old sawmill, bound down and hushed with vines, that his grating voice no more was heard, on by a deep flume clove through snowy marble, vermil-tinted, where freshet eddies had on each side spun out empty chapels in the living rock, on where jacks in the pulpit, like their Baptist namesake, preached but to the wilderness, on where a huge cross-grain block, fern-bedded, showed where, in forgotten times, man after man had tried to split it, but lost his wedges for his pains, which wedges yet rusted in their holes, on where ages past in step-like ledges of a cascade skull-hollow pots had been churned out by ceaseless whirling of a flintstone ever wearing but itself unworn on by wild rapids pouring into a secret pool but soothed by circling there a while issued forth serenely on to less broken ground and by a little ring where truly fairies must have danced, or else some wheel-tire been heated, for all was bare, still on and up and out into a hanging orchard, where maidenly looked down upon me a crescent moon from morning. My horse hitched low his head, red apples rolled before him, Eve's apples seek no furthers. He tasted one, I another. It tasted of the ground. Fairyland not yet, thought I, flinging my bridle to a humped old tree that crooked out an arm to catch it. For the way now lay where path was none, and none might go but by himself, and only go by daring, through blackberry brakes that tried to pluck me back, though I but strained towards fruitless growths of mountain laurel, up slippery steeps to barren heights, where stood none to welcome. Fairyland not yet, thought I, though the morning is here before me. Foot sore enough and weary, I gained not then my journey's end, but came ere long to a craggy pass, dipping towards growing regions still beyond. A zigzag road, half overgrown with blueberry bushes, here turned among the cliffs, a rent was in their ragged sides through it a little track branched off which upwards threading that short defile came breezily out above to where the mountain top part sheltered northward by a taller brother sloped gently off a space ere darkly plunging and here among fantastic rocks reposing in a herd the foot-track wound half beaten up to a little low-storied grayish cottage capped nun-like with a peaked roof on one slope the roof was deeply weather-stained and nigh the turfy eaves-trough all velvet napped 
No doubt the snail monks founded mossy priories there. The other slope was newly shingled. On the north side, doorless and windowless, the clabbards, innocent of paint, were yet green as the north side of lichened pines or copperless hulls of Japanese junks, becalmed. The whole base, like those of the neighboring rocks, was rimmed about with shaded streaks of richest sod, for with hearthstones in fairyland the natural rock, though housed, preserves to the last, just as in open fields, its fertilizing charm. Only by necessity, working now at a remove, to the sward without. So at least says Oberon, grave authority in fairy lore. Though setting Oberon aside, certain it is that even in the common world the soil, close up to farmhouses, as close up to pasture rocks, is, even though untended, ever richer than it is a few rods off. Such gentle, nurturing heat is radiated there. But with this cottage the shaded streaks were richest in its front and about its entrance where the ground sill and especially the door sill had through long eld quietly settled down no fence was seen no enclosure nearby ferns 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 further woods 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 beyond mountains 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 then sky 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 turned out in aerial commons pasture for the mountain moon nature and but nature house and all even a low cross pile of silver birch piled openly to season up among whose silvery sticks as through the fencing of some sequestered grave sprang vagrant raspberry bushes willful asserters of their right of way the foot-track, so dainty narrow, just like a sheep-track, led through long ferns that lodged. Fairyland at last, thought I. Una and her lamb dwell here. Truly a small abode, mere palanquin set down on the summit, in a pass between two worlds, participant of neither. A sultry hour, and I wore a light hat of yellow sinnet with white duck trousers both relics of my tropic sea-going. Clogged in the muffling ferns, I softly stumbled, staining the knees of sea-green, pausing at the threshold, or rather where threshold once had been, I saw through the open doorway a lonely girl sewing at a lonely window, a pale-cheeked girl, a fly-specked window, with wasps about the mended upper panes, I spoke. She shyly started, like some Tahiti girl, secreted for a sacrifice, first catching sight, through palms, of Captain Cook. Recovering, she bade me enter, with her apron brushed off a stool, then silently resumed her own. With thanks I took the stool, but now, for a space, I too was mute. This, then, is the fairy mountain house and here the fairy queen sitting at her fairy window. I went up to it, downwards directed by the tunneled pass, as through a leveled telescope, I caught sight of a far-off, soft, azure world. I hardly knew it, though I came from it. "'You must find this view very pleasant,' said I at last. "'Oh, sir,' tears starting in her eyes, the first time I looked out of this window I said, Never, never shall I weary of this. And what wearies you of it now? I don't know, while a tear fell. But it is not the view, it is Mariana. Some months back her brother, only seventeen, had come hither, a long way from the other side, to cut wood and burn coal, and she, elder sister, had accompanied him. Long had they been orphans, and now sole inhabitants of the sole house upon the mountain. No guest came, no traveller passed. 
the zigzag perilous road was only used at seasons by the coal wagons the brother was absent the entire day sometimes the entire night when at evening fagged out he did come home he soon left his bench poor fellow for his bed just as one at last wearily quits that too for still deeper rest the bench the bed the grave silent i stood by the fairy window while these things were being told do you know she said at last as stealing from her story do you know who lives yonder i have never been down into that country away off there i mean that house that marble one pointing far across the lower landscape have you not caught it there on the long hillside the field before the woods behind the white shines out against their blue don't you mark it the only house in sight i looked and after a time to my surprise recognized more by its position than its aspect or mariana's description my own abode glimmering much like this mountain one from the piazza the mirage haze made it appear less a farmhouse than king charming's palace i have often wondered who lives there but it must be some happy one again this morning was i thinking so some happy one returned i starting and why do you think that you judge some rich one lives there rich or not i never thought but it looks so happy i can't tell how and it is so far away sometimes i think i do but dream it is there you should see it in the sunset no doubt the sunset gilds it finely but not more than the sunrise does this house perhaps this house the sun is a good sun but it never gilds this house why should it this old house is rotting that makes it so mossy in the morning the sun comes in at this old window to be sure boarded up when first we came a window i can't keep clean do what i may and half burns and nearly blinds me at my sewing besides setting the flies and wasps astir such flies and wasps as only lone mountain houses know see here is the curtain this apron i try to shut it out with then it fades it you see the sun gild this house not that ever mariana saw because when this roof is gilded most then you stay here within the hottest weariest hour of the day you mean sir the sun gilds not this roof it leaked so brother newly shingled all one side did you not see it the north side where the sun strikes most on what the rain has wetted the sun is a good sun but this roof it first scorches and then rots an old house they went west and are long dead they say who built it a mountain house in winter no fox could den in it that chimney place has been blocked up with snow just like a hollow stump yours are strange fancies mariana they but reflect the things then i should have said these are strange things rather than yours are strange fancies as you will and took up her sewing something in those quiet words or in that quiet act it made me mute again while noting through the fairy window a broad shadow stealing on as cast by some gigantic condor floating at brooding poise on outstretched wings i marked how by its deeper and inclusive dusk it wiped away into itself all lesser shades of rock or fern you watch the cloud said mariana no a shadow a cloud's no doubt though i cannot see it how did you know it your eyes are on your work it dusked my work there now the cloud is gone tray comes back how the dog the shaggy dog at noon he steals off of himself to change his shape returns and lies down a while nigh the door don't you see him 
His head is turned round at you, though when you came he looked before him. Your eyes rest but on your work. What do you speak of? By the window, crossing. You mean this shaggy shadow, the nigh one? And yes, now that I mark it, it is not unlike a large black Newfoundland dog. The invading shadow gone, the invaded one returns. But I do not see what casts it. For that you must go without. One of those grassy rocks, no doubt. You see his head, his face, the shadows. You speak as if you saw it, and all the time your eyes are on your work. Trey looks at you, still without glancing up. This is his hour. I see him. Have you then so long sat at this mountain window where but clouds and vapors pass that to you shadows are as things, though you speak of them as of phantoms, that by familiar knowledge working like a second sight you can without looking for them tell just where they are, though as having mice-like feet they creep about and come and go, that to you these lifeless shadows are as living friends, who though out of sight are not out of mind, even in their faces, is it so? That way I never thought of it, but the friendliest one, that used to soothe my weariness so much, coolly quivering on the ferns, it was taken from me, never to return, as Trey did just now. The shadow of a birch. The tree was struck by lightning, and brother cut it up. You saw the cross-pile outdoors, the buried root lies under it, but not the shadow. That is flown, and never will come back, nor ever anywhere stir again. Another cloud here stole along, once more blotting out the dog, and blackening all the mountain, while the stillness was so still, deafness might have forgot itself, or else believed that noiseless shadows spoke. Birds, Mariana, singing birds, I hear none. I hear nothing. Boys and bobolinks, do they never come a-burying up here? Birds, I seldom hear. Boys, never. The berries mostly ripe and fall, few but me the wiser. But yellow birds showed me the way, part way at least and then flew back. I guess they play about the mountainside, but don't make the top their home. And no doubt you think that living so lonesome here, knowing nothing, hearing nothing, little at least, but sound of thunder and the fall of trees, never reading, seldom speaking, yet ever wakeful, this is what gives me my strange thoughts, for so you call them, this weariness and wakefulness together brother who stands and works in open air would i could rest like him but mine is mostly but dull woman's work sitting sitting restless sitting but do you not go walk at times these woods are wide and lonesome lonesome because so wide sometimes tis true of afternoons i go a little way but soon come back again. Better feel lone by hearth than rock. The shadows hereabouts, I know, those in the woods, are strangers. But the night? Just like the day, thinking, thinking. A wheel I cannot stop. Pure want of sleep it is that turns it. I have heard that, for this wakeful weariness, to say one's prayers, and then lay one's head upon a fresh hop pillow look through the fairy window she pointed down the steep to a small garden patch near by mere pot of rifled loam half rounded in by sheltering rocks where side by side some feet apart nipped and puny two hop vines climbed two poles and gaining their tip ends would have then joined over in an upward clasp but the baffled shoots, groping a while in empty air, trailed back whence they sprung. You have tried the pillow, then? Yes. And prayer? Prayer and pillow. Is there no other cure or charm? 
Oh, if I could but once get to yonder house and but look upon whoever the happy being is that lives there. A foolish thought. Oh, why do I think it? Is it that I live so lonesome and know nothing? I, too, know nothing, and therefore cannot answer. But for your sake, Mariana, well could wish that I were that happy one of the happy house you dream you see, for then you would behold him now, and, as you say, this weariness might leave you. Enough. Launching my yawl no more for fairyland, I stick to the piazza. It is my box royal, and this amphitheater, my theater of San Carlo. Yes, the scenery is magical, the illusion so complete. And Madame Meadowlark, my prima donna, plays her grand engagement here, and, drinking in her sunrise note, which, memnon-like, seems struck from the golden window, how far from me the weary face behind it. But every night, when the curtain falls, truth comes in with darkness. No light shows from the mountain. To and fro I walk the piazza deck, haunted by Mariana's face, and many as real a story. End of section one. Section two of the Piazza Tales by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Chapter two A Bartleby, part one. I am a rather elderly man. The nature of my avocations for the last thirty years has brought me into more than ordinary contact with what would seem an interesting and somewhat singular set of men of whom, as yet, nothing that I know of has ever been written. I mean, the law copyists or scriveners. I have known very many of them professionally and privately, and, if I pleased, could relate divers histories at which good-natured gentlemen might smile and sentimental souls might weep. But I waive the biographies of all other scriveners for a few passages in the life of Bartleby, who was a scrivener, the strangest I ever saw or heard of, while of other law copyists I might write the complete life, of Bartleby nothing of that sort can be done. I believe that no materials exist for a full and satisfactory biography of this man. It is an irreparable loss to literature. Bartleby was one of those beings of whom nothing is ascertainable except from the original sources and in his case those are very small. What my own astonished eyes saw of Bartleby, that is all I know of him, except, indeed, one vague report which will appear in the sequel. Ere introducing the Scrivener, as he first appeared to me, it is fit I make some mention of myself, my employé, my business my chambers, and general surroundings, because some such description is indispensable to an adequate understanding of the chief character about to be presented. In primus, I am a man who, from his youth upwards, has been filled with the profound conviction that the easiest way of life is the best. Hence, Though I belong to a profession proverbially energetic and nervous, even to turbulence at times, yet nothing of that sort have I ever suffered to invade my peace. I am one of those unambitious lawyers who never addresses a jury, or in any way draws down public applause. But in the cool tranquility of a snug retreat, do a snug business among rich men's bonds and mortgages and title deeds. All who know me consider me an eminently safe man. The late John Jacob Astor, a personage little given to poetic enthusiasm, had no hesitation in pronouncing my first grand point to be prudence. My next 
method. I do not speak it in vanity, but simply record the fact that I was not unemployed in my profession by the late John Jacob Astor, a name which, I admit, I love to repeat, for it hath a rounded and orbicular sound to it, and rings like unto bullion. I will freely add that I was not insensible to the late John Jacob Astor's good opinion. Some time prior to the period at which this little history begins, my avocations had been largely increased. The good old office, now extinct in the state of New York, of a master of chancery, had been conferred upon me. It was not a very arduous office, but very pleasantly remunerative. I seldom lose my temper, much more seldom indulge in dangerous indignation at wrongs and outrages, but I must be permitted to be rash here, and declare that I consider the sudden and violent abrogation of the office of master in chancery by the new constitution as a blank, blank, premature act. Inasmuch as I had counted upon a life lease of the profits, whereas I only received those of a few short years. But this is by the way. My chambers were upstairs at number blank, blank, Wall Street. At one end they looked upon the white wall of the interior of a spacious skylight shaft, penetrating the building from top to bottom. This view might have been considered rather tame than otherwise, deficient in what landscape painters call life. But if so, the view from the other end of my chambers offered, at least, a contrast, if nothing more. In that direction my windows commanded an unobstructed view of a lofty brick wall, black by age and everlasting shade, which wall required no spy-glass to bring out its lurking beauties, but, for the benefit of all near-sighted spectators, was pushed up to within ten feet of my window-panes. Owing to the great height of the surrounding buildings, and my chambers being on the second floor, the interval between this wall and mine not a little resembled a huge square cistern. At the period just preceding the advent of Bartleby, I had two persons as copyists in my employment, and a promising lad as an office boy. First, turkey. Second, nippers. Third, ginger nut. These may seem names the like of which are not usually found in the directory. In truth, they were nicknames, mutually conferred upon each other by my three clerks, and were deemed expressive of their respective persons, or characters. Turkey was a short, pursy Englishman, of about my own age, that is, somewhere not far from sixty. In the morning, one might say, his face was of a fine, florid hue, but after twelve o'clock, meridian, his dinner hour, it blazed like a grate full of Christmas coals, and continued blazing, but, as it were, with a gradual wane, till six o'clock p.m. or thereabouts, after which I saw no more of the proprietor of the face, which, gaining its meridian with the sun, seemed to set with it, to rise, culminate, and decline the following day, with the like regularity and undiminished glory. There are many singular coincidences I have known in the course of my life, not the least among which was the fact that exactly when Turkey displayed his fullest beams from his red and radiant countenance, just then, too, at that critical moment, began the daily period when I considered his business capacities as seriously disturbed for the remainder of the twenty-four hours. Not that he was absolutely idle or averse to business then, far from it. The difficulty was he was apt to be altogether too energetic. There was a strange, inflamed, flurried, flighty recklessness of activity about him. He would be incautious in dipping his pen into his inkstand. All his blots upon my documents were dropped there after twelve o'clock meridian. Indeed, not only would he be reckless and 
sadly given to making blots in the afternoon, but some days he went further and was rather noisy. At such times, too, his face flamed with augmented blazonry, as if cannel coal had been heaped on anthracite. He made an unpleasant racket with his chair, spilled his sandbox, in mending his pens, impatiently split them all to pieces, and threw them on the floor in a sudden passion, stood up and leaned over his table, boxing his papers about in a most indecorous manner, very sad to behold in an elderly man like him. Nevertheless, as he was in many ways a most valuable person to me, and all the time before twelve o'clock meridian, was the quickest, steadiest creature, too, accomplishing a great deal of work in a style not easily to be matched. For these reasons I was willing to overlook his eccentricities, though, indeed, occasionally I remonstrated with him. I did this very gently, however, because, though the civilest, nay, the blandest and most reverential of men in the morning, yet in the afternoon he was disposed upon provocation to be slightly rash with his tongue, in fact insolent. Now, valuing his morning services as I did, and resolved not to lose them, yet at the same time made uncomfortable by his inflamed ways after twelve o'clock, and being a man of peace, unwilling by my admonitions to call forth unseemly retorts from him, I took upon me one Saturday noon, he was always worse on Saturdays, to hint to him very kindly that perhaps, now that he was growing old, it might be well to abridge his labors. In short, he need not come to my chambers after twelve o'clock, but dinner over, had best go home to his lodgings, and rest himself till tea-time. But no, he insisted upon his afternoon devotions. His countenance became intolerably fervid, as he oratorically assured me, gesticulating with a long ruler at the other end of the room, that if his services in the morning were useful, how indispensable then in the afternoon! With submission, sir, said Turkey, on this occasion, I consider myself your right-hand man. In the morning I but marshal and deploy my columns, but in the afternoon I put myself at their head, and gallantly charge the foe, thus. And he made a violent thrust with the ruler. But the blots, Turkey, intimated I. True, but with submission, sir, behold these hairs. I am getting old. Surely, sir, a blot or two of a warm afternoon is not to be severely urged against gray hairs. Old age, even if it blot the page, is honorable. With submission, sir, we both are getting old. This appeal to my fellow feeling was hardly to be resisted. At all events I saw that go he would not. So I made up my mind to let him stay resolving, nevertheless, to see to it that during the afternoon he had to do with my less important papers. Nippers, the second on my list, was a whiskered, sallow, and, upon the whole, rather piratical-looking young man of about five-and-twenty. I always deemed him the victim of two evil powers, ambition and indigestion. The ambition was evinced by a certain impatience of the duties of a mere copyist, an unwarrantable usurpation of strictly professional affairs, such as the original drawing up of legal documents. The indigestion seemed betokened in an occasional nervous testiness and grinning irritability, causing the teeth to audibly grind together over mistakes committed in copying, unnecessary maledictions hissed rather than spoken in the heat of business, and especially by a continual discontent with the height of the table where he worked. Though of a very ingenious mechanical turn, Nippers could never get this table to suit him. He put chips under it, blocks of various sorts, bits of pasteboard, and at last went so far as to attempt an exquisite adjustment by final pieces of folded blotting paper but no invention would answer. 
if for the sake of easing his back he brought the table lid at a sharp angle well up towards his chin and wrote there like a man using the steep roof of a dutch house for his desk then he declared that it stopped the circulation in his arms if now he lowered the table to his waistbands and stooped over it in writing then there was a sore aching in his back in short the truth of the matter was nippers knew not what he wanted or if he wanted anything it was to be rid of a scrivener's table altogether among the manifestations of his diseased ambition was a fondness he had for receiving visits from certain ambiguous-looking fellows in seedy coats whom he called his clients indeed i was aware that not only was he at times considerable of a ward politician but he occasionally did a little business at the justices courts and was not unknown on the steps of the tombs i have good reason to believe however that one individual who called upon him at my chambers and who with a grand air he insisted was his client was no other than a dun and the alleged title deed a bill but with all his failings and the annoyances he caused me nippers like his compatriot turkey was a very useful man to me wrote a neat swift hand and when he chose was not deficient in a gentlemanly sort of deportment added to this he always dressed in a gentlemanly sort of way and so incidentally reflected credit upon my chambers whereas with respect to turkey i had much ado to keep him from being a reproach to me his clothes were apt to look oily and smell of eating houses he wore his pantaloons very loose and baggy in summer his coats were execrable his hat not to be handled but while the hat was a thing of indifference to me inasmuch as his natural civility and deference as a dependent englishman always led him to doff it the moment he entered the room yet his coat was another matter concerning his coats i reasoned with him but with no effect the truth was i suppose that a man with so small an income could not afford to sport such a lustrous face and a lustrous coat at one and the same time as nippers once observed turkey's money went chiefly for red ink one winter day i presented turkey with a highly respectable looking coat of my own a padded gray coat of a most comfortable warmth and which buttoned straight up from the knee to the neck i thought turkey would appreciate the favor and abate his rashness and obstreperousness of afternoons but no i verily believe that buttoning himself up in so downy and blanket like a coat had a pernicious effect upon him upon the same principle that too much oats are bad for horses in fact precisely as a rash restive horse is said to feel his oats so turkey felt his coat it made him insolent he was a man whom prosperity harmed though concerning the self-indulgent habits of turkey i had my own private surmises yet touching nippers i was well persuaded that whatever might be his faults in other respects he was at least a temperate young man but indeed nature herself seemed to have been his vintner and at his birth charged him so thoroughly with an irritable brandy-like disposition that all subsequent potations were needless when i consider how amid the stillness of my chambers nippers would sometimes impatiently rise from his seat and stooping over his table spread his arms wide apart seize the whole desk and move it and jerk it with a grim grinding motion on the floor as if the table were a perverse voluntary agent intent on thwarting and vexing him i plainly perceive that for nippers brandy and water were altogether superfluous it was fortunate for me that owing to its peculiar cause indigestion the irritability and consequent nervousness of nippers were mainly observable in the morning while in the afternoon he was comparatively mild 
so that turkeys' paroxysms only coming on about twelve o'clock, I never had to do with their eccentricities at one time. Their fits relieved each other, like guards. When nippers was on, turkeys was off, and vice versa. This was a good natural arrangement under the circumstances. Ginger Nut, the third on my list, was a lad some twelve years old. His father was a carman, ambitious of seeing his son on the bench instead of a cart before he died. So he sent him to my office as a student at law, errand boy, cleaner and sweeper, at the rate of one dollar a week. He had a little desk to himself, but he did not use it much. Upon inspection the drawer exhibited a great array of the shells of various sorts of nuts. Indeed, to this quick-witted youth, the whole noble science of the law was contained in a nutshell. Not the least among the employments of Ginger Nut, as well as one which he discharged with the most alacrity, was his duty as cake and apple purveyor for turkey and nippers, copying law papers being proverbially a dry, husky sort of business. My two scriveners were fain to moisten their mouths very often with Spitzenberg's, to be had at the numerous stalls nigh the custom-house and post-office. Also they sent Ginger Nut very frequently for that peculiar cake, small, flat, round, and very spicy, after which he had been named by them. Of a cold morning when business was but dull, Turkey would gobble up scores of these cakes, as if they were mere wafers. Indeed they sell them at the rate of six or eight for a penny the scrape of his pen blending with the crunching of the crisp particles in his mouth. Of all the fiery afternoon blunders and flurried rashnesses of turkey was his once moistening a ginger cake between his lips and clapping it on to a mortgage for a seal. I came within an ace of dismissing him then, but he mollified me by making an oriental bow and saying, with submission, sir, it was generous of me to find you in stationery on my own account. Now, my original business, that of a conveyancer and title-hunter, and drawer-up of recondite documents of all sorts, was considerably increased by receiving the master's office. There was now great work for scriveners. Not only must I push the clerks already with me, but I must have additional help. In answer to my advertisement, a motionless young man one morning stood upon my office threshold, the door being open, for it was summer. I can see that figure now, pallidly neat, pitiably respectable, incurably forlorn. It was Bartleby. After a few words touching his qualifications, I engaged him, glad to have among my corps of copyists a man of so singularly sedate an aspect, which I thought might operate beneficially upon the flighty temper of turkey and the fiery one of nippers. I should have stated before that ground-glass folding doors divided my premises into two parts, one of which was occupied by my scriveners, the other by myself. According to my humor, I threw open these doors, or closed them. I resolved to assign Bartleby a corner by the folding doors, but on my side of them, so as to have this quiet man within easy call, in case any trifling thing was to be done. I placed his desk close up to a small side window in that part of the room, a window which originally had afforded a lateral view of certain grimy backyards and bricks, but which, owing to subsequent erections, commanded at present no view at all, though it gave some light. Within three feet of the panes was a wall, and the light came down from far above between two lofty buildings, as from a very small opening in a dome. Still further to a satisfactory arrangement, I procured a high green folding screen which might entirely isolate Bartleby from my sight, though not remove him from my voice and thus, in a manner, privacy and society were conjoined. At first Bartleby did an extraordinary quantity of writing. 
as if long famished for something to copy, he seemed to gorge himself on my documents. There was no pause for digestion. He ran a day and night line, copying by sunlight and by candlelight. I should have been quite delighted with his application, had he been cheerfully industrious. But he wrote on silently, palely, mechanically. It is, of course, an indispensable part of a Scribner's business to verify the accuracy of his copy, word by word. Where there are two or more Scriveners in an office, they assist each other in this examination, one reading from the copy, the other holding the original. It is a very dull, wearisome, and lethargic affair. I can readily imagine that to some sanguine temperaments it would be altogether intolerable. For example, I cannot credit that the meddlesome poet Byron would have contentedly sat down with Bartleby to examine a law document of, say, five hundred pages, closely written in a crimpy hand. Now and then, in the haste of business, it had been my habit to assist in comparing some brief document myself, calling turkey or nippers for this purpose. One object I had in placing Bartleby so handy to me behind the screen was to avail myself of his services on such trivial occasions. It was on the third day, I think, of his being with me, and before any necessity had arisen for having his own writing examined, that, being much hurried to complete a small affair I had in hand, I abruptly called to Bartleby. In my haste and natural expectancy of instant compliance, I sat with my head bent over the original on my desk, and my right hand sideways and somewhat nervously extended with the copy, so that, immediately upon emerging from his retreat, Bartleby might snatch it and proceed to business without the least delay. In this very attitude did I sit when I called to him, rapidly stating what it was I wanted him to do, namely to examine a small paper with me. Imagine my surprise, nay, my consternation, when, without moving from his privacy, Bartleby, in a singularly mild, firm voice, replied, I would prefer not to. I sat a while in perfect silence, relaying my stunned faculties. Immediately it occurred to me that my ears had deceived me, or Bartleby had entirely misunderstood my meaning. I repeated my request in the clearest tone I could assume, but in quite as clear a one came the previous reply. I would prefer not to. Prefer not to, echoed I, rising in high excitement and crossing the room with a stride. What do you mean? Are you moonstruck? I want you to help me compare this sheet here. Take it. And I thrust it toward him. I would prefer not to, said he. I looked at him steadfastly. His face was leanly composed, his gray eye dimly calm. Not a wrinkle of agitation rippled him. Had there been the least uneasiness, anger, impatience, or impertinence in his manner, in other words, had there been anything ordinarily human about him, doubtless I should have violently dismissed him from the premises. But as it was, I should have as soon thought of turning my pale plaster of Paris bust of Cicero out of doors. I stood gazing at him a while, as he went on with his own writing, and then reseated myself at my desk. This is very strange, thought I. What had one best do? But my business hurried me. I concluded to forget the matter for the present, reserving it for my future leisure. So, calling nippers from the other room, the paper was speedily examined. A few days after this, Bartleby concluded four lengthy documents, being quadruplicates of a week's testimony taken before me in my high court of chancery. It became necessary to examine them. It was an important suit, and great accuracy was imperative. Having all things arranged, I called turkey, nippers, and ginger nut from the next room, meaning to place the four copies in the hands of my four clerks, which I should read from the original. Accordingly, Turkey, Nippers, and Gingernut had taken their seats in a row, each with his document in his hand, 
when I called to Bartleby to join this interesting group. Bartleby, quick, I am waiting. I heard a slow scrape of his chair legs on the uncarpeted floor, and soon he appeared standing at the entrance of his hermitage. What is wanted? said he mildly. The copies, the copies, said I hurriedly. We are going to examine them. There, and I held towards him the fourth quadruplicate. I would prefer not to, he said, and gently disappeared behind the screen. For a few moments I was turned into a pillar of salt, standing at the head of my seated column of clerks. Recovering myself, I advanced toward the screen and demanded the reason for such extraordinary conduct. Why do you refuse? I would prefer not to. With any other man I should have flown outright into a dreadful passion, scorned all further words, and thrust him ignominiously from my presence. But there was something about Bartleby that not only strangely disarmed me, but in a wonderful manner touched and disconcerted me. I began to reason with him. These are your own copies we are about to examine. It is labor-saving to you, because one examination will answer for your four papers. It is common usage. Every copyist is bound to help examine his copy, is it not so? Will you not speak? Answer. I prefer not to, he replied in a flute-like tone. It seemed to me that while I had been addressing him, he carefully resolved every statement that I made, fully comprehended the meaning, could not gainsay the irresistible conclusion, but at the same time some paramount consideration prevailed with him to reply as he did. You are decided, then, not to comply with my request, a request made according to common usage and common sense, he briefly gave me to understand that on that point my judgment was sound, yes, his decision was irreversible. It is not seldom the case that when a man is brow-beaten in some unprecedented and violently unreasonable way, he begins to stagger in his own plainest faith. He begins, as it were, vaguely to surmise that, wonderful as it may be, all the justice and all the reason is on the other side. Accordingly, if any disinterested persons are present, he turns to them for some reinforcement for his own faltering mind. Turkey, said I, what do you think of this? Am I not right? With submission, sir, said Turkey in his blandest tone, I think that you are. Nippers, said I, what do you think of it? I think I should kick him out of the office. The reader of nice perceptions will here perceive that, it being morning, Turkey's answer is couched in polite and tranquil terms, but Nippers replies in ill-tempered ones, or, to repeat a previous sentence, Nippers' ugly mood was on duty and Turkey's off. Gingernet, said I, willing to enlist the smallest suffrage in my behalf, what do you think of it? I think, sir, he's a little loony, replied Ginger Nut with a grin. You hear what they say, said I, turning towards the screen. Come forth and do your duty. But he vouchsafed no reply. I pondered a moment in sore perplexity, but once more business hurried me. I determined again to postpone the consideration of this dilemma to my future leisure. With a little trouble we made out to examine the papers without Bartleby, though at every page or two Turkey deferentially dropped his opinion that this proceeding was quite out of the common, while Nippers, twitching in his chair with dyspeptic nervousness, ground out between his set teeth occasional hissing maledictions against the stubborn oaf behind the screen. As for his, Nippers, part, this was the first and the last time he would do another man's business without pay. Meanwhile, Bartleby sat in his hermitage, oblivious to everything but his own peculiar business there. Some days passed, the Scrivener being employed upon another lengthy work. His late remarkable conduct led me to regard his ways narrowly. I observed that he never went to dinner, indeed that he never went anywhere. As yet I had never, of my personal knowledge, 
known him to be outside of my office. He was a perpetual sentry in the corner. At about eleven o'clock, though, in the morning, I noticed that Ginger Nut would advance toward the opening in Bartleby's screen, as if silently beckoned thither by a gesture invisible to me where I sat. The boy would then leave the office, jingling a few pence, and reappear with a handful of ginger nuts, which he delivered in the hermitage, receiving two of the cakes for his trouble. He lives then on ginger nuts, thought I. Never eats a dinner, properly speaking. He must be a vegetarian then. But no, he never eats even vegetables. He eats nothing but ginger nuts. My mind then ran on in reveries concerning the probable effects upon the human constitution of living entirely on ginger nuts. Ginger nuts are so called because they contain ginger as one of their peculiar constituents, and the final flavoring one. Now, what was ginger? A hot, spicy thing. Was Bartleby hot and spicy? Not at all. Ginger then had no effect upon Bartleby. Probably he preferred it should have none. Nothing so aggravates an earnest person as a passive resistance. If the individual so resisted be of a not inhuman temper, and the resisting one perfectly harmless in his passivity, then in the better moods of the former he will endeavor charitably to construe to his imagination what proves impossible to be solved by his judgment. Even so, for the most part, I regarded Bartleby and his ways. Poor fellow, thought I, he means no mischief. It is plain he intends no insolence. His aspect sufficiently evinces that his eccentricities are involuntary. He is useful to me. I can get along with him. If I turn him away, the chances are he will fall in with some less indulgent employer, and then he will be rudely treated, and perhaps driven forth miserably to starve. Yes, here I can cheaply purchase a delicious self-approval, to befriend Bartleby, to humor him in his strange willfulness, will cost me little or nothing, while I lay up in my soul what will eventually prove a sweet morsel for my conscience. But this mood was not invariable with me. The passiveness of Bartleby sometimes irritated me. I felt strangely goaded on to encounter him in new opposition, to elicit some angry spark from him answerable to my own. But, indeed, I might as well have essayed to strike fire with my knuckles against a bit of Windsor soap. But one afternoon the evil impulse in me mastered me, and the following little scene ensued. Bartleby, said I, when those papers are all copied, I will compare them with you. I would prefer not to. How? Surely you do not mean to persist in that mulish vagary? No answer. I threw open the folding doors nearby, and, turning upon Turkey and Nippers, exclaimed, Bartleby a second time says he won't examine his papers. What do you think of it, Turkey? It was afternoon, be it remembered. Turkey sat glowing like a brass boiler, his bald head steaming, his hands reeling among his blotted papers. "'Think of it!' roared Turkey. "'I think I'll just step behind his screen and black his eyes for him.' So saying, Turkey rose to his feet and threw his arms into a pugilistic position. He was hurrying away to make good his promise when I detained him, alarmed at the effect of incautiously rousing Turkey's combativeness after dinner. "'Sit down, Turkey,' said I, "'and hear what Nippers has to say. "'What do you think of it, Nippers? "'Would I not be justified in immediately dismissing Bartleby?' "'Excuse me, that is for you to decide, sir. "'I think his conduct quite unusual, "'and, indeed, unjust as regards Turkey and myself, "'but it may only be a passing whim.' "'Ah!' exclaimed I. "'You have strangely changed your mind, then.' You speak very gently of him now. All beer, cried Turkey. Gentleness is effects of beer. Nippers and I dined together today. You see how gentle I am, sir. Shall I go and black his eyes? You refer to Bartleby, I suppose. 
no not to-day turkey i replied pray put up your fists i closed the doors and again advanced towards bartleby i felt additional incentives tempting me to my fate i burned to be rebelled against again i remember that bartleby never left the office bartleby said i ginger nut is away just step around to the post office won't you it was but a three minutes walk and see if there's anything for me i would prefer not to you will not i prefer not i staggered to my desk and sat there in a deep study my blind inveteracy returned was there any other thing in which i could procure myself to be ignominiously repulsed by this lean penniless white my hired clerk what added thing is there perfectly reasonable that he will be sure to refuse to do bartleby no answer bartleby in a louder tone no answer bartleby i roared like a very ghost agreeably to the laws of magical invocation at the third summons he appeared at the entrance of his hermitage go to the next room and tell nippers to come to me i prefer not to he respectfully and slowly said and mildly disappeared very good bartleby said i in a quiet sort of serenely severe self-possessed tone intimating the unalterable purpose of some terrible retribution very close at hand at the moment i half intended something of the kind but upon the whole as it was drawing towards my dinner hour i thought it best to put on my hat and walk home for the day suffering much from perplexity and distress of mind shall i acknowledge it the conclusion of this whole business was that it soon became a fixed fact of my chambers that a pale young scrivener by the name of bartleby had a desk there that he copied for me at the usual rate of four cents a folio one hundred words but he was permanently exempt from examining the work done by him that duty being transferred to turkey and nippers out of compliment doubtless to their superior acuteness moreover said bartleby was never on any account to be dispatched on the most trivial errand of any sort and that even if entreated to take upon him such a matter it was generally understood that he would prefer not to in other words that he would refuse point blank as days passed on i became considerably reconciled to bartleby his steadiness his freedom from all dissipation his incessant industry except when he chose to throw himself into a standing reverie behind his screen his great stillness his unalterableness of demeanor under all circumstances made him a valuable acquisition one prime thing was this he was always there first in the morning continually through the day and the last at night i had a singular confidence in his honesty i felt my most precious papers perfectly safe in his hands sometimes to be sure i could not for the very soul of me avoid falling into sudden spasmodic passions with him for it was exceeding difficult to bear in mind all the time those strange peculiarities privileges and unheard of exemptions forming the tacit stipulations on bartleby's part under which he remained in my office now and then in the eagerness of dispatching pressing business i would inadvertently summon bartleby in a short rapid tone to put his finger say on the incipient tie of a bit of red tape with which i was about compressing some papers of course from behind the screen the usual answer i prefer not to was sure to come and then how could a human creature with the common infirmities of our nature refrain from bitterly exclaiming upon such perverseness such unreasonableness however every added repulse of this sort which i received only tended to lessen the probability of my repeating the inadvertence here it must be said that according to the custom of most legal gentlemen occupying chambers in densely populated law buildings there were several keys to my door one was kept by a woman residing in the attic which person weekly scrubbed and daily swept and dusted my apartments 
another was kept by turkey for convenience sake the third i sometimes carried in my own pocket the fourth i knew not who had now one sunday morning i happened to go to trinity church to hear a celebrated preacher and finding myself rather early on the ground i thought i would walk round to my chambers for a while luckily i had my key with me but upon applying it to the lock i found it resisted by something inserted from the inside quite surprised i called out when to my consternation a key was turned from within and thrusting his lean visage at me and holding the door ajar the apparition of bartleby appeared in his shirt-sleeves and otherwise in a strangely tattered dishabille saying quietly that he was sorry but he was deeply engaged just then and preferred not admitting me at present in a brief word or two he moreover added that perhaps i had better walk round the block two or three times and by that time he would probably have concluded his affairs now the utterly unsurmised appearance of bartleby tenanting my law chambers on a sunday morning with his cadaverously gentlemanly nonchalance yet withal firm and self-possessed had such a strange effect upon me that incontinently i slunk away from my own door and did as desired but not without sundry twinges of impotent rebellion against the mild effrontery of this unaccountable scrivener indeed it was his wonderful mildness chiefly which not only disarmed me but unmanned me as it were for i consider that one for the time is a sort of unmanned when he tranquilly permits his hired clerk to dictate to him and order him away from his own premises furthermore i was full of uneasiness as to what bartleby could possibly be doing in my office in his shirt-sleeves and in an otherwise dismantled condition of a sunday morning was anything amiss going on nay that was out of the question it was not to be thought of for a moment that bartleby was an immoral person but what could he be doing there copying nay again whatever might be his eccentricities bartleby was an eminently decorous person he would be the last man to sit down to his desk in any state approaching to nudity besides it was sunday and there was something about bartleby that forbade the supposition that he would by any circular occupation violate the proprieties of the day nevertheless my mind was not pacified and full of a restless curiosity at last i returned to the door without hindrance i inserted my key opened it and entered bartleby was not to be seen i looked round anxiously peeped behind his screen but it was very plain that he was gone upon more closely examining the place i surmised that for an indefinite period bartleby must have ate dressed and slept in my office and that too without plate mirror or bed the cushioned seat of a rickety old sofa in one corner bore the faint impress of a lean reclining form rolled away under his desk i found a blanket under the empty grate a blacking box and brush on a chair a tin basin with soap and a ragged towel in a newspaper a few crumbs of ginger nuts and a morsel of cheese yes thought i it is evident enough that bartleby has been making his home here keeping bachelor's hall all by himself immediately then the thought came sweeping across me what miserable friendlessness and loneliness are here revealed his poverty is great but his solitude how horrible think of it of a sunday wall street is deserted as petra and every night of every day it is an emptiness this building too which of weekdays hums with industry and life at nightfall echoes with sheer vacancy and all through sunday is forlorn and here bartleby makes his home sole spectator of a solitude which he has seen all populous a sort of innocent and transformed marius brooding among the ruins of carthage for the first time in my life a feeling of overpowering stinging melancholy seized me before i had never experienced aught but a not unpleasing sadness 
the bond of a common humanity now drew me irresistibly to gloom a fraternal melancholy for both i and bartleby were sons of adam i remembered the bright silks and sparkling faces i had seen that day in gala trim swan-like sailing down the mississippi of broadway and i contrasted them with the pallid copyist and thought to myself ah happiness courts the light so we deem the world is gay but misery hides aloof so we deem that misery there is none these sad fancyings chimeras doubtless of a sick and silly brain led on to other and more special thoughts concerning the eccentricities of bartleby presentiments of strange discoveries hovered round me the scrivener's pale form appeared to me laid out among uncaring strangers in its shivering winding sheet suddenly i was attracted by bartleby's closed desk the key in open sight left in the lock i mean no mischief seek the gratification of no heartless curiosity thought i besides the desk is mine and its contents too so i will make bold to look within everything was methodically arranged the papers smoothly placed the pigeonholes were deep and removing the files of documents i groped into their recesses presently i felt something there and dragged it out it was an old bandana handkerchief heavy and knotted i opened it and saw it was a savings bank i now recalled all the quiet mysteries which i had noted in the man i remember that he never spoke but to answer that though at intervals he had considerable time to himself yet i had never seen him reading no not even a newspaper that for long periods he would stand looking out at his pale window behind the screen upon the dead brick wall i was quite sure he never visited any refectory or eating-house while his pale face clearly indicated that he never drank beer like turkey or tea and coffee even like other men he had never went anywhere in particular that i could learn never went out for a walk unless indeed that was the case at present that he had declined telling who he was or whence he came or whether he had any relatives in the world that though so thin and pale he never complained of ill health and more than all i remembered a certain unconscious air of pallid how shall i call it of pallid haughtiness say or rather an austere reserve about him which had positively awed me into my tame compliance with his eccentricities when i had feared to ask him to do the slightest incidental thing for me even though i might know from his long continued motionless that behind his screen he must be standing in one of those dead wall reveries of his revolving all these things and coupling them with the recently discovered fact that he had made my office his constant abiding place and home and not forgetful of his morbid moodiness revolving all these things a prudential feeling began to steal over me my first emotions had been those of pure melancholy and sincerest pity but just in proportion as the forlornness of bartleby grew and grew to my imagination did that same melancholy merge into fear that pity into repulsion so true it is and so terrible too that up to a certain point the thought or sight of misery enlists our best affections but in certain special cases beyond that point it does not they err who would assert that invariably this is owing to the inherent selfishness of the human heart it rather proceeds from a certain hopelessness of remedying excessive and organic ill to a sensitive being pity is not seldom pain and when at last it is perceived that such pity cannot lead to effectual succor common sense bids the soul be rid of it what i say that morning persuaded me that the scrivener was the victim of innate and incurable disorder i might give alms to his body but his body did not pain him 
it was his soul that suffered and his soul i could not reach i did not accomplish the purpose of going to trinity church that morning somehow the things i had seen disqualified me for the time from church going i walked homeward thinking what i would do with bartleby finally i resolved upon this i would put certain calm questions to him the next morning touching his history etc and if he declined to answer them openly and unreservedly and i supposed he would prefer not then to give him a twenty-dollar bill over and above whatever i might owe him and tell him his services were no longer required but that if in any other way i could assist him i would be happy to do so especially if he desired to return to his native place wherever that might be i would willingly help to defray the expenses moreover if after reaching home he found himself at a time in want of aid a letter from him would be sure of a reply the next morning came bartleby said i gently calling to him behind his screen no reply bartleby said i in a still gentler tone come here i am not going to ask you to do anything you would prefer not to do i simply wish to speak to you upon this he noiselessly slid into view will you tell me bartleby where you were born i would prefer not to will you tell me anything about yourself i would prefer not to but what reasonable objection can you have to speak to me i feel friendly towards you he did not look at me while i spoke but kept his glance fixed upon my bust of cicero which as i then sat was directly behind me some six inches above my head what is your answer bartleby said i after waiting a considerable time for a reply during which his countenance remained immovable only there was the faintest conceivable tremor of the white attenuated mouth at present i prefer to give no answer he said and retired into his hermitage it was rather weak in me i confess but his manner on this occasion nettled me not only did there seem to lurk in it a certain calm disdain but his perverseness seemed ungrateful considering the undeniable good usage and indulgence he had received from me again i sat ruminating what i should do mortified as i was at his behavior and resolved as i had been to dismiss him when i entered my office nevertheless i strangely felt something superstitious knocking at my heart and forbidding me to carry out my purpose and denouncing me for a villain if i dared to breathe one bitter word against this forlornest of mankind at last familiarly drawing my chair behind his screen i sat down and said bartleby never mind then about revealing your history but let me entreat you as a friend to comply as far as may be with the usages of this office say now you will help to examine papers to-morrow or next day in short say now that in a day or two you will begin to be a little reasonable say so bartleby at present i would prefer not to be a little reasonable was his mildly cadaverous reply just then the folding doors opened and nippers approached he seemed suffering from an unusually bad night's rest induced by severer indigestion than common he overheard those final words of bartleby prefer not to eh gritted nippers i'd prefer him if i were you sir addressing me i'd prefer him i'd give him preferences the stubborn mule what is it sir pray that he prefers not to do now bartleby moved not a limb mr nippers said i i'd prefer that you would withdraw for the present end of section two Section three of the Piazza Tales. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Chapter two B Bartleby, part two. 
Somehow of late I had got into the way of involuntarily using this word prefer upon all sorts of not exactly suitable occasions, and I trembled to think that my contact with a Scrivener had already and seriously affected me in a mental way, and what further and deeper aberration might it not yet produce? This apprehension had not been without efficacy in determining me to summary measures. As Nippers looked very sour and sulky, was departing, Turkey blandly and deferentially approached. "'With submission, sir,' said he, "'yesterday I was thinking about Bartleby here, and I think that if he would but prefer to take a quart of good ale every day, it would do much towards mending him and enabling him to assist in examining his papers.' so you have got the word too said i slightly excited with submission what word sir asked turkey respectfully crowding himself into the contracted space behind the screen and by doing so making me jostle the scrivener what word sir i would prefer to be left alone here said bartleby as if offended at being mobbed in his privacy that's the word turkey said i that's it oh prefer oh yes queer word i never use it myself but sir as i was saying if he would prefer turkey interrupted i you will please withdraw oh certainly sir if you prefer that i should as he opened the folding door to retire nippers at his desk caught a glimpse of me and asked whether I would prefer to have a certain paper copied on blue paper or white. He did not in the least roguishly accent the word prefer. It was plain that it involuntarily rolled from his tongue. I thought to myself, surely I must get rid of a demented man who already has in some degree turned the tongues, if not the heads of myself and clerks. But I thought it prudent not to break the dismission at once. The next day I noticed that Bartleby did nothing but stand at his window in his dead-wall reverie. Upon asking him why he did not write, he said that he had decided upon doing no more writing. "'Why, how now? What next?' exclaimed I. "'Do no more writing? No more. And what is the reason?' "'Do you not see the reason for yourself?' he inadvertently replied. I looked steadfastly at him and perceived that his eyes looked dull and glazed. Instantly it occurred to me that his unexampled diligence in copying by his dim window for the first few weeks of his stay with me might have temporarily impaired his vision. I was touched. I said something in condolence with him. I hinted that of course he did wisely in abstaining from writing for a while and urged him to embrace that opportunity of taking wholesome exercise in the open air. This, however, he did not do. A few days after this, my other clerks being absent and being in a great hurry to dispatch certain letters by the mail, I thought that, having nothing else earthly to do, Bartleby would surely be less inflexible than usual and carry these letters to the post office. But he blankly declined so much to my inconvenience i went myself still added days went by whether bartleby's eyes improved or not i could not say to all appearance i thought they did but when i asked him if they did he vouchsafed no answer at all events he would do no copying at last in reply to my urgings he informed me that he had permanently given up copying what exclaimed i suppose your eyes should get entirely well better than ever before would you not copy then i have given up copying he answered and slid aside he remained as ever a fixture in my chamber nay if that were possible he became still more of a fixture than before what was to be done he would do nothing in the office why should he stay there in plain fact, he had now become a millstone to me, not only useless as a necklace, but afflictive to bear. Yet I was sorry for him. I speak less than truth when I say that on his own account he occasioned me uneasiness. 
If he would but have named a single relative or friend, I would instantly have written, and urged their taking the poor fellow away to some convenient retreat. But he seemed alone, absolutely alone in the universe, a bit of wreck in the mid-Atlantic. At length necessities connected with my business tyrannized over all other considerations. Decently as I could, I told Bartleby that in six days' time he must unconditionally leave the office. I warned him to take measures in the interval for procuring some other abode. I offered to assist him in this endeavor, if he himself would but take the first step towards a removal. And when you finally quit me, Bartleby, added I, I shall see that you go not away entirely unprovided. Six days from this hour, remember. At the expiration of that period I peeped behind the screen, and lo, Bartleby was there. I buttoned up my coat, balanced myself, advanced slowly toward him, touched his collar, and said, The time has come. You must quit this place. I am sorry for you. Here is money, but you must go. I would prefer not, he replied, with his back still toward me. You must. He remained silent. Now I had an unbounded confidence in this man's common honesty. He had frequently restored to me sixpences and shillings carelessly dropped upon the floor, for I am apt to be very reckless in such shirt-button affairs. The proceeding, then, which followed, will not be deemed extraordinary. Bartleby, said I, I owe you twelve dollars on account. Here are thirty-two, the odd twenty are yours. Will you take it? And I handed the bills towards him. But he made no motion. I will leave them here, then, putting them under a weight on the table. Then, taking my hat and cane and going to the door, I tranquilly turned and added, after you have removed your things from these offices, Bartleby, you will, of course, lock the door, since every one is now gone for the day but you, and if you please, slip your key underneath the mat, so that I may have it in the morning. I shall not see you again, so good-bye to you. If hereafter, in your new place of abode, I can be of any service to you, do not fail to advise me by letter." Good-bye, Bartleby, and fare you well. But he answered not a word. Like the last column of some ruined temple, he remained standing mute and solitary in the middle of the otherwise deserted room. As I walked home in a pensive mood, my vanity got the better of my pity. I could not but highly plume myself on my masterly management in getting rid of Bartleby. Masterly, I call it and such it must appear to any dispassionate thinker. The beauty of my procedure seemed to consist in its perfect quietness. There was no vulgar bullying, no bravado of any sort, no choleric hectoring, and striding to and fro across the apartment, jerking out vehement commands for Bartleby to bundle himself off with his beggarly traps. Nothing of the kind. Without loudly bidding Bartleby depart, as an inferior genius might have done, I assumed the ground that depart he must, and upon that assumption built all I had to say. The more I thought over my procedure, the more I was charmed with it. Nevertheless, next morning, upon awakening, I had my doubts. I had somehow slept off the fumes of vanity. One of the coolest and wisest hours a man has is just after he awakes in the morning, my procedure seemed as sagacious as ever, but only in theory. How it would prove in practice, there was the rub. It was truly a beautiful thought to have assumed Bartleby's departure, but after all that assumption was simply my own, and none of Bartleby's. The great point was not whether I had assumed that he would quit me, but whether he would prefer so to do. He was more a man of preferences than assumptions. After breakfast I walked downtown arguing the probabilities pro and con. One moment I thought it would prove a miserable failure, and Bartleby would be found all alive at my office as usual. The next moment it seemed certain that I should find his chair empty, 
and so I kept veering about. At the corner of Broadway and Canal Street I saw quite an excited group of people standing in earnest conversation. "'I'll take odds he doesn't,' said a voice as I passed. "'Doesn't go?' "'Done,' said I. "'Put up your money.' I was instinctively putting my hand in my pocket to produce my own when I remembered that this was an election day. The words I had heard bore no reference to Bartleby, but to the success or non-success of some candidate for the mayoralty. In my intent frame of mind I had, as it were, imagined that all Broadway shared in my excitement and were debating the same question with me. I passed on very thankful that the uproar of the street screened my momentary absent-mindedness. As I had intended, I was earlier than usual at my office door. I stood listening for a moment. All was still. He must be gone. I tried the knob. The door was locked. Yes, my procedure had worked to a charm. He indeed must be vanished. Yet a certain melancholy mixed with this. I was almost sorry for my brilliant success. I was fumbling under the doormat for the key which Bartleby was to have left there for me, when accidentally my knee knocked against a panel, producing a summoning sound, and in response a voice came to me from within, "'Not yet. I am occupied.' It was Bartleby. I was thunderstruck. For an instant I stood like the man who, pipe in mouth, was killed one cloudless afternoon long ago in Virginia by summer lightning. At his own warm open window he was killed, and remained leaning out there upon the dreamy afternoon till someone touched him when he fell. "'Not gone,' I murmured at last, but again obeying that wondrous ascendancy with the inscrutable Scrivener head over me and from which ascendancy for all my chafing I could not completely escape, I slowly went downstairs and out into the street, and, while walking round the block, considered what I should next do in this unheard-of perplexity. Turn the man out by an actual thrusting I could not. To drive him away by calling him hard names would not do. Calling in the police was an unpleasant idea, and yet permit him to enjoy his cadaverous triumph over me, this, too, I could not think of. What was to be done? Or, if nothing could be done, was there anything further that I could assume in the matter? Yes, as before, I had prospectively assumed that Bartleby would depart, so now I might retrospectively assume that departed he was. In the legitimate carrying out of this assumption, I might enter my office in a great hurry, and, pretending not to see Bartleby at all, walk straight against him as if he were heir. Such a proceeding would in a singular degree have the appearance of a home thrust. It was hardly possible that Bartleby could withstand such an application of the doctrine of assumptions. But upon second thoughts the success of the plan seemed rather dubious. I resolved to argue the matter over with him again. "'Bartleby,' said I, entering the office with a quietly severe expression, "'I am seriously displeased. I am pained, Bartleby. I had thought better of you. I had imagined you of such a gentlemanly organization that in my delicate dilemma a slight hint would suffice, in short, an assumption. But it appears I am deceived.' why i added unaffectedly starting you have not even touched that money yet pointing to it just where i had left it the evening previous he answered nothing will you or will you not quit me i now demanded in a sudden passion advancing close to him i would prefer not to quit you he replied gently emphasizing the not what earthly right have you to stay here do you pay any rent do you pay my taxes, or is this property yours? He answered nothing. Are you ready to go on and write now? Are your eyes recovered? Could you copy a small paper for me this morning, or help examine a few lines, or step round to the post office? In a word, will you do anything at all to give a coloring to your refusal to depart the premises? 
he silently retired into his hermitage. I was now in such a state of nervous resentment that I thought it but prudent to check myself at present from further demonstrations. Bartleby and I were alone. I remembered the tragedy of the unfortunate Adams and the still more unfortunate Colt in the solitary office of the latter, and how poor Colt, being dreadfully incensed by Adams, and imprudently permitting himself to get wildly excited, was at unawares hurried into his fatal act, an act which certainly no man could possibly deplore more than the actor himself. Often it had occurred to me in my ponderings upon the subject that had that altercation taken place in the public street or at a private residence, it would not have terminated as it did. It was the circumstance of being alone in a solitary office, upstairs, of a building entirely unhallowed by humanizing domestic associations, an uncarpeted office, doubtless, of a dusty, haggard sort of appearance. This it must have been which greatly helped to enhance the irritable desperation of the hapless colt. But when this old atom of resentment rose in me and tempted me concerning Bartleby, I grappled him and threw him. How? Why, simply by recalling the divine injunction, A new commandment give I unto you, that ye love one another. Yes, this it was that saved me. Aside from higher considerations, charity often operates as a vastly wise and prudent principle, a great safeguard to its possessor. Men have committed murder for jealousy's sake, and anger's sake, and hatred's sake, and selfishness's sake, and spiritual pride's sake. But no man that ever I heard of ever committed a diabolical murder for sweet charity's sake. Mere self-interest, then, if no better motive can be enlisted, should, especially with high-tempered men, prompt all beings to charity and philanthropy. At any rate, upon the occasion in question, I strove to drown my exasperated feelings toward the Scrivener by benevolently construing his conduct. Poor fellow, poor fellow, thought I, he don't mean anything, and besides, he has seen hard times and ought to be indulged. I endeavored also immediately to occupy myself, and at the same time to comfort my despondency. I tried to fancy that in the course of the morning, at such time as might prove agreeable to him, Bartleby of his own free accord would emerge from his hermitage and take up some decided line of march in the direction of the door. But no, half-past twelve o'clock came, Turkey began to glow in the face, overturn his inkstand, and become generally obstreperous. Nippers abated down into quietude and courtesy. Ginger Nut munched his noon apple, and Bartleby remained standing at his window in one of his profoundest dead-wall reveries. Will it be credited? Ought I to acknowledge it? That afternoon I left the office without saying one further word to him. Some days now passed, during which, at leisure intervals, I looked a little into Edwards on the will, and Priestley on necessity. Under the circumstances those books induced a salutary feeling. Gradually I slid into the persuasion that these troubles of mine, touching the Scrivener, had been all predestinated from eternity, and Bartleby was billeted upon me for some mysterious person of an all-wise providence which it was not for a mere mortal like me to fathom. Yes, Bartleby, stay there behind your screen, thought I. I shall persecute you no more. You are harmless and noiseless as any of these old chairs. In short, I never feel so private as when I know you are here. At last I see it, I feel it. I penetrate to the predestinated purpose of my life. I am content. Others may have loftier parts to enact, but my mission in this world, Bartleby, is to furnish you with office room for such period as you may see fit to remain. I believe that this wise and blessed frame of mind would have continued with me 
had it not been for the unsolicited and uncharitable remarks obtruded upon me by my professional friends who visited the rooms. But thus it often is that the constant friction of illiberal minds wears out at last the best resolves of the more generous. Though, to be sure, when I reflected upon it, it was not strange that people entering my office should be struck by the peculiar aspect of the unaccountable Bartleby, and so be tempted to throw out some sinister observations concerning him. Sometimes an attorney, having business with me and calling at my office, and finding no one but the Scrivener there, would undertake to obtain some sort of precise information from him touching my whereabouts, but without heeding his idle talk, Bartleby would remain standing immovable in the middle of the room. So, after contemplating him in that position for a time, the attorney would depart no wiser than he came. Also, when a reference was going on, and the room full of lawyers and witnesses, and business was driving fast, some deeply occupied legal gentleman present, seeing Bartleby wholly unemployed, would request him to run round to his legal gentleman's office and fetch some papers for him. Thereupon Bartleby would tranquilly decline, and yet remain idle as before. Then the lawyer would give a great stare and turn to me, and what could I say? At last I was made aware that all through the circle of my professional acquaintance a whisper of wonder was running round, having reference to this strange creature I kept at my office. This worried me very much, and as the idea came upon me of his possibly turning out a long-lived man, and keep occupying my chambers, and denying my authority, and perplexing my visitors, and scandalizing my professional reputation, and casting a general gloom over the premises, keeping soul and body together to the last upon his savings, for doubtless he spent but half a dime a day, and in the end perhaps outlive me and claim possession of my office by right of his perpetual occupancy. As all these dark anticipations crowded upon me more and more, and my friends continually intruded their relentless remarks upon the apparition in my room, a great change was wrought in me. I resolved to gather all my faculties together and forever rid me of this intolerable incubus. Ere revolving any complicated project, however, adapted to this end, I first simply suggested to Bartleby the propriety of his permanent departure. In a calm and serious tone I commanded the idea to his careful and mature consideration. But having taken three days to meditate upon it, he apprised me that his original determination remained the same, in short that he still preferred to abide with me. What shall I do? I now said to myself, buttoning up my coat to the last button, What shall I do? What ought I to do? What does conscience say I should do with this man, or rather ghost? Rid myself of him I must. Go he shall. But how? You will not thrust him, the poor pale passive mortal. You will not thrust such a helpless creature out of your door? You will not dishonor yourself by such cruelty? No, I will not. I cannot do that. Rather would I let him live and die here, and then mason up his remains in the wall. What then will you do? For all your coaxing he will not budge. Bribes he leaves under your own paperweight on your table. In short, it is quite plain that he prefers to cling to you. Then something severe, something unusual must be done. What? Surely you will not have him collared by a constable and commit his innocent pallor to the common jail? And upon what ground could you procure such a thing to be done? A vagrant, is he? What? He a vagrant, a wanderer, who refuses to budge? It is because he will not be a vagrant, then, that you seek to count him as a vagrant. That is too absurd. No visible means of support. There. I have him. Wrong again, for indubitably he does support himself, and that is the only unanswerable proof that any man can show of his possession the means so to do, no more then. Since he will not quit me, I must quit him. 
I will change my offices. I will move elsewhere and give him fair notice, that if I find him on my new premises I will then proceed against him as a common trespasser. Acting accordingly next day, I thus addressed him. I find these chambers too far from the city hall. The air is unwholesome. In a word, I propose to remove my offices next week, and shall no longer require your services. I tell you this now, in order that you may seek another place. He made no reply, and nothing more was said. On the appointed day I engaged carts and men, proceeded to my chambers, and having but little furniture everything was removed in a few hours. Throughout the scrivener remained standing behind the screen, which I directed to be removed the last thing. It was withdrawn, and being folded up like a huge folio, left him the motionless occupant of a naked room. I stood in the entry watching him a moment while something from within me upbraided me. I re-entered, with my hand in my pocket and, and my heart in my mouth. Good-bye, Bartleby. I am going. Good-bye, and God some way bless you. And take that, slipping something in his hand, but it dropped upon the floor. And then, strange to say, I tore myself from him whom I had so longed to be rid of, Established in my new quarters for a day or two, I kept the door locked, and started at every footfall in the passages. When I returned to my rooms, after any little absence, I would pause at the threshold for an instant, and attentively listen, ere applying my key. But these fears were needless, Bartleby never came nigh me. I thought all was going well when a perturbed-looking stranger visited me, inquiring whether I was the person who had recently occupied rooms number blank blank Wall Street. Full of forebodings, I replied that I was. Then, sir, said the stranger, who proved a lawyer, you are responsible for the man you left there. He refuses to do any copying. He refuses to do anything. He says he prefers not to, and he refuses to quit the premises. I am very sorry, sir, said I, with assumed tranquillity, but an inward tremor. But, really, the man you allude to is nothing to me. He is no relation or apprentice of mine that you should hold me responsible for him. In mercy's name, who is he? I certainly cannot inform you. I know nothing about him. Formerly I employed him as a copyist, but he has done nothing for me now for some time past. I shall settle him, then. Good morning, sir. Several days passed, and I heard nothing more, and, though I often felt a charitable prompting to call at the place and see poor Bartleby, yet a certain squeamishness, of I know not what, withheld me. All is over with him by this time, thought I, at last, when, through another week, no further intelligence reached me. But, coming to my room the day after, I found several persons waiting at my door, in a high state of nervous excitement. "'That's the man! Here he comes!' cried the foremost one, whom I recognized as the lawyer who had previously called upon me alone. "'You must take him away, sir, at once!' cried a portly person among them, advancing upon me, and whom I knew to be the landlord of number blank blank Wall Street. "'These gentlemen, my tenants, cannot stand it any longer. Mr. B. blank blank, pointing to the lawyer, has turned him out of his room, and he now persists in haunting the building generally, sitting upon the banisters of the stairs by day, and sleeping in the entry by night. Everybody is concerned. Clients are leaving the offices. Some fears are entertained of a mob. Something you must do, and that without delay. Aghast at this torrent, I fell back before it, and would fain have locked myself in my new quarters. In vain I persisted that Bartleby was nothing to me, no more than to any one else. In vain I was the last person known to have anything to do with him, and they held me to the terrible account. Fearful, then, of being exposed in the papers, as one person presently obscurely threatened, I considered the matter, and at length said that if the lawyer would give me a confidential interview with the scrivener in his, the lawyer's, own room, 
I would that afternoon strive my best to rid them of the nuisance they complained of. Going upstairs to my old haunt, there was Bartleby, silently sitting upon the banister at the landing. "'What are you doing here, Bartleby?' said I. "'Sitting upon the banister,' he mildly replied. I motioned him into the lawyer's room, who then left us. "'Bartleby,' said I, "'are you aware that you are the cause of great tribulation to me by persisting in occupying the entry after being dismissed from the office?' No answer. Now one of two things must take place. Either you must do something, or something must be done to you. Now what sort of business would you like to engage in? Would you like to re-engage in copying for someone? No, I would prefer not to take any change. Would you like a clerkship in a dry-goods store? There is too much confinement about that. No. I would not like a clerkship, but I am not particular. Too much confinement, I cried. Why, you keep yourself confined all the time. I would prefer not to take a clerkship, he rejoined, as if to settle that little item at once. How would a bartender's business suit you? There is no trying of the eyesight in that. I would not like it at all, though, as I said before, I am not particular. His unwanted wordiness inspired me. I returned to the charge. Well, then, would you like to travel through the country collecting bills for the merchants? That would improve your health. No, I would prefer to be doing something else. How, then, would going as a companion to Europe, to entertain some young gentleman with your conversation, how would that suit you? Not at all. It does not strike me that there is anything definite about that. I like to be stationary, but I am not particular. Stationary you shall be, then, I cried, now losing all patience, and for the first time in all my exasperating connection with him fairly flying into a passion. If you do not go away from these premises before night, I shall feel bound, indeed I am bound, to, to, to quit the premises myself. I rather absurdly concluded, knowing not with what possible threat to try to frighten his immobility into compliance. Despairing of all further efforts, I was precipitately leaving him when a final thought occurred to me, one which had not been wholly unindulged before. Bartleby, said I, in the kindest tone I could assume under such exciting circumstances, will you go home with me now, not to my office, but my dwelling? and remain there till we can conclude upon some convenient arrangement for you at our leisure. Come, let us start now, right away. No, at present I would prefer not to make any change at all. I answered nothing, but effectually dodging every one by the suddenness and rapidity of my flight, rushed from the building, ran up Wall Street toward Broadway, and, jumping into the first omnibus, was soon removed from pursuit. As soon as tranquillity returned, I distinctly perceived that I had now done all that I possibly could, both in respect to the demands of the landlord and his tenants, and with regard to my own desire and sense of duty to benefit Bartleby and shield him from rude persecution, I now strove to be entirely carefree and quiescent and my conscience justified me in the attempt, though indeed it was not so successful as I could have wished. So fearful was I of being again hunted out by the incensed landlord and his exasperated tenants, that surrendering my business to nippers for a few days, I drove about the upper part of the town and through the suburbs in my rockaway, crossed over to Jersey City and Hoboken, and paid fugitive visits to Manhattanville and Astoria. In fact, I almost lived in my rockaway for the time. When again I entered my office, lo, a note from the landlord lay upon the desk. I opened it with trembling hands. It informed me that the writer had sent to the police and had Bartleby removed to the tombs as a vagrant. Moreover, since I knew more about him than anyone else, he wished me to appear at that place and make a suitable statement of the facts. These tidings had a conflicting effect upon me. 
At first I was indignant, but at last almost approved. The landlord's energetic, summary disposition had led him to adopt a procedure which I do not think I would have decided upon myself, and yet as a last resort, under such peculiar circumstances, it seemed the only plan. As I afterwards learned, the poor Scrivener, when told that he must be conducted to the tombs, offered not the slightest obstacle, but in his pale, unmoving way silently acquiesced. Some of the compassionate and curious bystanders joined the party, and headed by one of the constables arm in arm with Bartleby, the silent procession filed its way through all the noise and heat and joy of the roaring thoroughfares at noon. The same day I received the note I went to the tombs, or, to speak more properly, the halls of justice, Seeking the right officer, I stated the purpose of my call, and was informed that the individual I described was indeed within. I then assured the functionary that Bartleby was a perfectly honest man, and greatly to be compassionated, however unaccountably eccentric. I narrated all I knew, and closed by suggesting the idea of letting him remain in as indulgent confinement as possible, till something less harsh might be done though indeed I hardly knew what. At all events, if nothing else could be decided upon, the almshouse must receive him. I then begged to have an interview. Being under no disgraceful charge, and quite serene and harmless in all his ways, they had permitted him freely to wander about the prison, and especially in the enclosed grass-platted yards thereof. And so I found him there, standing all alone in the quietest of the yards, his face towards a high wall, while all around, from the narrow slits of the jail windows, I thought I saw peering out upon him the eyes of murderers and thieves. Bartleby, I know you, he said, without looking round, and I want nothing to say to you. It was not I that brought you here, Bartleby, said I keenly pained at his implied suspicion, and to you this should not be so vile a place. Nothing reproachful attaches to you by being here, and see, it is not so sad a place as one might think. Look, there is the sky, and here is the grass. I know where I am, he replied, but would say nothing more, and so I left him. As I entered the corridor again, a broad, meat-like man in an apron accosted me, and jerking his thumb over his shoulder, said, "'Is that your friend?' "'Yes.' "'Does he want to starve? If he does, let him live on the prison fare, that's all.' "'Who are you?' asked I, not knowing what to make of such an unofficially speaking person in such a place. "'I am the grub-man. Such gentlemen as have friends here hire me to provide them with something good to eat.' "'Is this so?' said I, turning to the turnkey. He said it was. "'Well, then,' said I, slipping some silver into the grubmen's hands, for so they called him, "'I want you to give particular attention to my friend there. Let him have the best dinner you can get, and you must be as polite to him as possible.' "'Introduce me, will you?' said the grubman, looking at me with an expression which seemed to say, he was all impatience for an opportunity to give a specimen of his breeding. Thinking it would prove of benefit to the Scrivener, I acquiesced, and, asking the grubman his name, went up with him to Bartleby. Bartleby, this is a friend. You will find him very useful to you. Your servant, sir, your servant, said the grubman, making a low salutation behind his apron. Hope you find it pleasant here, sir. Nice grounds, cool apartments. Hope you'll stay with us some time. Try to make it agreeable. What will you have for dinner today? I prefer not to dine today, said Bartleby, turning away. It would disagree with me. I am unused to dinners. So saying, he slowly moved to the other side of the enclosure and took up a position fronting the dead wall. How's this? said the grub man, addressing me with a stare of astonishment. He's odds, ain't he? I think he is a little deranged, said I sadly. Deranged? Deranged, is it? Well, now, upon my word, I thought that friend of yourn was a gentleman forger. They are always pale and genteel like them forgers, 
I can't help pity him. Can't help it, sir. Do you know Monroe Edwards? He added touchingly and paused. Then, laying his hand piteously on my shoulder, sighed, He died of consumption at Sing Sing. So you weren't acquainted with Monroe? No, I was never socially acquainted with any forgers. But I cannot stop longer. Uh, look to my friend yonder. You will not lose by it. I will see you again. Some few days after this, I again obtained admission to the tombs, and went through the corridors in quest of Bartleby, but without finding him. I saw him coming from his cell not long ago, said a turnkey. Maybe he's gone to loiter in the yards. So I went in that direction. Are you looking for the silent man? said another turnkey, passing me. Yonder he lies, sleeping in the yard there. Tis not twenty minutes since I saw him lie down. The yard was entirely quiet. It was not accessible to the common prisoners. The surrounding walls of amazing thickness kept off all sounds behind them. The Egyptian character of the masonry weighed upon me with its gloom but a soft, imprisoned turf grew underfoot. The heart of the eternal pyramids, it seemed, wherein, by some strange magic, through the clefts, grass seed dropped by birds had sprung. Strangely huddled at the base of the wall, his knees drawn up and lying on his side, his head touching the cold stones, I saw the wasted Bartleby. But nothing stirred. I paused, then went close up to him stooped over and saw that his dim eyes were open, otherwise he seemed profoundly sleeping. Something prompted me to touch him. I felt his hand, when a tingling shiver ran up my arm and down my spine to my feet. The round face of the grub-man peered upon me now. "'His dinner is ready. Won't he dine today, either? Or does he live without dining?' lives without dining said i and closed the eyes eh hey, he's asleep ain't he with kings and counselors murmured i there would seem little need for proceeding further in this history imagination will readily supply the meager recital of poor bartleby's internment but ere parting with the reader let me say that if this little narrative has sufficiently interested him to awaken curiosity as to who Bartleby was, and what manner of life he led prior to the present narrator's making his acquaintance, I can only reply that in such curiosity I fully share, but am wholly unable to gratify it. Yet here I hardly know whether I should indulge one little item of rumor which came to my ear a few months after the Scribner's death, upon what basis it rested I could never ascertain, and hence how true it is I cannot now tell. But inasmuch as this vague report has not been without a certain suggestive interest to me, however sad, it may prove the same with some others, and so I will briefly mention it. The report was this that Bartleby had been a subordinate clerk in the dead-letter office at Washington, from which he had been suddenly removed by a change in the administration. When I think over this rumor, hardly can I express the emotions which seize me. Dead letters! Does it not sound like dead men? Conceive a man by nature and misfortune prone to a pallid hopelessness, can any business seem more fitted to heighten it than that of continually handling these dead letters and assorting them for the flames, for by the cartload they are annually burned. Sometimes from out the folded paper the pale clerk takes a ring, the finger it was meant for, perhaps, moulders in the grave, a banknote sent in swiftest charity. He whom it would relieve, nor eats nor hungers any more, pardon for those who died despairing, hope for those who died unhoping, good tidings for those who died stifled by unrelieved calamities. On errands of life these letters speed to death. Ah, Bartleby! Ah, humanity! End of section 3 and end of Bartleby
Section four of the Piazza Tales. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Chapter three A Benito Sereno, part one. In the year seventeen ninety nine, Captain Amasa Delano of Dukesbury, Massachusetts, commanding a large sealer and general trader, lay at anchor with a valuable cargo in the harbor of Santa Maria a small desert uninhabited island toward the southern extremity of the long coast of chile there he had touched for water on the second day not long after dawn while lying in his berth his mate came below informing him that a strange sail was coming into the bay ships were then not so plenty in those waters as now he rose dressed and went on deck the morning was one peculiar to that coast Everything was mute and calm, everything gray. The sea, though undulated into long roods of swells, seemed fixed, and was sleeked at the surface like waved lead that has cooled and set in the smelter's mold. The sky seemed a gray surtout. Flights of troubled gray fowl, kith and kin with flights of troubled gray vapors among which they were mixed, skimmed low and fitfully over the waters as swallows over meadows before storms shadows present foreshadowing deeper shadows to come to captain delano's surprise the stranger viewed through the glass showed no colors though to do so upon entering a haven however uninhabited in its shores where but a single other ship might be lying was the custom among peaceful seamen of all nations Considering the lawlessness and loneliness of the spot, and the sort of stories at that day associated with those seas, Captain Delano's surprise might have deepened into some uneasiness had he not been a person of a singularly undistrustful good nature, not liable, except on extraordinary and repeated incentives, and hardly then, to indulge in personal alarms, any way involving the imputation of malign evil in man whether in view of what humanity is capable such a trait implies along with a benevolent heart more than ordinary quickness and accuracy of intellectual perception may be left to the wise to determine but whatever misgivings might have obtruded on first seeing the stranger would almost in any seaman's mind have been dissipated by observing that the ship in navigating into the harbor was drawing too near the land a sunken reef making out off her bow this seemed to prove her a stranger indeed not only to the sealer but the island consequently she could be no wanted freebooter on that ocean with no small interest captain delano continued to watch her a proceeding not much facilitated by the vapors partly mantling the hull through which the far matin light from her cabin streamed equivocally enough much like the sun by this time hemisphered on the rim of the horizon and apparently in company with the strange ship entering the harbor which wimpled by the same low creeping clouds showed not unlike a lima intrigante's one sinister eye peering across the plaza from the indian loophole of her dusk saya y manta it might have been but a deception of the vapors but the longer the stranger was watched the more singular appeared her maneuvers ere long it seemed hard to decide whether she meant to come in or no what she wanted or what she was about the wind, which had breezed up a little during the night, was now extremely light and baffling, which the more increased the apparent uncertainty of her movements. Surmising at last that it might be a ship in distress, Captain Delano ordered his whaleboat to be dropped, and much to the wary opposition of his mate, prepared to board her, and at the least pilot her in. On the night previous, a fishing party of the seamen had gone a long distance to some detached rocks out of sight from the sealer, and an hour or two before daybreak had returned, having met with no small success. Presuming that the stranger might have been long off soundings, the good captain put several baskets of the fish for presents 
into his boat and so pulled away from her continuing too near the sunken reef deeming her in danger calling to his men he made all haste to apprise those on board of their situation but some time ere the boat came up the wind light though it was having shifted had headed the vessel off as well as partly broken the vapors from about her upon gaining a less remote view the ship when made signally visible on the verge of the leaden-hued swells with the shreds of fog here and there raggedly furring her appeared like a whitewashed monastery after a thunderstorm seen perched upon some dun cliff among the pyrenees but it was no purely fanciful resemblance which now for a moment almost led captain delano to think that nothing less than a shipload of monks was before him peering over the bulwarks where what really seemed in the hazy distance throngs of dark cowls while fitfully revealed through the open portholes other dark moving figures were dimly descried as of black friars pacing the cloisters upon a still nigher approach this appearance was modified and the true character of the vessel was plain a spanish merchantman of the first class carrying negro slaves amongst other valuable freight from one colonial port to another a very large and in its time a very fine vessel such as in those days were at intervals encountered along that main sometimes superseded acapulco treasure ships or retired frigates of the spanish king's navy which like superannuated italian palaces still under a decline of masters preserved signs of former state as the whaleboat drew more and more nigh the cause of the peculiar pipe-clayed aspect of the stranger was seen in the slovenly neglect pervading her the spars ropes and great part of the bulwarks looked woolly from long unacquaintance with the scraper tar and the brush her keel seemed laid her ribs put together and she launched from ezekiel's valley of dry bones in the present business in which she was engaged the ship's general model and rig appeared to have undergone no material change from their original warlike and froissart pattern however no guns were seen the tops were large and were railed about with what had once been octagonal network all now in sad disrepair these tops hung overhead like three ruinous aviaries in one of which was seen perched on a rattlin a white noddy a strange fowl so called from its lethargic somnambulistic character being frequently caught by hand at sea battered and mouldy the castellated forecastle seemed some ancient turret long ago taken by assault and then left to decay toward the stern two high-raised quarter galleries the balustrades here and there covered with dry tindery sea moss opening out from the unoccupied state cabin whose dead lights for all the mild weather were hermetically closed and caulked these tenantless balconies hung over the sea as if it were the grand venetian canal but the principal relic of the faded grandeur was the ample oval of the shield-like stern-piece intricately carved with the arms of castile and leon medallioned about by groups of mythological or symbolical devices uppermost and central of which was a dark satyr in a mask holding his foot on the prostrate neck of a writhing figure likewise masked whether the ship had a figurehead or only a plain beak was not quite certain owing to canvas wrapped about that part either to protect it while undergoing a refurbishing or else decently to hide its decay rudely painted or chalked as in a sailor freak along the forward side of a sort of pedestal below the canvas was the sentence seguid vuestro jefe follow your leader while upon the tarnished headboards near by appeared in stately capitals once gilt the ship's name san dominique 
each letter streakingly corroded with tricklings of copper-spike rust, while, like morning weeds, dark festoons of sea-grass slimily swept to and fro over the name, with every hearse-like roll of the hull. As at last the boat was hooked from the bow along toward the gangway amidship, its keel, while yet some inches separated from the hull, harshly grated as on sunken coral reef. It proved a huge bunch of conglobated barnacles adhering below the water to the side, like a wen, a token of baffling airs and long calms passed somewhere in those seas. Climbing the side, the visitor was at once surrounded by a clamorous throng of whites and blacks, but the latter outnumbered the former more than could have been expected, negro transportation ship as the stranger in port was. But in one language, and as with one voice, all poured out a common tale of suffering, in which the negresses, of whom there were not a few, exceeded the others in their dolorous vehemence. The scurvy, together with the fever, had swept off a great part of their number, more especially the Spaniards. Off Cape Horn they had narrowly escaped shipwreck. Then for days together they had lain tranced without wind. Their provisions were low, their water next to none, their lips that moment were baked. While Captain Delano was thus made the mark of all eager tongues, his one eager glance took in all the faces with every other object about him. Always upon first boarding a large and populous ship at sea, especially a foreign one with a nondescript crew such as Lascars or Manila men, the impression varies in a peculiar way from that produced by first entering a strange house with strange inmates in a strange land. Both house and ship, the one by its walls and blinds, the other by its high bulwarks, like ramparts, hoard from view their interiors till the last moment. But in the case of the ship there is this addition, that the living spectacle it contains, upon its sudden and complete disclosure, has, in contrast with the blank ocean which zones it, something of the effect of enchantment. The ship seems unreal. These strange costumes, gestures, and faces, but a shadowy tableau just emerged from the deep, which directly must receive back what it gave. Perhaps it was some such influence as above is attempted to be described, which in Captain Delano's mind heightened whatever, upon a staid scrutiny, might have seemed unusual especially the conspicuous figures of four elderly grizzled negroes, their heads like black dotted willow-tops, who, in venerable contrast to the tumult below them, were couched sphinx-like, one on the starboard cathead, another on the larboard, and the remaining pair face to face on the opposite bulwarks above the main chains. They each had bits of unstranded old junk in their hands, and, with a sort of stoical self-content, were picking the junk into oakum, a small heap of which lay by their sides. They accompanied the task with a continuous, low, monotonous chant, droning and drilling away like so many gray-headed bagpipers playing a funeral march. The quarter-deck rose into an ample elevated poop, upon the forward verge of which lifted, like the oakum pickers, some eight feet above the general throng, sat along in a row, separated by regular spaces, the cross-legged figures of six other blacks, each with a rusty hatchet in his hand, which, with a bit of brick and a rag, he was engaged like a scullion in scouring, while between each two was a small stack of hatchets, their rusted edges turned forward, awaiting a like operation though occasionally the four oakum pickers would briefly address some person or persons in the crowd below, yet the six hatchet polishers neither spoke to others nor breathed a whisper among themselves, but sat intent upon their task, except at intervals when, with the peculiar love in negroes of uniting industry with pastime, two and two they sideways clashed their hatchets together, like symbols, with a barbarous din 
all six, unlike the generality, had the raw aspect of unsophisticated Africans. But that first comprehensive glance which took in those ten figures, with scores less conspicuous, rested but an instant upon them, as, impatient of the hubbub of voices, the visitor turned in quest of whomsoever it might be that commanded the ship. But as if not unwilling to let nature make known her own case among his suffering charge, or else in despair of restraining it for the time, the Spanish captain, a gentlemanly, reserved-looking, and rather young man to a stranger's eye, dressed with singular richness, but bearing plain traces of recent sleepless cares and disquietudes, stood passively by, leaning against the mainmast at one moment casting a dreary, spiritless look upon his excited people, at the next an unhappy glance toward his visitor. By his side stood a black of small stature, in whose rude face, as occasionally, like a shepherd's dog, he mutely turned it up into the Spaniards, sorrow and affection were equally blended. Struggling through the throng, the American advanced to the Spaniard, assuring him of his sympathies, and offering to render whatever assistance might be in his power, to which the Spaniard returned for the present, but grave and ceremonious acknowledgments, his national formality dusked by the saturnine mood of ill-health. But losing no time in mere compliments, Captain Delano, returning to the gangway, had his basket of fish brought up, and as the wind still continued light, so that some hours at least must elapse ere the ship could be brought to the anchorage, he bade his men return to the sealer, and fetch back as much water as the whaleboat could carry, with whatever soft bread the steward might have, all the remaining pumpkins on board, with a box of sugar, and a dozen of his private bottles of cider. Not many minutes after the boat's pushing off, to the vexation of all, the wind entirely died away and the tide, turning, began drifting back the ship helplessly seaward. But, trusting this would not long last, Captain Delano sought, with good hopes, to cheer up the strangers, feeling no small satisfaction that, with persons in their condition, he could, thanks to his frequent voyages along the Spanish main, converse with some freedom in their native tongue. While left alone with them, he was not long in observing some things tending to heighten his first impressions, but surprise was lost in pity, both for the Spaniards and blacks, alike evidently reduced from scarcity of water and provisions, while long-continued suffering seemed to have brought out the less good-natured qualities of the negroes, besides, at the same time, impairing the Spaniards' authority over them but under the circumstances precisely this condition of things was to have been anticipated. In armies, navies, cities, or families, in nature herself, nothing more relaxes good order than misery. Still, Captain Delano was not without the idea that, had Benito Sereno been a man of greater energy, misrule would hardly have come to the present pass. But the debility constitutional or induced by hardships, bodily and mental, of the Spanish captain, was too obvious to be overlooked. A prey to settled dejection, as if long mocked with hope he would not now indulge it, even when it had ceased to be a mock, the prospect of that day, or evening at furthest, lying at anchor, with plenty of water for his people and a brother captain to counsel and befriend, seemed in no perceptible degree to encourage him. His mind appeared unstrung, if not still more seriously affected. Shut up in these oaken walls, chained to one dull round of command whose unconditionality cloyed him, like some hypochondriac abbot he moved slowly about, at times suddenly pausing, starting or staring, biting his lip, biting his fingernail, flushing, paling, twitching his beard, with other symptoms of an absent or moody mind. This distempered spirit was lodged, as before hinted, in as distempered a frame. He was rather tall, 
but seemed never to have been robust, and now with nervous suffering was almost worn to a skeleton. A tendency to some pulmonary complaint appeared to have been lately confirmed. His voice was like that of one with lungs half gone, hoarsely suppressed, a husky whisper. No wonder that, as in this state he tottered about, his private servant apprehensively followed him. Sometimes the negro gave his master his arm, or took his handkerchief out of his pocket for him, performing these and similar offices with that affectionate zeal which transmutes into something filial, or fraternal acts in themselves, but menial, and which has gained for the negro the repute of making the most pleasing body-servant in the world, one, too, whom a master need to be on no stiffly superior terms with, but may treat with familiar trust, less a servant than a devoted companion. Marking the noisy indocility of the blacks in general, as well as what seemed the sullen inefficiency of the whites, it was not without humane satisfaction that Captain Delano witnessed the steady good conduct of Babot. But the good conduct of Babot, hardly more than the ill behavior of others, seemed to withdraw the half-lunatic Don Benito from his cloudy languor. Not that such precisely was the impression made by the Spaniard on the mind of his visitor. The Spaniard's individual unrest was, for the present, but noted as a conspicuous feature in the ship's general affliction. Still Captain Delano was not a little concerned at what he could not help taking, for the time to be, Don Benito's unfriendly indifference toward himself. The Spaniard's manner, too, conveyed a sort of sour and gloomy disdain, which he seemed at no pains to disguise. But this the American in charity ascribed to the harassing effects of sickness, since in former instances he had noted that there are peculiar natures on whom prolonged physical suffering seems to cancel every social instinct of kindness, as if forced to black bread themselves they deemed it but equity that each person coming nigh them should, indirectly, by some slight or affront, be made to partake of their fare. But ere long Captain Delano bethought him that, indulgent as he was at the first in judging the Spaniard, he might not, after all, have exercised charity enough. At bottom it was Don Benito's reserve which displeased him, but the same reserve was shown towards all but his faithful personal attendant. Even the formal reports, which, according to sea usage, were, at stated times, made to him by some petty underling, either a white, mulatto, or black, he hardly had patience enough to listen to, without betraying contemptuous aversion. His manner upon such occasions was, in its degree, not unlike that which might be supposed to have been his imperial countryman's charles v just previous to the anchoritage retirement of that monarch from the throne this splenetic disrelish of his place was evinced in almost every function pertaining to it proud as he was moody he condescended to no personal mandate whatever special orders were necessary their delivery was delegated to his body-servant who in turn transferred them to their ultimate destination through runners, alert Spanish boys or slave boys, like pages or pilot fish within easy call, continually hovering round Don Benito. So that to have beheld this undemonstrative invalid gliding about, apathetic and mute, no landsman could have dreamed that in him was lodged a dictatorship beyond which, while at sea, there was no earthly appeal. Thus the Spaniard, regarded in his reserve, seemed the involuntary victim of mental disorder. But in fact his reserve might in some degree have proceeded from design. If so, then here was evinced the unhealthy climax of that icy, though conscientious, policy, more or less adopted by all commanders of large ships, which, except in signal emergencies, obliterates alike the manifestation of sway with every trace of sociality, transforming the man into a block, or rather into a loaded cannon, which until there is call for thunder has nothing to say. 
viewing him in this light it seemed but a natural token of the perverse habit induced by a long course of such hard self-restraint that notwithstanding the present condition of his ship the spaniard should still persist in a demeanor which however harmless or it may be appropriate in a well-appointed vessel such as the san dominique might have been at the outset of the voyage was anything but judicious now but the spaniard perhaps thought that it was with captains as with gods reserve under all events must still be their cue but probably this appearance of slumbering dominion might have been but an attempted disguise to conscious imbecility not deep policy but shallow device but be all this as it might whether don benito's manner was designed or not the more captain delano noted its pervading reserve the less he felt uneasiness at any particular manifestation of that reserve towards himself neither were his thoughts taken up by the captain alone wanted to the quiet orderliness of the sealer's comfortable family of a crew the noisy confusion of the san dominic's suffering host repeatedly challenged his eye some prominent breaches not only of discipline but of decency were observed these captain delano could not but describe in the main to the absence of those subordinate deck officers to whom along with higher duties is entrusted what may be styled the police department of a populous ship true the old oakum pickers appeared at times to act the part of monitorial constables to their countrymen the blacks but though occasionally succeeding in allaying trifling outbreaks now and then between man and man they could do little or nothing toward establishing general quiet the san dominique was in the condition of a transatlantic emigrant ship among whose multitude of living freight are some individuals doubtless as little troublesome as crates and bales but the friendly remonstrances of such with their ruder companions are of not so much avail as the unfriendly arm of the mate what the san dominique wanted was what the emigrant ship has stern superior officers but on these decks not so much as a fourth mate was to be seen the visitor's curiosity was roused to learn the particulars of those mishaps which had brought about such absenteeism with its consequences because though deriving some inkling of the voyage from the wails which at the first moment had greeted him yet of the details no clear understanding had been had the best account would doubtless be given by the captain yet at first the visitor was loath to ask it unwilling to provoke some distant rebuff but plucking up courage he at last accosted don benito renewing the expression of his benevolent interest adding that did he captain delano but know the particulars of the ship's misfortunes he would perhaps be better able in the end to relieve them would don benito favor him with the whole story don benito faltered then like some somnambulist suddenly interfered with vacantly stared at his visitor and ended by looking down on the deck he maintained this posture so long that captain delano almost equally disconcerted and involuntarily almost as rude turned suddenly from him walking forward to accost one of the spanish seamen for the desired information but he had hardly gone five paces when with a sort of eagerness don benito invited him back regretting his momentary absence of mind and professing readiness to gratify him while most part of the story was being given the two captains stood on the after part of the main deck a privileged spot no one being near but the servant it is now a hundred and ninety days began the spaniard in his husky whisper that this ship well officered and well manned with several cabin passengers some fifty spaniards in all sailed from buenos aires bound to lima with a general cargo hardware paraguay tea and the like and pointing forward that parcel of negroes now not more than a hundred and fifty as you see 
but then numbering over three hundred souls. Off Cape Horn we had heavy gales. In one moment, by night, three of my best officers with fifteen sailors were lost, with the main yard, the spars snapping under them in the slings as they sought with heavers to beat down the icy sail. To lighten the hull the heavier sacks of mata were thrown into the sea, with most of the water-pipes lashed on deck at the time, and this last necessity it was, combined with the prolonged detections afterwards experienced, which eventually brought about our chief causes of suffering, when here there was a sudden fainting attack of his cough, brought on no doubt by his mental distress. His servant sustained him, and, drawing a cordial from his pocket, placed it to his lips. He a little revived, but unwilling to leave him unsupported while yet imperfectly restored, the black with one arm still encircled his master, at the same time keeping his eye fixed on his face, as if to watch for the first sign of complete restoration, or relapse, as the event might prove. The Spaniard proceeded but brokenly and obscurely as one in a dream. Oh, my God! Rather than pass through what I have, with joy I would have hailed the most terrible gales. But... His cough returned, and with increased violence. This subsiding, with reddened lips and closed eyes, he fell heavily against his supporter. His mind wanders! He was thinking of the plague that followed the gales, plaintively sighed the servant. My poor, poor master, wringing one hand and with the other wiping the mouth. But uh, be patient, senor, again turning to Captain Delano. These fits do not last long. Master will soon be himself. Don Benito, reviving, went on. But as this portion of the story was very brokenly delivered, the substance only will here be set down. It appeared that after the ship had been many days tossed in storms off the Cape, the scurvy broke out, carrying off numbers of the whites and blacks. When at last they had worked round into the Pacific, their spars and sails were so damaged and so inadequately handled by the surviving mariners, most of whom were become invalids, that unable to lay her northerly course by the wind, which was powerful, the unmanageable ship, for successive days and nights, was blown northwestward, where the breeze suddenly deserted her, in unknown waters, to sultry calms. The absence of the water-pipes now proved as fatal to life as before their presence had menaced it induced or at least aggravated by the more than scanty allowance of water a malignant fever followed the scurvy with the excessive heat of the lengthened calm making such short work of it as to sweep away as by billows whole families of the africans and yet a larger number proportionately of the spaniards including by a luckless fatality every remaining officer on board Consequently, in the smart west winds eventually following the calm, the already rent sails, having to be simply dropped, not furled at need, had been gradually reduced to the beggar's rags they were now. To procure substitutes for his lost sailors, as well as supplies of water and sails, the captain at the earliest opportunity had made for Baltivia the southernmost civilized port of Chile and South America, but upon nearing the coast the thick weather had prevented him from so much as sighting that harbor, since which period almost without a crew, and almost without canvas, and almost without water, and at intervals giving its added dead to the sea, the San Dominic had been battledored about by contrary winds, inveigled by currents, or grown weedy in calms. Like a man lost in woods, more than once, she had doubled upon her own track. But throughout these calamities, huskily continued Don Benito, painfully returning in the half-embrace of his servant, I have to thank those negroes, you see, who, 
though to your inexperienced eyes appearing unruly, have indeed conducted themselves with less of restlessness than even their owner could have thought possible under such circumstances. Here again he fell faintly back. Again his mind wandered, but he rallied, and less obscurely proceeded. Yes, their owner was quite right in assuring me that no fetters would be needed with his blacks, so that while, as is wont in this transportation, those negroes have always remained upon deck, not thrust below as in the guinea men, they have also from the beginning been freely permitted to range within given bounds at their pleasure. Once more the faintness returned, his mind roved, but recovering he resumed. But it is Babo here to whom, under God, I owe not only my own preservation, but likewise to him chiefly the merit is due of pacifying his more ignorant brethren when at intervals tempted to murmurings ah master sighed the black bowing his face don't speak of me babo is nothing what babo has done was but duty faithful fellow cried captain delano don benito i envy you such a friend slave i cannot call him as master and man stood before him, the black upholding the white, Captain Delano could not but bethink him of the beauty of that relationship which could present such a spectacle of fidelity on the one hand and confidence on the other. The scene was heightened by the contrast in dress, denoting their relative positions. The Spaniard wore a loose chili jacket of dark velvet, white smallcloths and stockings, with silver buckles at the knee and instep, a high-crowned sombrero of fine grass, a slender sword, silver-mounted, hung from a knot in his sash, the last being an almost invariable adjunct, more for utility than ornament, of a South American gentleman's dress to this hour. Excepting when his occasional nervous contortions brought about disarray, there was a certain precision in his attire, curiously at variance with the unsightly disorder around, especially in the belittered ghetto, forward of the main mast, wholly occupied by the blacks. The servant wore nothing but wide trousers, apparently, from their coarseness and patches, made out of some old topsail. They were clean, and confined at the waist by a bit of unstranded rope, which, with his composed deprecatory air at times, made him look something like a begging friar of St. Francis. However unsuitable for the time and place, at least in the blunt thinking of Americans' eyes, and however strangely surviving in the midst of all his afflictions, the toilette of Don Benito might not, in fashion at least, have gone beyond the style of the day among South Americans of his class, though on the present voyage sailing from Buenos Aires, he had avowed himself a native and resident of Chile, whose inhabitants had not so generally adopted the plain coat and once plebeian pantaloons, but with a becoming modification adhered to their provincial costume picturesque as any in the world. Still, relatively to the pale history of the voyage and his own pale face, there seemed something so incongruous in the Spaniard's apparel as almost to suggest the image of an invalid courtier tottering about London streets in the time of the plague. The portion of the narrative which, perhaps, most excited interest, as well as some surprise, considering the latitudes in question, was the long calm spoken of, and, more particularly, the ships so long drifting about. Without communicating the opinion, of course, the American could not but impute at least part of the detentions both to clumsy seamanship and faulty navigation. Eyeing Don Benito's small yellow hands, he easily inferred that the young captain had not got into command at the hawse hole, but the cabin window, and if so, why wonder at incompetence in youth, sickness, and gentility united? But drowning criticism in compassion, after a fresh repetition of his sympathies, Captain Delano, having heard out his story, 
not only engaged, as in the first place, to see Don Benito and his people supplied in their immediate bodily needs, but also, now farther, promised to assist him in procuring a large permanent supply of water, as well as some sails and rigging, and though it would involve no small embarrassment to himself, yet he would spare three of his best seamen for temporary deck officers, so that without delay the ship might proceed to Concepcion, there fully to refit for Lima, her destined port. Such generosity was not without its effect, even upon the invalid. His face lighted up. Eager and hectic, he met the honest glance of his visitor. With gratitude he seemed overcome. "'This excitement is bad for master,' whispered the servant, taking his arm, and with soothing words gently drawing him aside. When Don Benito returned, the American was pained to observe that his hopefulness, like the sudden kindling in his cheek, was but febrile and transient. Ere long, with a joyless mien, looking up towards the poop, the host invited his guests to accompany him there for the benefit of what little breath of wind might be stirring. As during the telling of the story Captain Delano had once or twice started at the occasional cymballing of the hatchet polishers, wondering why such an interruption should be allowed, especially in that part of the ship, and in the ears of an invalid, and moreover as the hatchets had anything but an attractive look, and the handlers of them still less so, it was, therefore, to tell the truth, not without some lurking reluctance or even shrinking, it may be, that Captain Delano, with apparent complacence, acquiesced in his host's invitation. The more so, since, with an untimely caprice of punctilio, rendered distressing by his cadaverous aspect, Don Benito, with Castilian bows, solemnly insisted upon his guests preceding him up the ladder leading to the elevation, where, one on each side of the last step, sat for armorial supporters and sentries two of the ominous file. Gingerly enough stepped good Captain Delano between them, and in the instant of leaving them behind like one running the gauntlet, he felt an apprehensive twitch in the calves of his legs. But when facing about he saw the whole file, like so many organ-grinders, still stupidly intent on their work, unmindful of everything beside, he could not but smile at his late fidgety panic. Presently, while standing with his host looking forward upon the decks below, he was struck by one of those instances of insubordination previously alluded to. Three black boys, with two Spanish boys, were sitting together on the hatches, scraping a rude wooden platter in which some scanty mess had recently been cooked. Suddenly one of the black boys, enraged at a word dropped by one of his white companions, seized a knife, and, though called to forbear by one of the oakum pickers, struck the lad over the head, inflicting a gash from which blood flowed. In amazement Captain Delano inquired what this meant to which the pale Don Benito dully muttered that it was merely the sport of the lad. "'Pretty serious sport, truly,' rejoined Captain Delano. Had such a thing happened on board the bachelor's delight, instant punishment would have followed. At these words the Spaniard turned upon the American one of his sudden, staring, half-lunatic looks. Then, relapsing into his torpor, answered, "'Doubtless, doubtless, senor. Is it, thought Captain Delano, that this hapless man is one of those paper captains I've known, who by policy wink at what by power they cannot put down? I know no sadder sight than a commander who has little of command but the name. I should think, Don Benito, he now said, glancing towards the oakum picker who had sought to interfere with the boys, that you would find it advantageous to keep all your blacks employed especially the younger ones, no matter at what useless task, and no matter what happens to the ship. Why, even with my little band I find such a course indispensable. I once kept a crew on my quarter-deck thrumming mats for my cabin, when for three days I had given up my ship, mats, men and all, for a speedy loss, owing to the violence of a gale, in which we could do nothing but helplessly drive before it. 
doubtless doubtless muttered don benito but continued captain delano again glancing upon the oakum pickers and then at the hatchet polishers near by i see you keep some at least of your host employed yes was again the vacant response those old men there shaking their pows from their pulpits continued captain delano pointing to the oakum pickers seem to act the part of old dominies to the rest little heeded as their admonitions are at times is this voluntary on their part don benito or have you appointed them shepherds to your flock of black sheep what posts they fill i appointed them rejoined the spaniard in an acrid tone as if resenting some supposed satiric reflection and these others these ashanti conjurers here continued captain delano rather uneasily eyeing the brandished steel of the hatchet polishers where in spots it had been brought to a shine this seems a curious business they are at don benito in the gales we met answered the spaniard what of our general cargo was not thrown overboard was much damaged by the brine since coming into calm weather i have had several cases of knives and hatchets daily brought up for overhauling and cleaning a prudent idea don benito you are part owner of ship and cargo i presume but none of the slaves perhaps i am owner of all you see impatiently returned don benito except the main company of blacks who belong to my late friend alexandro aranda as he mentioned this name his air was heartbroken his knees shook his servant supported him thinking he divined the cause of such unusual emotion to confirm his surmise captain delano after a pause said and may i ask don benito whether since a while ago you spoke of some cabin passengers the friend whose loss so afflicts you at the outset of the voyage accompanied his blacks yes but died of the fever died of the fever oh could i but again quivering the spaniard paused pardon me said captain delano slowly but i think that by a sympathetic experience i conjecture don benito what it is that gives the keener edge to your grief it was once my hard fortune to lose at sea a dear friend my own brother then supercargo assured of the welfare of his spirit its departure i could have borne like a man but that honest eye that honest hand both of which had so often met mine and that warm heart all all like scraps to the dogs to throw all to the sharks it was then i vowed never to have for fellow voyager a man i loved unless unbeknown to him i had provided every requisite in case of a fatality for embalming his mortal part for internment on shore were your friend's remains now on board this ship don benito not thus strangely would the mention of his name affect you on board this ship echoed the spaniard then with horrified gestures as directed against some spectre he unconsciously fell into the ready arms of his attendant who with a silent appeal toward captain delano seemed beseeching him not again to broach a theme so unspeakably distressing to his master this poor fellow now thought the pained american is the victim of that sad superstition which associates goblins with the deserted body of man as ghosts with an abandoned house how unlike are we made what to me in like case would have been a solemn satisfaction the bare suggestion even terrifies the spaniard into this trance poor alejandro aranda what would you say could you hear see your friend who on former voyages when you for months were left behind has i dare say often longed and longed for one peep at you now transported with terror at the least thought of having you anyway nigh him at this moment with a dreary graveyard toll betokening a flaw the ship's forecastle bell smote by one of the grizzled oakum pickers 
proclaimed ten o'clock through the leaden calm when captain delano's attention was caught by the moving figure of a gigantic black emerging from the general crowd below and slowly advancing towards the elevated poop an iron collar was about his neck from which depended a chain thrice wound round his body the terminating links padlocked together at a broad band of iron his girdle how like a mute Atafal moves murmured the servant the black mounted the steps of the poop and like a brave prisoner brought up to receive sentence stood in unquailing muteness before don benito now recovered from his attack at the first glimpse of his approach don benito had started a resentful shadow swept over his face and as with the sudden memory of bootless rage his white lips glued together this is some mulish mutineer thought captain delano surveying not without a mixture of admiration the colossal form of the negro see he waits your question master said the servant thus reminded don benito nervously averting his glance as if shunning by anticipation some rebellious response in a disconcerted voice thus spoke atafa will you ask my pardon now the black was silent again master murmured the servant with bitter upbraiding eyeing his countryman again master he will bend to master yet answer said don benito still averting his glance say but the one word pardon and your chains shall be off upon this the black slowly raising both arms let them lifelessly fall his links clanking his head bowed as much as to say no i am content go said don benito with inkept and unknown emotion deliberately as he had come the black obeyed excuse me don benito said captain delano but this scene surprises me what means it pray it means that that negro alone of all the band has given me peculiar cause of offence i have put him in chains i here he paused his hand to his head as if there were a swimming there or a sudden bewilderment of memory had come over him but meeting his servant's kindly glance seemed reassured and proceeded i could not scourge such a form but i told him he must ask my pardon as yet he has not at my command every two hours he stands before me and how long has this been some sixty days and obedient in all else and respectful yes upon my conscience then exclaimed captain delano impulsively he has a royal spirit in him this fellow he may have some right to it bitterly returned don benito he says he was a king in his own land yes said the servant entering a word those slits in atafal's ears once held wedges of gold but poor babo here in his own land was only a poor slave a black man's slave was babo who now is the whites somewhat annoyed by these conversational familiarities captain delano turned curiously upon the attendant then glanced inquiringly at his master but as if long wanted to these little informalities neither master nor man seemed to understand him what pray was atafal's offense don benito asked captain delano if it was not something very serious take a fool's advice and in view of his general docility as well as in some natural respect for his spirit remit him his penalty no no master never will do that here murmured the servant to himself proud atafal must first ask master's pardon the slave there carries the padlock but master here carries the key his attention thus directed captain delano now noticed for the first that suspended by a slender silken cord from don benito's neck hung a key at once from the servant's muttered syllables divining the key's purpose he smiled and said so don benito padlock and key significant symbols truly biting his lip don benito faltered 
though the remark of captain delano a man of such native simplicity as to be incapable of satire or irony had been dropped in playful allusion to the spaniard's singularly evidenced lordship over the black yet the hypochondriac seemed some way to have taken it as a malicious reflection upon his confessed inability thus far to break down at least on a verbal summons the entrenched will of the slave deploring this supposed misconception yet despairing of correcting it captain delano shifted the subject but finding his companion more than ever withdrawn as if still sourly digesting the lees of the presumed affront above mentioned by and by captain delano likewise became less talkative oppressed against his own will by what seemed the secret vindictiveness of the morbidly sensitive spaniard but the good sailor himself of a quite contrary disposition refrained on his part alike from the appearance as from the feeling of resentment and if silent was only so from contagion presently the spaniard assisted by his servant somewhat discourteously crossed over from his guest a procedure which sensibly enough might have been allowed to pass for idle caprice of ill-humor had not master and man lingering round the corner of the elevated skylight began whispering together in low voices this was unpleasing and more the moody air of the spaniard which at times had not been without a sort of valetudinarian stateliness now seemed anything but dignified while the menial familiarity of the servant lost its original charm of simple-hearted attachment in his embarrassment the visitor turned his face to the other side of the ship by so doing his glance accidentally fell on a young spanish sailor a coil of rope in his hand just stepped from the deck to the first round of the mizzen rigging perhaps the man would not have been particularly noticed were it not that during his ascent to one of the yards he with a sort of covert intentness kept his eye fixed on captain delano from whom presently it passed as if by a natural sequence to the two whisperers his own attention thus redirected to that quarter captain delano gave a slight start from something in don benito's manner just then it seemed as if the visitor had at least partly been the subject of the withdrawn consultation going on a conjecture as little agreeable to the guest as it was little flattering to the host the singular alternations of courtesy and ill-breeding in the spanish captain were unaccountable except on one of two suppositions innocent lunacy or wicked imposture but the first idea though it might naturally have occurred to an indifferent observer and in some respect had not hitherto been wholly a stranger to captain delano's mind yet now that in an incipient way he began to regard the stranger's conduct something in the light of an intentional affront of course the idea of lunacy was virtually vacated but if not a lunatic what then under the circumstances would a gentleman nay any honest boor act the part now acted by his host the man was an impostor some low-born adventurer masquerading as an oceanic grandee yet so ignorant of the first requisites of mere gentlemanhood as to be betrayed into the present remarkable indecorum that strange ceremoniousness too at other times evinced seemed not uncharacteristic of one playing a part above his real level benito serrano don benito serrano a sounding name one too at that period not unknown in the surname to supercargoes and sea captains trading along the spanish main as belonging to one of the most enterprising and extensive mercantile families in all those provinces several members of it having titles a sort of castilian rothschild with a noble brother or cousin in every great trading town of south america the alleged don benito was in early manhood about twenty-nine or thirty to assume a sort of roving cadetship in the maritime affairs of such a house what more likely scheme for a young knave of talent and spirit but the spaniard was a pale invalid never mind 
for even to the degree of simulating mortal disease the craft of some tricksters had been known to attain to think that under the aspect of infantile weakness the most savage energies might be couched those velvets of the spaniard but the silky paw to his fangs from no train of thought did these fancies come not from within but from without suddenly too and in one throng like hoarfrost yet as soon to vanish as the mild sun of captain delano's good nature regained its meridian glancing over once more towards his host whose side face revealed above the skylight was now turned toward him he was struck by the profile whose clearness of cut was refined by the thinness incident to ill health as well as ennobled about the chin by the beard away with suspicion he was a true offshoot of a true hidalgo serrano relieved by these and other better thoughts the visitor lightly humming a tune now began indifferently pacing the poop so as not to betray to don benito that he had at all mistrusted incivility much less duplicity for such mistrust would yet be proved illusory and by the event though for the present the circumstance which had provoked that distrust remained unexplained but when that little mystery should have been cleared up captain delano thought he might extremely regret it did he allow don benito to become aware that he had indulged in ungenerous surmises in short to the spaniard's black-letter text it was best, for a while, to leave open margin. End of section 4, chapter 3a, Benito Sereno, part 1. Section 5 of The Piazza Tales by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3b, Benito Sereno, part 2. Presently, his pale face twitching and overcast, the spaniard still supported by his attendant moved over towards his guest when with even more than his usual embarrassment and a strange sort of intriguing intonation in his husky whisper the following conversation began senor may i ask how long you have lain at this isle oh but a day or two don benito and from what port are you last canton and there senor you exchanged your sealskins for teas and silks i think you said yes silks mostly and the balance you took in specie perhaps captain delano fidgeting a little answered yes some silver not a very great deal though ah well may i ask how many men have you senor captain delano slightly started but answered about five and twenty all told and at present senor all on board i suppose all on board don benito replied the captain now with satisfaction and will be to-night senor at this last question following so many pertinacious ones for the soul of him captain delano could not but look very earnestly at the questioner who instead of meeting the glance with every token of craven discomposure dropped his eyes to the deck presenting an unworthy contrast to his servant who just then was kneeling at his feet adjusting a loose shoe buckle his disengaged face meantime with humble curiosity turned openly up into his master's downcast one the spaniard still with a guilty shuffle repeated his question and and will be to-night senor yes for aught i know returned captain delano but nay rallying himself into fearless truth some of them talked of going off on another fishing party about midnight your ships generally go go more or less armed i believe senor oh a six-pounder or two in case of emergency was the intrepidly indifferent reply with a small stock of muskets, sealing spears, and cutlasses, you know. As he thus responded, Captain Delano again glanced at Don Benito, 
but the latter's eyes were averted while abruptly and awkwardly shifting the subject he made some peevish allusion to the calm and then without apology once more with his attendant withdrew to the opposite bulwarks where the whispering was resumed at this moment and ere captain delano could cast a cool thought upon what had just passed the young spanish sailor before mentioned was seen descending from the rigging in act of stooping over to bring in board to the deck his voluminous unconfined frock or shirt of coarse woolen much spotted with tar opened out far down the chest revealing a soiled undergarment of what seemed the finest linen edged about the neck with a narrow blue ribbon sadly faded and worn at this moment the young sailor's eye was again fixed on the whisperers and captain delano thought he observed a lurking significance in it as if silent signs of some freemason sort had at that instant been interchanged this once more impelled his own glance in the direction of don benito and as before he could not but infer that himself formed the subject of the conference he paused the sound of the hatchet polishing fell on his ears he cast another swift side look at the two they had the air of conspirators in connection with the late questionings and the incident of the young sailor these things now begat such return of involuntary suspicion that the singular guilelessness of the american could not endure it plucking up a gay and humorous expression he crossed over to the two rapidly saying <laughs> don benito your black here seems high in your trust a sort of privy councillor in fact upon this the servant looked up with a good-natured grin but the master started as from a venomous bite it was a moment or two before the spaniard sufficiently recovered himself to reply which he did at last with cold constraint yes senor i have trust in babo here babo changing his previous grin of mere animal humor into an intelligent smile not ungratefully eyed his master finding that the spaniard now stood silent and reserved as if involuntarily or purposefully giving hint that his guest's proximity was inconvenient just then captain delano unwilling to appear uncivil even to incivility itself made some trivial remark and moved off again and again turning over in his mind the mysterious demeanor of don benito serrano he had descended from the poop and wrapped in thought was passing near a dark hatchway leading down into the steerage when perceiving motion there he looked to see what moved the same instant there was a sparkle in the shadowy hatchway and he saw one of the spanish sailors prowling there hurriedly placing his hand in the bosom of his frock as if hiding something before the man could have been certain who it was that was passing he slunk below out of sight but enough was seen of him to make it sure that he was the same young sailor before noticed in the rigging what was that which so sparkled thought captain delano it was no lamp no match no live coal could it have been a jewel but how come sailors with jewels or with silk trimmed undershirts either has he been robbing the trunks of the dead cabin passengers but if so he would hardly wear one of the stolen articles on board ship here ah ah if now that was indeed a secret sign i saw passing between this suspicious fellow and his captain a while since if i could only be certain that in my uneasiness my senses did not deceive me then here passing from one suspicious thing to another his mind revolved these strange questions put to him concerning his ship by a curious coincidence as each point was recalled the black wizards of ashanti would strike up with their hatchets as in ominous comment on the white stranger's thoughts pressed by such enigmas and portents it would have been almost against nature had not even into the least distrustful heart some ugly misgivings obtruded 
observing the ship now helplessly fallen into a current with enchanted sails drifting with increased rapidity seaward and noting that from a lately intercepted projection of the land the sealer was hidden the stout mariner began to quake at thoughts which he barely durst confess to himself above all he began to feel a ghostly dread of don benito and yet when he roused himself dilated his chest felt himself strong on his legs and coolly considered it what did all these phantoms amount to had the spaniard any sinister scheme it must have reference not so much to him captain delano as to his ship the bachelor's delight hence the present drifting away of the one ship from the other instead of favoring any such possible scheme was for the time at least opposed to it clearly any suspicion combining such contradictions must need be delusive beside was it not absurd to think of a vessel in distress a vessel by sickness almost dismanned of her crew a vessel whose inmates were parched for water was it not a thousand times absurd that such a craft should at present be of a piratical character or her commander either for himself or those under him cherish any desire but for speedy relief and refreshment but then might not general distress and thirst in particular be affected and might not that same undiminished spanish crew alleged to have perished off to a remnant be at that very moment lurking in the hold on heart-broken pretense of entreating a cup of cold water fiends in human form had got into lonely dwellings nor retired until a dark deed had been done and among the malay pirates it was no unusual thing to lure ships after them into their treacherous harbors or entice boarders from a declared enemy at sea by the spectacle of thinly manned or vacant decks beneath which prowled a hundred spears with yellow arms ready to upthrust them through the mats not that captain delano had entirely credited such things he had heard of them and now as stories they recurred the present destination of the ship was the anchorage there she would be near his own vessel upon gaining that vicinity might not the san dominic like a slumbering volcano suddenly let loose energies now hid he recalled the spaniard's manner while telling his story there was a gloomy hesitancy and subterfuge about it it was just the manner of one making up his tale for evil purposes as he goes but if that story was not true what was the truth that the ship had unlawfully come into the spaniard's possession but in many of its details especially in reference to the more calamitous parts such as the fatalities among the seamen the consequent prolonged beating about the past sufferings from obstinate calms and still continued suffering from thirst in all these points as well as others don benito's story had corroborated not only the wailing ejaculations of the indiscriminate multitude white and black but likewise what seemed impossible to be counterfeit by the very expression and play of every human feature which captain delano saw if don benito's story was throughout an invention then every soul on board down to the youngest negress was his carefully drilled recruit in the plot an incredible inference and yet if there was ground for mistrusting his veracity that inference was a legitimate one but those questions of the spaniard there indeed one might pause did they not seem put with much the same object with which the burglar or assassin by daytime reconnoitres the walls of a house but with ill purposes to solicit such information openly of the chief person endangered and so in effect setting him on his guard how unlikely a procedure was that absurd then to suppose that those questions had been prompted by evil designs thus the same conduct which in this instance had raised the alarm served to dispel it in short scarce any suspicion or uneasiness however apparently reasonable at the time which was not now with equal apparent reason 
dismissed. At last he began to laugh at his former forebodings, and laugh at the strange ship, for, in its aspect, some way siding with them, as it were, and laugh, too, at the odd-looking blacks, particularly those old scissors-grinders, the Ashantis, and those bedridden old knitting-women, the oakum-pickers, and almost at the dark Spaniard himself, the central hobgoblin of all. For the rest, whatever in a serious way seemed enigmatical, was now good-naturedly explained away by the thought that, for the most part, the poor invalid scarcely knew what he was about, either sulking in black vapors or putting idle questions without sense or object. Evidently, for the present, the man was not fit to be entrusted with a ship. On some benevolent plea withdrawing the command from him, Captain Delano would yet have to send her to Conception in charge of his second mate, a worthy person and good navigator, a plan not more convenient for the San Dominic than for Don Benito, for, relieved from all anxiety, keeping wholly to his cabin, the sick man, under the good nursing of his servant, would probably by the end of the passage be in a measure restored to health, and with that he should also be restored to authority. Such were the Americans' thoughts. They were tranquilizing. There was a difference between the idea of Don Benito's darkly preordaining Captain Delano's fate and Captain Delano's lightly arranging Don Benito's. Nevertheless, it was not without something of relief that the good seaman presently perceived his whaleboat in the distance. Its absence had been prolonged by unexpected detention at the sealer's side, as well as its returning trip lengthened by the continual recession of the goal. The advancing speck was observed by the blacks. Their shouts attracted the attention of Don Benito, who, with a return of courtesy approaching Captain Delano, expressed satisfaction at the coming of some supplies, slight and temporary, as they must necessarily prove. Captain Delano responded, but while doing so his attention was drawn to something passing on the deck below. Among the crowd, climbing the landward bulwarks, anxiously watching the coming boat, two blacks, to all appearances accidentally incommoded by one of the sailors, violently pushed him aside, which the sailor some way resenting, they dashed him to the deck, despite the earnest cries of the oakum-pickers. "'Don Benito,' said Captain Delano quickly, "'do you see what is going on there? Look!' But, seized by his cough, the Spaniard staggered, with both hands to his face on the point of falling. Captain Delano would have supported him, but the servant was more alert, who, with one hand sustaining his master, with the other applied the cordial. Don Benito restored. The black withdrew his support, slipping aside a little, but dutifully remaining within call of a whisper. Such discretion was here evinced as quite wiped away in the visitor's eyes any blemish of impropriety which might have attached to the attendant from the indecorous conferences before mentioned, showing, too, that if the servant were to blame, it might be more the master's fault than his own, since, when left to himself, he could conduct thus well. His glance called away from the spectacle of disorder to the more pleasing one before him, Captain Delano could not avoid again congratulating his host upon possessing such a servant, who, though perhaps a little too forward now and then, must upon the whole be invaluable to one in the invalid's situation. "'Tell me, Don Benito,' he added with a smile, "'I should like to have your man here myself. What will you take for him? Would uh, fifty doubloons be any object?' "'Master wouldn't part with Babel.' "'For a thousand doubloons,' murmured the black, overhearing the offer, and taking it in earnest, and, with the strange vanity of a faithful slave, appreciated by his master, scorning to hear so paltry a valuation put upon him by a stranger. But Don Benito, apparently hardly yet completely restored, and again interrupted by his cough, made but some broken reply." Soon his physical distress became so great, affecting his mind too, apparently, 
that as if to screen the sad spectacle the servant gently conducted his master below left to himself the american to while away the time till his boat should arrive would have pleasantly accosted some one of the few spanish seamen he saw but recalling something that don benito had said touching their ill conduct he refrained as a shipmaster indisposed to countenance cowardice or unfaithfulness in seamen while with these thoughts standing with eye directed forward towards that handful of sailors suddenly he thought that one or two of them returned the glance and with a sort of meaning he rubbed his eyes and looked again but again seemed to see the same thing under a new form but more obscure than any previous one the old suspicions recurred but in the absence of don benito with less of panic than before despite the bad account given of the sailors captain delano resolved forthwith to accost one of them descending the poop he made his way through the blacks his movement drawing a queer cry from the oakum pickers prompted by whom the negroes twitching each other aside divided before him but as if curious to see what was the object of this deliberate visit to their ghetto closing in behind in tolerable order followed the white stranger up his progress thus proclaimed as by mounted kings at arms and escorted as by a kaffra guard of honor captain delano assuming a good-humored off-handed air continued to advance now and then saying a blithe word to the negroes and his eye curiously surveying the white faces here and there sparsely mixed in with the blacks like stray white pawns venturously involved in the ranks of the chessmen opposed while thinking which of them to select for his purpose he chanced to observe a sailor seated on the deck engaged in tarring the strap of a large block a circle of blacks squatted round him inquisitively eyeing the process the mean employment of the man was in contrast with something superior in his figure his hand black with continually thrusting it into the tar-pot held for him by a negro seemed not naturally allied to his face a face which would have been a very fine one but for its haggardness whether this haggardness had aught to do with criminality could not be determined since as intense heat and cold though unlike produce like sensations so innocence and guilt when through casual association with mental pain stamping any visible impress use one seal a hacked one not again that this reflection occurred to captain delano at the time charitable man as he was rather another idea because observing so singular a haggardness combined with a dark eye averted as in trouble and shame and then again recalling don benito's confessed ill opinion of his crew insensibly he was operated upon by certain general notions which while disconnecting pain and abashment from virtue invariably link them with vice if indeed there be any wickedness on board this ship thought captain delano be sure that man there has fouled his hand in it even as now he fouls it in the pitch i don't like to accost him i will speak to this other this old jack here on the windlass he advanced to an old barcelona tar in ragged red breeches and dirty nightcap cheeks trenched and bronzed whiskers dense as thorn hedges seated between two sleepy-looking africans this mariner like his younger shipmate was employed upon some rigging splicing a cable the sleepy-looking blacks performing the inferior function of holding the outer parts of the rope for him upon captain delano's approach the man at once hung his head below its previous level the one necessary for business it appeared as if he desired to be thought absorbed with more than common fidelity in his task being addressed he glanced up but with what seemed a furtive diffident air which sat strangely enough on his weather-beaten visage much as if a grizzly bear instead of growling and biting should simper and cast sheep's eyes he was asked several questions concerning the voyage 
questions purposely referring to several particulars in Don Benito's narrative, not previously corroborated by those impulsive cries greeting the visitor on first coming on board. The questions were briefly answered, confirming all that remained to be confirmed of the story. The negroes about the windlass joined in with the old sailor, but as they became talkative, he by degrees became mute, and at length quite glum, seemed morosely unwilling to answer more questions, and yet, all the while, this ursine air was somehow mixed with his sheepish one. Despairing of getting into unembarrassed talk with such a centaur, Captain Delano, after glancing round for a more promising countenance, but seeing none, spoke pleasantly to the blacks to make way for him and so amid various grins and grimaces returned to the poop, feeling a little strange at first, he could hardly tell why, but upon the whole with regained confidence in Benito Sereno. How plainly, thought he, did that old whiskerando yonder betray a consciousness of ill desert. No doubt when he saw me coming he dreaded lest I, apprised by his captain of the crew's general misbehavior, came with sharp words for him, and so down with his head. And yet, and yet, now that I think of it, that very old fellow, if I err not, was one of those who seemed so earnestly eyeing me here a while since. Ah, these currents spin one's head round almost as much as they do the ship. Ha! Ah, there now's a pleasant sort of sunny sight quite sociable, too. His attention had been drawn to a slumbering negress, partly disclosed through the lacework of some rigging, lying, with youthful limbs carelessly disposed, under the lee of the bulwarks, like a doe in the shade of a woodland rock. Sprawling at her lapped breasts was her wide-awake fawn, stark naked, its black little body half lifted from the deck, crosswise with its dams its hands, like two paws, clambering upon her, its mouth and nose ineffectually rooting to get at the mark, and, meantime, giving a vexatious half-grunt, blending with the composed snore of the negress. The uncommon vigor of the child at length roused the mother. She started up at a distance, facing Captain Delano, but as if not at all concerned at the attitude in which she had been caught, delightedly she caught the child up with maternal transports, covering it with kisses. There's naked nature now, pure tenderness and love, thought Captain Delano, well pleased. This incident prompted him to remark the other negresses more particularly than before. He was gratified with their manners. Like most uncivilized women, they seemed at once tender of heart and tough of constitution equally ready to die for their infants, or fight for them, unsophisticated as leopardesses, loving as doves. Ah, thought Captain Delano, these perhaps are some of the very women whom Ledyard saw in Africa and gave such a noble account of. These natural sights somehow insensibly deepened his confidence and ease. At last he looked to see how his boat was getting on, but it was still pretty remote. He turned to see if Don Benito had returned, but he had not. To change the scene, as well as to please himself with a leisurely observation of the coming boat, stepping over into the mizzen chains, he clambered his way into the starboard quarter-gallery, one of those abandoned Venetian-looking water-balconies previously mentioned, retreats cut off from the deck. As his foot pressed the half-damp, half-dry sea-mosses matting the place, and a chance phantom cat's paw, an islet of breeze unheralded, unfollowed, as this ghostly cat's paw came fanning his cheek. As his glance fell upon the row of small, round deadlights, all closed like coppered eyes of the coffin, and the state cabin door, once connecting with the gallery, even as the deadlights had once looked out upon it, but now caulked fast like a sarcophagus lid, and to a purple-black tarred-over panel threshold and post, and he bethought him of the time 
when that state cabin and this state balcony had heard the voices of the spanish king's officers and the forms of the lima viceroy's daughters had perhaps leaned where he stood as these and other images flitted through his mind as the cat's paw through the calm gradually he felt rising a dreamy inquietude like that of one who alone on the prairie feels unrest from the repose of the noon he leaned against the carved balustrade again looking off toward his boat but found his eye falling upon the ribbon grass trailing along the ship's waterline straight as a border of green box and parterres of seaweed broad ovals and crescents floating nigh and far with what seemed long formal alleys between crossing the terraces of swells and sweeping round as if leading to the grottoes below and overhanging all was the balustrade by his arm which partly stained with pitch and partly embossed with moss seemed the charred ruin of some summer-house in a grand garden long running to waste trying to break one charm he was but be charmed anew though upon the wide sea he seemed in some far inland country prisoner in some deserted chateau left to stare at empty grounds and peer out at vague roads where never wagon or wayfarer passed but these enchantments were a little disenchanted as his eye fell on the corroded main chains of an ancient style massy and rusty in link shackle and bolt they seemed even more fit for the ship's present business than the one for which she had been built presently he thought something moved nigh the chains he rubbed his eyes and looked hard groves of rigging were about the chains and there peering from behind a great stay like an indian from behind a hemlock a spanish sailor a marlin spike in his hand was seen who made what seemed an imperfect gesture towards the balcony but immediately as if alarmed by some advancing step along the deck within vanished into the recesses of the hempen forest like a poacher what meant this something the man had sought to communicate unbeknown to any one even to his captain did the secret involve aught unfavorable to his captain were those previous misgivings of captain delano's about to be verified or in his haunted mood at the moment had some random unintentional motion of the man while busy with the stay as if repairing it been mistaken for a significant beckoning not unbewildered again he gazed off for his boat but it was temporarily hidden by a rocky spur of the isle as with some eagerness he bent forward watching for the first shooting view of its beak the balustrade gave way before him like charcoal had he not clutched an outreaching rope he would have fallen into the sea the crash though feeble and the fall though hollow of the rotten fragments must have been overheard he glanced up with sober curiosity peering down upon him was one of the old oakum pickers slipped from his perch to an outside boom while below the old negro and invisible to him reconnoitering from a porthole like a fox from the mouth of its den crouched the spanish sailor again from something suddenly suggested by the man's air the mad idea now darted into captain delano's mind that don benito's plea of indisposition in withdrawing below was but a pretense that he was engaged there maturing his plot of which the sailor by some means gaining an inkling had a mind to warn the stranger against incited it may be by gratitude for a kind word on first boarding the ship was it from foreseeing some possible interference like this that don benito had beforehand given such a bad character of his sailors while praising the negroes though indeed the former seemed as docile as the latter the contrary the whites too by nature were the shrewder race a man with some evil design would he not be likely to speak well of that stupidity which was blind to his depravity and malign that intelligence from which it might not be hidden not unlikely perhaps but if the whites had dark secrets concerning don benito could then don benito be any way in complicity with the blacks but they were too stupid 
Besides, who ever heard of a white so far a renegade as to apostatize from his very species almost by leaguing in against it with negroes? These difficulties recalled former ones. Lost in their mazes, Captain Delano, who had now regained the deck, was uneasily advancing along it when he observed a new face, an aged sailor, seated cross-legged near the main hatchway. His skin was shrunk up with wrinkles like a pelican's empty pouch, his hair frosted, his countenance grave and composed. His hands were full of ropes, which he was working into a large knot. Some blacks were about him, obligingly dipping the strands for him here and there, as the exigencies of the operation demanded. Captain Delano crossed over to him and stood in silence surveying the knot, his mind, by a not uncongenial transition, passing from its own entanglements to those of the hemp. For intricacy such a knot he had never seen in an American ship, nor indeed any other. The old man looked like an Egyptian priest, making Gordian knots for the temple of Ammon. The knot seemed a combination of double bowline knot, treble crown knot, back-handed well knot, knot in and out knot, and jamming knot. At last, puzzled to comprehend the meaning of such a knot, Captain Delano addressed the knotter. "'What are you knotting there, my man?' "'The knot.' was the brief reply, without looking up. Well, so it seems, but what is it for? For someone else to undo, muttered back the old man, plying his fingers harder than ever, the knot being now nearly completed. While Captain Delano stood watching him, suddenly the old man threw the knot toward him, saying in unbroken English, the first heard in the ship, something to this effect, Undo it! Cut it! Quick! It was said lowly, but with such condensation of rapidity that the long, slow words in Spanish which had preceded and followed almost operated as covers to the brief English between. For a moment not in hand, and not in head, Captain Delano stood mute, while without further heeding him the old man was now intent upon other ropes. Presently there was a slight stir behind Captain Delano. Turning, he saw the chained negro, Atafal, standing quietly there. The next moment the old sailor rose, muttering, and followed by his subordinate negroes, removed to the forward part of the ship, where in the crowd he disappeared. An elderly negro in a clout like an infant's, and with a pepper-and-salt head and a kind of attorney air, now approached Captain Delano. Intolerable Spanish, and with a good-natured knowing wink, he informed him that the old knotter was simple-witted, but harmless, often playing his odd tricks. The negro concluded by begging the knot, for, of course, the stranger would not care to be troubled with it. Unconsciously it was handed to him. With a sort of congé the negro received it, and, turning his back, ferreted into it like a detective custom-house officer after smuggled laces. Soon, with some African word equivalent to pshaw, he tossed the knot overboard. All this is very queer now, thought Captain Delano, with a qualmish sort of emotion. But as one feeling incipient seasickness, he strove, by ignoring the symptoms, to get rid of the malady. Once more he looked off for his boat. To his delight, it was now again in view, leaving the rocky spur astern. The sensation here experienced, after at first relieving his uneasiness, with unforeseen efficacy soon began to remove it. The less distant sight of that well-known boat, showing it, not as before, half blended with the haze, but with outline defined, so that its individuality, like a man's, was manifest, that boat, Rover by name, which, though now in strange seas, had often pressed the beach of Captain Delano's home, and brought to its threshold for repairs, had familiarly lain there as a Newfoundland dog. The sight of that household boat evoked a thousand trustful associations, which, contrasted with previous suspicions, 
filled him not only with lightsome confidence, but somehow with half-humorous self-reproaches at his former lack of it. What? I, Amasa Delano, Jack of the Beach, as they called me when a lad, I, Amasa, the same that duck satchel in hand used to paddle along the water-side to the schoolhouse made from the old hulk i little jack of the beach that used to go burying with cousin nat and the rest i to be murdered here at the ends of the earth on board a haunted pirate ship by a horrible spaniard too nonsensical to think of who would murder amasa delano his conscience is clean there is some one above. Fie, fie, Jack of the Beach, you are a child indeed, a child of the second childhood, old boy. You are beginning to dote and drool, I'm afraid. Light of heart and foot he stepped aft, and there was met by Don Benito's servant, who, with a pleasing expression, responsive to his own present feelings, informed him that his master had recovered from the effects of his coughing fit, and had just ordered him to go present his compliments to his good guest, Don Massa, and say that he, Don Benito, would soon have the happiness to rejoin him. There now, do you mark that? Again thought Captain Delano, walking the poop. What a donkey I was! This kind gentleman who here sends me his kind compliments, he, but ten minutes ago, dark lantern in hand, was dodging round some old grindstone in the hold, sharpening a hatchet for me, I thought. Well, well, these long calms have a morbid effect on the mind I've often heard, though I never believed it before. Ha! Glancing towards the boat, there's Rover, good dog, a white bone in her mouth. A pretty big bone, though, seems to me. What? Yes, she has fallen afoul of the bubbling tide rip there. It sets her the other way, too, for the time. Patience. It was now about noon, though. From the grayness of everything it seemed to be getting towards dusk. The calm was confirmed. In the far distance, away from the influence of land, the leaden ocean seemed laid out and leaded up, its course finished, soul gone, defunct. But the current from landward, where the ship was, increased silently sweeping her further and further towards the tranced waters beyond. Still, from his knowledge of those latitudes, cherishing hopes of a breeze, and a fair and fresh one at any moment, Captain Delano, despite present prospects, buoyantly counted upon bringing the San Dominique safely to anchor ere night. The distance swept over was nothing, since with a good wind ten minutes sailing would retrace more than sixty minutes drifting meantime one moment turning to mark rover fighting the tide rip and the next to see don benito approaching he continued walking the poop gradually he felt a vexation arising from the delay of his boat this soon merged into uneasiness and at last his eye falling continually as from a stage box into the pit upon the strange crowd before and below him, and, by and by recognizing there the face, now the composed to indifference, of the Spanish sailor who had seemed to beckon from the main chains, something of his old trepidations returned. Ah, thought he, gravely enough, this is like the ague. Because it went off it follows not that it won't come back though ashamed of the relapse he could not altogether subdue it and so exerting his good nature to the utmost insensibly he came to a compromise yes this is a strange craft a strange history too and strange folks on board but nothing more by way of keeping his mind out of mischief till the boat should arrive he tried to occupy it with turning over and over, in a purely speculative sort of way, some lesser peculiarities of the captain and crew. Among others, four curious points recurred. First, the affair of the Spanish lad assailed with a knife by the slave-boy, an act winked at by Don Benito. Second, the tyranny in Don Benito's treatment of Atafal the Black, as if a child should lead a bull of the Nile by the ring in his nose. 
third the trampling of the sailor by the two negroes a piece of insolence passed over without so much as a reprimand fourth the cringing submission to their master of all the ship's underlings mostly blacks as if by the least inadvertence they feared to draw down his despotic displeasure coupling these points they seemed somewhat contradictory but what then thought captain delano glancing towards his now nearing boat what then why don benito is a very capricious commander but he is not the first of the sort i have seen though it's true he rather exceeds any other but as a nation continued he in his reveries these spaniards are all an odd set the very word spaniard has a curious conspirator guy fawkish twang to it and yet i dare say spaniards in the main are as good folks as any in duxbury massachusetts ah good at last rover has come as with its welcome freight the boat touched the side the oakum pickers with venerable gestures sought to restrain the blacks who at the sight of three gurried water casks in its bottom and a pile of wilted pumpkins in its bow hung over the bulwarks in disorderly raptures don benito with his servant now appeared his coming perhaps hastened by hearing the noise of him captain delano sought permission to serve out the water so that all might share alike and none injure themselves by unfair excess but sensible and on don benito's account kind as this offer was it was received with what seemed impatience as if aware that he lacked energy as a commander don benito with the true jealousy of weakness resented as an affront any interference so at least captain delano inferred in another moment the casks were being hoisted in when some of the eager negroes accidentally jostled captain delano where he stood by the gangway so that unmindful of don benito yielding to the impulse of the moment with good-natured authority he bade the blacks stand back to enforce his words making use of a half mirthful half menacing gesture instantly the blacks paused just where they were each negro and negress suspended in his or her posture exactly as the word had found them for a few seconds continuing so while as between the responsive posts of a telegraph an unknown syllable ran from man to man among the perched oakum pickers while the visitor's attention was fixed by this scene suddenly the hatchet polishers half rose and a rapid cry came from don benito thinking that at the signal of the spaniard he was about to be massacred captain delano would have sprung for his boat but paused as the oakum pickers dropping down into the crowd with earnest exclamations forced every white and every negro back at the same moment with gestures friendly and familiar almost jocus bidding him in substance not be a fool simultaneously the hatchet polishers resumed their seats quietly as so many tailors and at once as if nothing had happened the work of hoisting in the casks was resumed whites and blacks singing at the tackle captain delano glanced towards don benito as he saw his meagre form in the act of recovering itself from reclining in the servant's arms into which the agitated invalid had fallen he could not but marvel at the panic by which himself had been surprised on the darting supposition that such a commander who upon a legitimate occasion so trivial too as it now appeared could lose all self-command was with energetic iniquity going to bring about his murder the casks being on deck captain delano was handed a number of jars and cups by one of the steward's aides who in the name of his captain entreated him to do as he had proposed dole out the water he complied with republican impartiality as to this republican element which always seeks one level serving the oldest white no better than the youngest black excepting indeed poor don benito whose condition if not rank demanded an extra allowance to him in the first place captain delano presented a fair pitcher of the fluid 
but thirsting as he was for it the spaniel quaffed not a drop until after several grave bows and salutes a reciprocation of courtesies which the sight-loving africans hailed with clapping of hands two of the less wilted pumpkins being reserved for the cabin table the residue were minced up on the spot for the general regalement but the soft bread sugar and bottled cider captain delano would have given the whites alone and in chief don benito but the latter objected which disinterestedness not a little pleased the american and so mouthfuls all around were given alike to whites and blacks excepting one bottle of cider which babo insisted upon setting aside for his master here it may be observed that as on the first visit of the boat the american had not permitted his men to board the ship neither did he now being unwilling to add to the confusion of the decks not uninfluenced by the peculiar good humor at present prevailing and for the first time oblivious of any but benevolent thoughts captain delano who from recent indications counted upon a breeze within an hour or two at the furthest dispatched the boat back to the sealer with orders for all the hands that could be spared immediately to set about rafting casks to the watering place and filling them likewise he bade word be carried to his chief officer that if against present expectation the ship was not brought to anchor by sunset he need be under no concern for as there was to be a full moon that night he captain delano would remain on board ready to play the pilot come the wind soon or late as the two captains stood together observing the departing boat the servant as it happened having just spied a spot on his master's velvet sleeve and silently engaged rubbing it out the american expressed his regrets that the son dominic had no boats none at least but the unseaworthy old hulk of the longboat which warped as a camel's skeleton in the desert and almost as bleached lay potwise inverted amidships one side a little tipped furnishing a subterraneous sort of den for family groups of the blacks mostly women and small children, who, squatting on old mats below, or perched above in the dark dome on the elevated seats, were descried, some distance within, like a social circle of bats sheltering in some friendly cave. At intervals, ebon flights of naked boys and girls, three or four years old, darting in and out of the den's mouth. Had you three or four boats now don benito said captain delano i think that by tugging at the oars your negroes here might help along matters some did you sail from port without boats don benito they were stove in the gales senor that was bad many men too you lost then boats and men those must have been hard gales don benito past all speech cringed the spaniard tell me don benito continued his companion with increased interest tell me were these gales immediately off the pitch of cape horn cape horn who spoke of cape horn yourself did when giving me an account of your voyage answered captain delano with almost equal astonishment at this eating of his own words even as he never seemed eating his own heart on the part of the spaniard you yourself don benito spoke of cape horn he emphatically repeated the spaniard turned in a sort of stooping posture pausing an instant as one about to make a plunging exchange of elements as from air to water at this moment a messenger boy a white hurried by in the regular performance of his function carrying the last expired half hour forward to the forecastle from the cabin timepiece to have it struck at the ship's large bell master said the servant discontinuing his work on the coat sleeve and addressing the rapt spaniard with a sort of timid apprehensiveness as one charged with a duty the discharge of which it was foreseen would prove irksome to the very person who had imposed it and for whose benefit it was intended master told me never mind where he was or how engaged 
always to remind him to a minute when shaving time comes miguel has gone to strike the half-hour afternoon it is now master will master go into the cuddy ah yes answered the spaniard starting as from dreams into realities then turning upon captain delano he said that ere long he would resume the conversation then if master means to talk more to don amasa said the servant why not let don amasa sit by the master in the cuddy and master can talk and don amasa can listen while babo here lathers and strops yes said captain delano not unpleased with this sociable plan yes don benito unless you had rather not i will go with you be it so senor as the three passed aft the american could not but think it another strange instance of his host's capriciousness this being shaved with such uncommon punctuality in the middle of the day but he deemed it more than likely that the servant's anxious fidelity had something to do with the matter inasmuch as the timely interruption served to rally his master from the mood which had evidently been coming upon him the place called the cuddy was a light deck cabin formed by the poop a sort of attic to the large cabin below part of it had formerly been the quarters of the officers but since their death all the partitioning had been thrown down and the whole interior converted into one spacious and airy marine hall for absence of fine furniture and picturesque disarray of odd appurtenances somewhat answering to the wide cluttered hall of some eccentric bachelor squire in the country who hangs his shooting jacket and tobacco pouch on deer antlers and keeps his fishing rod tongs and walking stick in the same corner the similitude was heightened if not originally suggested by glimpses of the surrounding sea since in one aspect the country and the ocean seem cousins german the floor of the cuddy was matted overhead four or five old muskets were stuck into horizontal holes along the beams on one side was a claw-footed old table lashed to the deck a thumbed missile on it and over it a small meagre crucifix attached to the bulkhead under the table lay a dented cutlass or two with a hacked harpoon among some melancholy old rigging like a heap of poor friars girdles there were also two long sharp-ribbed settees of malacca cane black with age and uncomfortable to look at as inquisitors racks with a large misshapen armchair which furnished with a rude barber's crotch at the back working with a screw seemed some grotesque engine of torment a flag locker was in one corner open exposing various colored bunting some rolled up others half unrolled still others tumbled opposite was a cumbrous washstand of black mahogany all of one block with a pedestal like a font and over it a railed shelf containing combs brushes and other implements of the toilet a torn hammock of stained grass swung near the sheets tossed and the pillow wrinkled up like a brow as if whoever slept here slept but illy with alternate visitations of sad thoughts and bad dreams the furniture extremity of the cuddy overhanging the ship's stern was pierced with three openings windows or portholes according as men or cannon might peer socially or unsocially out of them at present neither men nor cannon were seen though huge ring bolts and other rusty iron fixtures of the woodwork hinted of twenty-four pounders glancing towards the hammock as he entered captain delano said you sleep here don benito yes senor since we got into mild weather this seems a sort of dormitory sitting-room sail loft chapel armory and private closet altogether don benito added captain delano looking round yes senor events have not been favorable to much order in my arrangements here the servant napkin on arm made a motion as if waiting his master's good pleasure 
Don Benito signified his readiness when seating him in the Malacca armchair, and for the guest's convenience drawing opposite one of the settees, the servant commenced operations by throwing back his master's collar and loosening his cravat. There is something in the negro which in a peculiar way fits him for avocations about one's person. Most negroes are natural valets and hairdressers, taking to the comb and brush congenially as to the castanets, and flourishing them apparently with almost equal satisfaction. There is, too, a smooth tact about them in this employment, with a marvelous, noiseless, gliding briskness, not ungraceful in its way, singularly pleasing to behold, and still more so to be the manipulated subject of. And above all is the great gift of good humor. Not the mere grin or laugh is here meant, those were unsuitable, but a certain easy cheerfulness, harmonious in every glance and gesture, as though God had set the whole negro to some pleasant tune. When to this is added the docility arising from the unaspiring contentment of a limited mind, and that susceptibility of blind attachment sometimes inhering in indisputable inferiors, one readily perceives why those hypochondriacs Johnson and Byron, it may be something like the hypochondriac Benito Serrano, took to their hearts, almost to the exclusion of the entire white race, their serving-men, the negroes, Barber and Fletcher. But if there be that in the negro which exempts him from the inflicted sourness of the morbid or cynical mind, how in his most prepossessing aspects must he appear to a benevolent one? When at ease with respect to exterior things, Captain Delano's nature was not only benign, but familiarly and humorously so. At home he had often taken rare satisfaction in sitting in his door, watching some free man of color at his work or play. If on a voyage he chanced to have a black sailor, invariably he was on chatty and half-gamesome terms with him. In fact, like most men of a good, blithe heart, Captain Delano took to negroes, not philanthropically, but genially, just as other men, to Newfoundland dogs. Hitherto the circumstances in which he found the San Dominique had repressed the tendency, but in the cuddy, relieved from his former uneasiness, and for various reasons, more sociably inclined than at any previous period of the day, and, seeing the colored servant, napkin on arm, so debonair about his master, in a business so familiar as that of shaving, too, all his old weakness for negroes returned. Among other things, he was amused with an odd instance of the African love of bright colors and fine shows in the blacks informally taking from the flag locker a great piece of bunting of all hues and lavishly tucking it under his master's chin for an apron. The mode of shaving among the Spaniards is a little different from what it is with other nations. They have a basin, specifically called a barber's basin, which on one side is scooped out so as accurately to receive the chin, against which it is closely held in lathering, which is done not with a brush but with soap dipped in the water of the basin and rubbed on the face. In the present instance salt water was used for lack of better, and the parts lathered were only the upper lip and low down under the throat, all the rest being cultivated beard. The preliminaries being somewhat novel to Captain Delano, he sat curiously eyeing them, so that no conversation took place, nor, for the present, did Don Benito appear disposed to renew any. Setting down his basin, the negro searched among the razors, as for the sharpest, and having found it, gave it an additional edge by expertly strapping it on the firm, smooth, oily skin of his open palm. He then made a gesture as if to begin, but midway stood suspended for an instant, one hand elevating the razor, the other professionally dabbling among the bubbling suds on the Spaniard's lank neck. Not unaffected by the close sight of the gleaming steel, Don Benito nervously shuddered. His usual ghastliness was heightened by the lather, which lather, again, was intensified in its hue 
by the contrasting sootiness of the negro's body altogether the scene was somewhat peculiar at least to captain delano nor as he saw the two thus postured could he resist the vagary that in the black he saw a headsman and in the white a man at the block but this was one of those antic conceits appearing and vanishing in a breath from which perhaps the best regulated mind is not always free meantime the agitation of the spaniard had a little loosened the bunting from around him so that one broad fold swept curtain-like over the chair-arm to the floor revealing amid a profusion of armorial bars and ground colors black blue and yellow a closed castle in a blood-red field diagonal with a lion rampant in a white the castle and the lion exclaimed captain delano why don benito this is the flag of spain you use here it's well it's only i and not the king that sees this he added with a smile but turning towards the black it's all one i suppose so the colors be gay which playful remark did not fail somewhat to tickle the negro now master he said readjusting the flag and pressing the head gently further back into the crotch of the chair now master and the steel glanced nigh the throat again don benito faintly shuddered you must not shake so master see si, dona massa master always shakes when i shave him and yet master knows i never yet have drawn blood though it's true if master will shake so i may some of these times now master he continued and now dona massa please go on with your talk about the gale and all that master can hear and between times master can answer ah yes these gales said captain delano but the more i think of your voyage don benito the more i wonder not at the gales terrible as they must have been but at the disastrous interval following them for here by your account have you been these two months and more getting from cape horn to santa maria a distance which i myself with a good wind have sailed in a few days true you had calms and long ones but to be becalmed for two months that is at least unusual why don benito had almost any other gentleman told me such a story i should have been half disposed to a little incredulity end of section five benito sereno chapter three b section six of the piazza tales this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three c benito sereno part three here an involuntary expression came over the spaniard similar to that just before on the deck and whether it was the start he gave or a sudden gawky roll of the hull in the calm or a momentary unsteadiness of the servant's hand however it was just then the razor drew blood spots of which stained the creamy lather under the throat immediately the black barber drew back his steel and remaining in his professional attitude back to captain delano and face to don benito held up the trickling razor saying with a sort of half humorous sorrow see master you shook so here's babo's first blood no sword drawn before james the first of england no assassination in that timid king's presence could have produced a more terrified aspect than was now presented by don benito poor fellow thought captain delano so nervous he can't even bear the sight of barber's blood and this unstrung sick man is it credible that i should have imagined he meant to spill all my blood who can't endure the sight of one little drop of his own surely amasa delano you have been beside yourself this day tell it not when you get home sappy amasa well well he looks like a murderer doesn't he more like as if himself were to be done for well well this day's experience shall be a good lesson meantime while these things were running through the honest seaman's mind the servant had taken the napkin from his arm and to don benito had said but answer don massa please master 
while I wipe this ugly stuff off the razor and strop it again. As he said the words, his face was turned half round, so as to be alike visible to the Spaniard and the American, and seemed, by its expression, to hint that he was desirous, by getting his master to go on with the conversation, considerately to withdraw his attention from the recent annoying accident as if glad to snatch the offered relief, Don Benito resumed, rehearsing to Captain Delano that not only were the calms of unusual duration, but the ship had fallen in with obstinate currents, and other things he added, some of which were but repetitions of former statements, to explain how it came to pass that the passage from Cape Horn to Santa Maria had been so exceedingly long now and then mingling with his words incidental praises less qualified than before to the blacks for their general good conduct these particulars were not given consecutively the servant at convenient times using his razor and so between the intervals of shaving the story and panegyric went on with more than usual huskiness to captain delano's imagination now and again not wholly at rest there was something so hollow in the Spaniard's manner, with apparently some reciprocal hollowness in the servant's dusky comment of silence, that the idea flashed across him that possibly master and man, for some unknown purpose, were acting out, both in word and deed, nay, to the very tremor of Don Benito's limbs, some juggling play before him. Neither did the suspicion of collusion lack apparent support from the fact of those whispered conferences before mentioned. But then, what could be the object of enacting this play of the barber before him? At last, regarding the notion as a whimsy, insensibly suggested perhaps by the theatrical aspect of Don Benito in his Harlequin ensign, Captain Delano speedily banished it. The shaving over, the servant bestirred himself with a small bottle of scented waters, pouring a few drops on the head, and then diligently rubbing, the vehemence of the exercise causing the muscles of his face to twitch rather strangely. His next operation was with comb, scissors, and brush, going round and round, smoothing a curl here, clipping an unruly whisker hair there, giving a graceful sweep to the temple lock with other impromptu touches evincing the hand of a master. While, like any resigned gentleman in barber's hands, Don Benito bore all, much less uneasily, at least, than he had done the razoring. Indeed, he sat so pale and rigid now that the negro seemed a Nubian sculptor finishing off a white statue-head. All being over, at last, the standard of Spain removed, tumbled up, and tossed back into the flag-locker, the negro's warm breath blowing away any stray hair which might have lodged down his master's neck, collar and cravat readjusted, a speck of lint whisked off the velvet lapel, all this being done, backing off a little space, and pausing with an expression of subdued self-complacency, the servant for a moment surveyed his master as, in toilet at least, the creature of his own tasteful hands. Captain Delano playfully complimented him upon his achievement, at the same time congratulating Don Benito. But neither sweet waters, nor shampooing, nor fidelity, nor sociality delighted the Spaniard. Seeing him relapsing into forbidding gloom and still remaining seated, Captain Delano, thinking that his presence was undesired just then, withdrew on pretense of seeing whether, as he had prophesied, any signs of a breeze were visible. Walking forward to the mainmast, he stood a while thinking over the scene, and not without some undefined misgivings, when he heard a noise near the cuddy, and turning saw the negro his hand to his cheek. Advancing, Captain Delano perceived that the cheek was bleeding. He was about to ask the cause when the negro's wailing soliloquy enlightened him. Ah! When will master get better from his sickness? Only the sour heart that sour sickness breeds made him serve Babo so, cutting Babo with a razor, because only by accident Babo had given master one little scratch, and for the first time in so many a day, too, ah, 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 holding his hand to his face. 
is it possible thought captain delano was it to wreak in private his spanish spite against this poor friend of his that don benito by his sullen manner impelled me to withdraw ah this slavery breeds ugly passions in man poor fellow he was about to speak in sympathy to the negro but with a timid reluctance he now re-entered the cuddy presently master and man came forth don benito leaning on his servant as if nothing had happened but a sort of love quarrel after all thought captain delano he accosted don benito and they slowly walked together they had gone but a few paces when the steward a tall rajah-looking mulatto orientally set off with a pagoda turban formed by three or four madras handkerchiefs wound about his head tier on tier approaching with a salaam announced lunch in the cabin on their way thither the two captains were preceded by the mulatto who turning round as he advanced with continual smiles and bows ushered them on a display of elegance which quite completed the insignificance of the small bare-headed babo who as if not unconscious of inferiority eyed askance the graceful steward but in part captain delano imputed his jealous watchfulness to that peculiar feeling which the full-blooded african entertains for the adulterated one as for the steward his manner if not bespeaking much dignity of self-respect yet evidenced his extreme desire to please which is doubly meritorious as at once christian and chesterfieldian captain delano observed with interest that while the complexion of the mulatto was hybrid his physiognomy was european classically so don benito whispered he i am glad to see this usher of the golden rod of yours the sight refutes an ugly remark once made to me by a barbados planter that when a mulatto has a regular european face look out for him he is a devil but see your steward here has features more regular than king george's of england and yet there he nods and bows and smiles a king indeed the king of kind hearts and polite fellows what a pleasant voice he has too he has senor but tell me has he not so far as you have known him always proved a good worthy fellow said captain delano pausing while with a final genuflection the steward disappeared into the cabin come for the reason just mentioned i am curious to know francesco is a good man a sort of sluggishly responded don benito like a phlegmatic appreciator who would neither find fault nor flatter ah i thought so for it were strange indeed and not very creditable to us white skins if a little of our blood mixed with the africans should far from improving the latter's quality have the sad effect of pouring vitriolic acid into black broth improving the hue perhaps but not the wholesomeness doubtless doubtless senor but glancing at babo not to speak of negroes your planter's remark i have heard applied to the spanish and indian intermixtures in our provinces but i know nothing about the matter he listlessly added and here they entered the cabin the lunch was a frugal one some of captain delano's fresh fish and pumpkins biscuit and salt beef the reserved bottle of cider and the san dominic's last bottle of canary as they entered francesco with two or three colored aides was hovering over the table giving the last adjustments upon perceiving their master they withdrew francesco making a smiling conge and the spaniard without condescending to notice it fastidiously remarking to his companion that he relished not superfluous attendance without companions host and guest sat down like a childless married couple at opposite ends of the table don benito waving captain delano to his place and weak as he was insisting upon that gentleman being seated before himself the negro placed a rug under don benito's feet and a cushion behind his back and then stood behind not his master's chair but captain delano's at first this a little surprised the latter 
but it was soon evident that in taking his position the black was still true to his master, since by facing him he could the more readily anticipate his slightest want. "'This is an uncommonly intelligent fellow of yours, Don Benito,' whispered Captain Delano across the table. "'You say true, senor.' During the repast the guest again reverted to parts of Don Benito's story, begging further particulars here and there. He inquired how it was that the scurvy and fever should have committed such wholesale havoc upon the whites while destroying less than half of the blacks. As if this question reproduced the whole scene of plague before the Spaniard's eyes, miserably reminding him of his solitude in a cabin where, before he had had so many friends and officers round him, his hand shook, his face became hueless, broken words escaped but directly the sane memory of the past seemed replaced by insane terrors of the present. With starting eyes he stared before him at vacancy, for nothing was to be seen but the hand of his servant pushing the canary over towards him. At length a few sips served partially to restore him. He made random reference to the different constitutions of races, enabling one to offer more resistance to certain maladies than another. The thought was new to his companion. Presently Captain Delano, intending to say something to his host concerning the pecuniary part of the business he had undertaken for him, especially, since he was strictly accountable to his owners, with reference to the new suit of sails and other things of that sort, and naturally preferring to conduct such affairs in private, was desirous that the servant should withdraw, imagining that Don Benito, for a few minutes, could dispense with his attendance. He, however, waited a while, thinking that, as the conversation proceeded, Don Benito, without being prompted, would perceive the propriety of the step. But it was otherwise. At last, catching his host's eye, Captain Delano, with a slight backward gesture of his thumb, whispered, Don Benito, pardon me, but there is an interference with the full expression of what I have to say to you. Upon this the Spaniard changed countenance, which was imputed to his resenting the hint, as in some way a reflection upon his servant. After a moment's pause he assured his guest that the blacks remaining with them could be of no disservice, because since losing his officers he had made Babo, whose original office, it now appeared, had been captain of the slaves, not only his constant attendant and companion, but in all things his confidant. After this nothing more could be said, though indeed Captain Delano could hardly avoid some little tinge of irritation upon being left ungratified in so inconsiderable a wish by one, two, for whom he intended such solid services but it is only his carelessness, thought he, and so, filling his glass, he proceeded to business. The price of the sales and other matters was fixed upon, but while this was being done, the American observed that, though his original offer of assistance had been hailed with hectic animation, yet now, when it was reduced to a business transaction, indifference and apathy were betrayed. Don Benito, in fact, appeared to submit to hearing the details more out of regard to common propriety than from any impression that weighty benefit to himself and his voyage was involved. Soon his manner became still more reserved. The effort was vain to seek to draw him into social talk. Gnawed by his splenetic mood, he sat twitching his beard, while to little purpose the hand of his servant mute as that on the wall, slowly pushed over the canary. Lunch being over, they sat down on the cushioned transom, the servant placing a pillow behind his master. The long continuance of the calm had now affected the atmosphere. Don Benito sighed heavily, as if for breath. "'Why not adjourn to the cuddy?' said Captain Delano. "'There is more air there.' But the host sat silent and motionless. Meantime his servant knelt before him with a large fan of feathers, and Francesco, coming in on tiptoes, handed the negro a little cup of aromatic waters, with which, at intervals, he chafed his master's brow, smoothing the hair along the temples as a nurse does a child's. He spoke no word. 
He only rested his eye on his masters, as if, amid all Don Benito's distress, a little to refresh his spirit by the silent sight of fidelity. Presently the ship's bell sounded two o'clock, and through the cabin windows a slight rippling of the sea was discerned, and from the desired direction. "'There!' exclaimed Captain Delano. "'I told you so, Don Benito. Look!' He had risen to his feet, speaking in a very animated tone, with a view the more to rouse his companion. But though the crimson curtain of the stern window near him that moment fluttered against his pale cheek, Don Benito seemed to have even less welcome for the breeze than the calm. "'Poor fellow,' thought Captain Delano. Bitter experiences taught him that one ripple does not make a wind any more than one swallow a summer. But he is mistaken for once. I will get his ship in for him and prove it. Briefly alluding to his weak condition, he urged his host to remain quietly where he was, since he, Captain Delano, would with pleasure take upon himself the responsibility of making the best use of the wind. Upon gaining the deck, Captain Delano started at the unexpected figure of Atafal, monumentally fixed at the threshold, like one of those sculptured porters of black marble guarding the porches of Egyptian tombs. But this time the start was perhaps purely physical. Atafal's presence, singularly attesting docility even in sullenness, was contrasted with that of the hatchet-polishers who in patience evidence their industry. While both spectacles showed that lax as Don Benito's general authority might be, still, whenever he chose to exert it, no man so savage or colossal but must, more or less, bow. Snatching a trumpet which hung from the bulwarks with a free step, Captain Delano advanced to the forward edge of the poop, issuing his orders in his best Spanish. The few sailors and many negroes, all equally pleased, obediently set about heading the ship towards the harbor. While giving some directions about setting a lower stunnel sail, suddenly Captain Delano heard a voice faithfully repeating his orders. Turning, he saw Babo, now for the first time acting, under the pilot, his original part of captain of the slaves. This assistance proved valuable. Tattered sails and warped yards were soon brought into some trim, and no brace or halyard was pulled but to the blithe songs of the inspirited negroes. Good fellows, thought Captain Delano, a little training would make fine sailors of them. Why, see, the very women pull and sing, too. There must be some of those Ashanti negresses that make such capital soldiers, I've heard. But who's at the helm? I must have a good hand there. He went to sea. The San Dominique steered with a cumbrous tiller, with large horizontal pulleys attached. At each pulley end stood a subordinate black, and between them, at the tiller head, the responsible post. A Spanish seaman, whose countenance evinced his due share in the general hopefulness and confidence at the coming of the breeze, he proved the same man who had behaved with so shamefaced an air on the windlass. "'Ah, it is you, my man!' exclaimed Captain Delano. "'Well, no more sheep's eyes now. Look straight forward and keep the ship so. Good hand, I trust. And want to get into the harbor, don't you?' The man assented with an inward chuckle, grasping the tiller head firmly. Upon this, unperceived by the American, the two blacks eyed the sailor intently. Finding all right at the helm, the pilot went forward to the forecastle to see how matters stood there. The ship now had way enough to breast the current. With the approach of evening the breeze would be sure to freshen. Having done all that was needed for the present, Captain Delano, giving his last orders to the sailors, turned aft to report affairs to Don Benito in the cabin, perhaps additionally incited to rejoin him by the hope of snatching a moment's private chat while the servant was engaged upon deck. From opposite sides there were, beneath the poop, two approaches to the cabin, one further forward than the other, and consequently communicating with a longer passage. Marking the servant still above, Captain Delano, taking the nighest entrance, the one last named, and at whose porch Atiful still stood, hurried on his way till, arrived at the cabin threshold, he paused an instant, 
a little to recover from his eagerness. Then, with the words of his intended business upon his lips, he entered. As he advanced toward the seated Spaniard, he heard another footstep, keeping time with his. From the opposite door, a salver in hand, the servant was likewise advancing. Confound the faithful fellow, thought Captain Delano. What a vexatious coincidence! Possibly the vexation might have been something different, were it not for the brisk confidence inspired by the breeze. But even as it was, he felt a slight twinge from a sudden indefinite association in his mind of Babo with Atiful. Don Benito, said he, I give you joy. The breeze will hold and will increase. By the way, your tall man and timepiece Atiful stands without, by your order, of course. Don Benito recoiled, as if at some bland satirical touch delivered with such adroit garnish of apparent good breeding as to present no handle for retort. He is like one flayed alive, thought Captain Delano. Where may one touch him without causing a shrink? The servant moved before his master, adjusting a cushion, recalled to civility. The Spaniard stiffly replied, You are right. The slave appears where you saw him, according to my command, which is that if at the given hour I am below, he must take his stand and abide my coming. Ah, now, pardon me, but that is treating the poor fellow like an ex-king indeed. Ah, Don Benito, smiling, for all the license you permit in some things I fear lest at bottom you are a bitter hard master. Again Don Benito shrank, and this time, as the good sailor thought, from a genuine twinge of his conscience. Again conversation became constrained. In vain Captain Delano called attention to the now perceptible motion of the keel gently cleaving the sea. With lackluster eye, Don Benito returned words few and reserved. By and by the wind, having steadily risen and still blowing right into the harbor, bore the San Dominique swiftly on. Sounding a point of land, the sealer at distance came into open view. Meantime Captain Delano had again repaired to the deck, remaining there some time. Having at last altered the ship's course so as to give the reef a wide berth, he returned for a few moments below. I will cheer up my poor friend this time, thought he. Better and better, Don Benito, he cried as he blithely re-entered. There will soon be an end to your cares, at least for a while. For when, after a long sad voyage, you know, the anchor drops into the haven, all its vast weight seems lifted from the captain's heart. We are getting on famously, Don Benito. My ship is in sight. Look through this side-light here. There she is, all a tanto. The bachelor's delight, my good friend. Ah, how this wind braces one up. Come, you must take a cup of coffee with me this evening. My old steward will give you as fine a cup as ever any sultan tasted. What say you, Don Benito, will you? At first the Spaniard glanced feverishly up, casting a longing look towards the sealer, while with mute concern his servant gazed into his face. Suddenly the old ague of coldness returned, and dropping back to his cushions he was silent. "'You do not answer. Come, all day you have been my host. Would you have hospitality all on one side?' "'I cannot go,' was the response. What? It will not fatigue you. The ships will lie together as near as they can, without swinging fowl. It will be little more than stepping from deck to deck, which is but as from room to room. Come, come, you must not refuse me. I cannot go, decisively and repulsively repeated Don Benito. Renouncing all but the last appearance of courtesy with a sort of cadaverous sullenness, and biting his thin nails to the quick, he glanced, almost glared at his guest, as if impatient that a stranger's presence should interfere with the full indulgence of his morbid hour. Meantime the sound of the parted waters came more and more gurglingly and merrily into the windows, as reproaching him for his dark spleen, as telling him that, sulk as he might, and go mad with it, nature cared not a jot, since whose fault was it, pray? But the foul mood was now at its depth, 
as the fair wind at its height. There was something in the man so far beyond any mere unsociality or sourness previously evinced that even the forbearing good nature of his guest could no longer endure it. Wholly at a loss to account for such demeanor, and deeming sickness with eccentricity, however extreme, no adequate excuse, well satisfied, too, that nothing in his own conduct could justify it, Captain Delano's pride began to be roused himself became reserved. But all seemed one to the Spaniard. Quitting him, therefore, Captain Delano once more went to the deck. The ship was now within less than two miles of the sealer. The whale-boat was seen darting over the interval. To be brief, the two vessels, thanks to the pilot's skill, ere long neighborly style lay anchored together. Before returning to his own vessel, Captain Delano had intended communicating to Don Benito the smaller details of the proposed services to be rendered, but as it was unwilling anew to subject himself to rebuffs, he resolved, now that he had seen the San Dominic safely moored, immediately to quit her without further allusion to hospitality or business. Indefinitely postponing his ulterior plans, he would regulate his future actions according to future circumstances. His boat was ready to receive him, but his host still tarried below. Well, thought Captain Delano, if he has little breeding, the more need to show mine. He descended to the cabin to bid a ceremonious and, it may be, tacitly rebukeful adieu. But, to his great satisfaction, Don Benito, as if he began to feel the weight of that treatment with which his slighted guest had not indecorously retaliated upon him, now supported by his servant, rose to his feet, and grasping Captain Delano's hand, stood tremulous, too much agitated to speak. But the good augury hence drawn was suddenly dashed, by his resuming all his previous reserve, with augmented gloom, as, with half-averted eyes, he silently reseated himself on his cushions. With a corresponding return of his own chilled feelings, Captain Delano bowed and withdrew. He was hardly midway in the narrow corridor, dim as a tunnel, leading from the cabin to the stairs, when a sound, as of the tolling for execution in some jail-yard, fell on his ears. It was the echo of the ship's flawed bell, striking the hour, drearily reverberated in this subterranean vault. Instantly, by a fatality not to be withstood, his mind, responsive to the portend, swarmed with superstitious suspicions. He paused. In images far swifter than these sentences, the minutest details of all his former distrusts swept through him. Hitherto, credulous good nature had been too ready to furnish excuses for reasonable fears. Why was the Spaniard, so superfluously punctilious at times, now heedless of common propriety in not accompanying to the side his departing guest? Did indisposition forbid? Indisposition had not forbidden more irksome exertion that day. His last equivocal demeanor recurred. He had risen to his feet, grasped his guest's hand, motioned toward his hat, then, in an instant, all was eclipsed in sinister muteness and gloom. Did this imply one brief, repentant relenting at the final moment from some iniquitous plot, followed by remorseless return to it? His last glance seemed to express a calamitous, yet acquiescent farewell to Captain Delano forever. Why decline the invitation to visit the sealer that evening? Or was the Spaniard less hardened than the Jew, who refrained not from supping at the board of him whom the same night he meant to betray. What imported all those day-long enigmas and contradictions, except they were intended to mystify, preliminary to some stealthy blow? Attiful, the pretended rebel, but punctual shadow, that moment lurked by the threshold without. He seemed a century, and more. Who, by his own confession, had stationed him there? Was the negro now lying in wait? The Spaniard behind, his creature before, to rush from darkness to light was the involuntary choice. The next moment, with clenched jaw and hand, 
he passed Atiful and stood unharmed in the light. As he saw his trim ship lying peacefully at anchor, and almost within ordinary call, as he saw his household boat, with familiar faces in it, patiently rising and falling on the short waves by the San Dominic side, and then, glancing about the decks where he stood, saw the oakum pickers still gravely plying their fingers, and heard the low, buzzing whistle and industrious hum of the hatchet polishers, still bestirring themselves over their endless occupation, and more than all, as he saw the benign aspect of nature taking her innocent repose in the evening, the screened sun in the quiet camp of the west shining out like the mild light from Abraham's tent, as charmed eye and ear took in all these, with the chained figure of the black, clenched jaw and hand relaxed. Once again he smiled at the phantoms which had mocked him, and felt something like a tinge of remorse, that by harboring them even for a moment he should by implication have betrayed an atheist doubt of the ever-watchful providence above. There was a few minutes' delay while, in obedience to his orders, the boat was being hooked along to the gangway. During this interval a sort of saddened satisfaction stole over Captain Delano, at thinking of the kindly offices he had that day discharged for a stranger. Ah, thought he, after good actions one's conscience is never ungrateful, however much so the benefited party may be. Presently his foot, in the first act of descent into the boat, pressed the first round of the side ladder, his face presented inward upon the deck. In the same moment he heard his name courteously sounded, and to his pleased surprise saw Don Benito advancing, an unwanted energy in his air, as if, at the last moment, intent upon making amends for his recent discourtesy. With instinctive good feeling, Captain Delano, withdrawing his foot, turned and reciprocally advanced. As he did so, the Spaniard's nervous eagerness increased, but his vital energy failed, so that, the better to support him, the servant, placing his master's hand on his naked shoulder and gently holding it there, formed himself into a sort of crutch. When the two captains met, the Spaniard again fervently took the hand of the American, at the same time casting an earnest glance into his eyes, but, as before, too much overcome to speak. I have done him wrong, self-reproachfully thought Captain Delano. His apparent coldness has deceived me. In no instance has he meant to offend. Meantime, as if fearful that the continuance of the scene might too much unstring his master, the servant seemed anxious to terminate it, and so, still presenting himself as a crutch and walking between the two captains, he advanced with them towards the gangway, while still, as if full of kindly contrition, Don Benito would not let go the hand of Captain Delano, but retained it in his across the black's body. Soon they were standing by the side, looking over into the boat, whose crew turned up their curious eyes. Waiting a moment for the Spaniard to relinquish his hold, the now embarrassed Captain Delano lifted his foot to overstep the threshold of the open gangway. But still Don Benito would not let go his hand. And yet, with an agitated tone, he said, I can go no further. Here I must bid you adieu. Adieu, my dear, dear Don Amasa. Go, go. Suddenly tearing his hand loose, go and God guard you better than me, my best friend. Not unaffected, Captain Delano would now have lingered, but catching the meekly admonitory eye of the servant with a hasty farewell, he descended into his boat, followed by the continual adieus of Don Benito, standing rooted in the gangway. Seating himself in the stern, Captain Delano, making a last salute, ordered the boat shoved off. The crew had their oars on end. The bowsmen pushed the boat a sufficient distance for the oars to be lengthwise dropped. The instant that was done, Don Benito sprang over the bulwarks, falling at the feet of Captain Delano, at the same time calling towards his ship, but in tones so frenzied that none in the boat could understand him but as if not equally obtuse, three sailors, from different and distant parts of the ship, 
splashed into the sea swimming after their captain as if intent upon his rescue the dismayed officer of the boat eagerly asked what this meant to which captain delano turning a disdainful smile upon the unaccountable spaniard answered that for his part he neither knew nor cared but it seemed as if don benito had taken it into his head to produce the impression among his people that the boat wanted to kidnap him or else give way for your lives he wildly added starting at a clattering hubbub in the ship above which rang the tocsin of the hatchet polishers and seizing don benito by the throat he added this plotting pirate means murder here in apparent verification of the words the servant a dagger in his hand was seen on the rail overhead poised in the act of leaping as if with desperate fidelity to befriend his master to the last while seemingly to aid the black the three white sailors were trying to clamber into the hampered bow meantime the whole host of negroes as if inflamed at the sight of their jeopardized captain impended in one sooty avalanche over the bulwarks all this with what preceded and what followed occurred with such involutions of rapidity that past present and future seemed one seeing the negro coming captain delano had flung the spaniard aside almost in the very act of clutching him and by the unconscious recoil shifting his place with arms thrown up so promptly grappled the servant in his descent that with dagger presented at captain delano's heart the black seemed of purpose to have leapt there as to his mark but the weapon was wrenched away and the assailant dashed down into the bottom of the boat which now with disentangled oars began to speed through the sea at this juncture the left hand of captain delano on one side again clutched the half-reclined don benito heedless that he was in a speechless faint while his right foot on the other side ground the prostrate negro and his right arm pressed for added speed on the after oar his eye bent forward encouraging his men to their utmost but here the officer of the boat who had at last succeeded in beating off the towing sailors and was now with face turned aft assisting the bowsman at his oar suddenly called to captain delano to see what the black was about while a portuguese oarsman shouted to him to give heed to what the spaniard was saying glancing down at his feet captain delano saw the freed hand of the servant aiming with a second dagger a small one before concealing it in his wool with this he was snakishly writhing up from the boat's bottom at the heart of his master his countenance lividly vindictive expressing the centered purpose of his soul while the spaniard half choked was vainly shrinking away with husky words incoherent to all but the portuguese that moment across the long benighted mind of captain delano a flash of revelation swept illuminating in an unanticipated clearness his host's whole mysterious demeanor with every enigmatic event of the day as well as the entire past voyage of the san dominic he smote babo's hand down but his own heart smote him harder with infinite pity he withdrew his hold from don benito not captain delano but don benito the black in leaping into the boat had intended to stab both the black's hands were held as glancing up towards the san dominic captain delano now with scales dropped from his eyes saw the negroes not in misrule not in tumult not as if frantically concerned for don benito but with mask torn away flourishing hatchets and knives in ferocious piratical revolt like delirious black dervishes the six ashantis danced on the poop prevented by their foes from springing into the water the spanish boys were hurrying up to the topmost spars while such of the few spanish sailors not already in the sea less alert were descried helplessly mixed in on deck with the blacks meantime captain delano hailed his own vessel ordering the ports up and the guns run out but by this time the cable of the san dominic had been cut and the fag end in lashing out whipped away the canvas shroud about the beak suddenly revealing as the bleached hull swung round towards the open ocean death for the figurehead in a human skeleton 
chalky comment on the chalked words below, follow your leader. At the sight, Don Benito, covering his face, wailed out, "'Tis he, Aranda, my murdered, unburied friend!" Upon reaching the sealer, calling for ropes, Captain Delano bound the negro, who made no resistance, and had him hoisted to the deck. He would then have assisted the now almost helpless Don Benito up the side, but Don Benito, wan as he was, refused to move or be moved until the negro should have been first put below out of view. When presently assured that it was done, he no more shrank from the ascent. The boat was immediately dispatched back to pick up the three swimming sailors. Meantime the guns were in readiness, though, owing to the San Dominic having glided somewhat astern of the sealer, only the aftermost one could be brought to bear. With this they fired six times, thinking to cripple the fugitive ship by bringing down her spars, but only a few inconsiderable ropes were shot away. Soon the ship was beyond the gun's range, steering broad out of the bay. The blacks thickly clustered round the bowsprit, one moment with taunting cries towards the whites, the next with upthrown gestures, hailing the now dusky moors of the ocean, cawing crows escaped from the hand of the fowler. The first impulse was to slip the cables and give chase, but upon second thoughts to pursue with whale-boat and yawl seemed more promising. Upon inquiring of Don Benito what firearms they had on board the San Dominic, Captain Delano was answered that they had none that could be used because in the earlier stages of the mutiny a cabin passenger, since dead, had secretly put out of order the locks of what few muskets there were. But with all his remaining strength Don Benito entreated the American not to give chase, either with ship or boat, for the negroes had already proved themselves such desperadoes that in case of a present assault nothing but a total massacre of the whites could be looked for. But regarding this warning as coming from one whose spirit had been crushed by misery, the American did not give up his design. The boats were got ready and armed. Captain Delano ordered his men into them. He was going himself when Don Benito grasped his arm. "'What? Have you saved my life, senor, and are you now going to throw away your own?' The officers also, for reasons connected with their interests and those of the voyage, and a duty owing to the owners, strongly objected against their commander's going. Weighing their remonstrances a moment, Captain Delano felt bound to remain. Appointing his chief mate, an athletic and resolute man who had been a privateer's man, to head the party. The more to encourage the sailors, they were told, that the Spanish captain considered his ship good as lost, that she and her cargo, including some gold and silver, were worth more than a thousand doubloons. Take her, and no small part should be theirs. The sailors replied with a shout. The fugitives had now almost gained an offing. It was nearly night, but the moon was rising. After hard, prolonged pulling, the boats came up on the ship's quarters, at a suitable distance laying upon their oars to discharge their muskets. Having no bullets to return, the negroes sent their yells. But upon the second volley, Indian-like, they hurtled their hatchets. One took off a sailor's fingers. Another struck the whaleboat's bow, cutting off the rope there, and remaining stuck in the gunwale, like a woodman's axe. Snatching it, quivering from its lodgment, the mate hurled it back. The return gauntlet now struck the ship's broken quarter gallery, and so remained. The negroes giving too hot a reception, the whites kept a more respectful distance. Hovering now just out of reach of the hurtling hatchets, they, with a view to the close encounter which must soon come, sought to decoy the blacks into entirely disarming themselves of their most murderous weapons in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, by foolishly flinging them as missiles, short of the mark, into the sea. But ere long, perceiving the stratagem, the negroes desisted, though not before many of them had to replace their lost hatchets with handspikes, an exchange which, as counted upon, proved in the end favorable to the assailants. Meantime, 
with a strong wind, the ship still clove the water, the boats alternately falling behind and pulling up to discharge fresh volleys. The fire was mostly directed towards the stern, since there, chiefly, the negroes at present were clustering. But to kill or maim the negroes was not the object. To take them with the ship was the object. To do it, the ship must be boarded, which could not be done by boats while she was sailing so fast. A thought now struck the mate. Observing the Spanish boys still aloft, high as they could get, he called to them to descend to the yards and cut adrift the sails. It was done. About this time, owing to causes hereafter to be shown, two Spaniards, in the dress of sailors, and conspicuously showing themselves, were killed, not by volleys, but by deliberate marksmen's shots, while, as it afterwards appeared, by one of the general discharges, Atiful the black, and the Spaniard at the helm likewise were killed. What now, with the loss of the sails and loss of leaders, the ship became unmanageable to the negroes. With creaking masts she came heavily round to the wind, the prow slowly swinging into view of the boats, its skeleton gleaming in the horizontal moonlight and casting a gigantic ribbed shadow upon the water. One extended arm of the ghost seemed beckoning the whites to avenge it. "'Follow your leader!' cried the mate, and one on each bow the boats boarded. Sealing spears and cutlasses crossed hatchets and handspikes. Huddled upon the longboat amidships, the negresses raised a wailing chant whose chorus was the clash of the steel. For a time the attack wavered, the negroes wedging themselves to beat it back, the half-repelled sailors, as yet unable to gain a footing, fighting as troopers in the saddle, one leg sideways flung over the bulwarks, and one without plying their cutlasses like carter's whips but in vain. They were almost overborne when, rallying themselves into a squad as one man with a huzzah, they sprang inboard, where, entangled, they involuntarily separated again. For a few breaths' space there was a vague, muffled inner sound, as of submerged swordfish rushing hither and thither through shoals of blackfish. Soon, in a reunited band, and joined by the Spanish seamen, the whites came to the surface, irresistibly driving the negroes toward the stern. But a barricade of casks and sacks from side to side had been thrown up by the main mast. Here the negroes faced about, and though scorning peace or truce, yet fain would have had respite. But without pause, overleaping the barrier, the unflagging sailors again closed. Exhausted, the blacks now fought in despair. Their red tongues lolled, wolf-like, from their black mouths but the pale sailor's teeth were set, not a word was spoken, and in five minutes more the ship was won. Nearly a score of the negroes were killed. Exclusive of those by the balls, many were mangled. Their wounds, mostly inflicted by the long-edged sealing spears, resembling those shaven ones of the English at Preston Pans, made by the pulled scythes of the Highlanders. On the other side, none were killed, though several were wounded, some severely, including the mate. The surviving negroes were temporarily secured, and the ship, towed back into the harbor at midnight, once more lay anchored. Omitting the incidents and arrangements ensuing, Syphit, that, after two days spent in refitting, the ships sailed in company for Concepcion, in Chile, and thence for Lima, in Peru where, before the vice-regal courts, the whole affair from the beginning underwent investigation. Though midway on the passage, the ill-fated Spaniard, relaxed from constraint, showed some signs of regaining health with free will, yet, agreeably to his own foreboding, shortly before arriving at Lima he relapsed, finally becoming so reduced as to be carried ashore in arms. Hearing of his story and plight, one of the many religious institutions of the City of Kings opened an hospitable refuge to him, where both physician and priest were his nurses, and a member of the order volunteered to be his one special guardian and consular by night and by day. The following extracts, translated from one of the official Spanish documents, will, it is hoped, 
shed light on the preceding narrative, as well as, in the first place, reveal the true port of departure and true history of the San Dominic's voyage, down to the time of her touching at the island of Santa Maria. But ere the extracts come, it may be well to preface them with a remark. The document selected, from among many others, for partial translation, contains the deposition of Benito Sereno, the first taken in the case. Some disclosures therein were, at the time, held dubious for both learned and natural reasons. The tribunal inclined to the opinion that the deponent, not undisturbed in his mind by recent events, raved of some things which could never have happened. But subsequent depositions of the surviving sailors, bearing out the revelations of their captain in several of the strangest particulars, gave credence to the rest, so that the tribunal, in its final decision, rested its capital sentences upon statements which, had they lacked confirmation, it would have deemed it but duty to reject. End of section 6, chapter 3c, Benedito Sereno, part 3. Section 7 of the Piazza Tales. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3d, Benito Sereno, part 4. I, Don José de Abos and Padilla his majesty's notary for the royal revenue and register of this province and notary public of the holy crusade of this bishopric etc do certify and declare as much as is requisite in law that in the criminal cause commenced the twenty-fourth of the month of september in the year seventeen hundred and ninety-nine against the negroes of the ship san dominique the following declaration before me was made declaration of the first witness don benito sereno the same day and month and year his honor dr juan martinez de rosas counsellor of the royal audience of this kingdom and learned in the law of this intendancy ordered the captain of the ship san dominique don benito sereno to appear which he did in his litter attended by the monk infeles of whom he received the oath which he took by god our lord and a sign of the cross under which he promised to tell the truth of whatever he should know and should be asked, and, being interrogated agreeably to the tenor of the act commencing the process, he said that, on the 20th of May last, he set sail with his ship from the port of Valparaiso, bound to that of Calao, loaded with the produce of the country beside thirty cases of hardware and one hundred and sixty blacks of both sexes, mostly belonging to Don Alejandro Aranda, gentlemen of the city of mendoza that the crew of the ship consisted of thirty-six men beside the persons who went as passengers that the negroes were in part as follows here in the original follows a list of some fifty names descriptions and ages compiled from certain recovered documents of arandas and also from recollections of the deponent from which portions only are extracted one from about eighteen to nineteen years named jose and this was the man that waited upon his master don alejandro and who speaks well the spanish having served him four or five years a mulatto named francesco the cabin steward of a good person and voice having sung in the valparaiso churches native of the province of buenos aires aged about thirty-five years a smart negro named dago who had been for many years a gravedigger among the spaniards aged forty-six years four old negroes born in africa from sixty to seventy but sound caulkers by trade whose names are as follows the first was named muri and he was killed as was also his son named diamelo the second nakta the third yola likewise killed the fourth Gofan and six full-grown negroes aged from thirty to forty-five all raw and born among the ashantis matiluki jan leche mapenda yambayo akim four of whom were killed a powerful negro named ataful who being supposed to have been a chief in africa his owners set great store by him 
and a small negro of senegal but some years among the spaniards aged about thirty which negro's name was babo that he does not remember the names of the others but that still expecting the residue of don alejandra's papers will be found will then take due account of them all and remit to the court and thirty-nine women and children of all ages the catalogue over the deposition goes on that all the negroes slept upon the deck as is customary in this navigation and none wore fetters because the owner his friend aranda told him that they were all tractable that on the seventh day after leaving port at three o'clock in the morning all the spaniards being asleep except the two officers on the watch who were the boatswain juan robles and the carpenter juan bautista gallete and the helmsman and his boy the negroes revolted suddenly wounded dangerously the boatswain and the carpenter and successively killed eighteen men of those who were sleeping upon the deck some with handspikes and hatchets and others by throwing them alive overboard after tying them that of the spaniards upon the deck they left about seven as he thinks alive and tied to maneuver the ship and three or four more who hid themselves remained also alive although in the act of revolt the negroes made themselves masters of the hatchway six or seven wounded went through it to the cockpit without any hindrance on their part that during the act of revolt the mate and another person whose name he does not recollect attempted to come up through the hatchway but being quickly wounded were obliged to return to the cabin that the deponent resolved at break of day to come up the companionway where the negro babo was being the ringleader and ataful who assisted him and having spoken to them exhorted them to cease committing such atrocities asking them at the same time what they wanted and intended to do offering himself to obey their commands that notwithstanding this they threw in his presence three men alive and tied overboard that they told the deponent to come up and that they would not kill him which having done the negro babo asked him whether there were in those seas any negro countries where they might be carried and he answered them no that the negro babo afterwards told him to carry them to senegal or to the neighboring islands of st nicholas and he answered that this was impossible on account of the great distance the necessity involved of rounding cape horn the bad condition of the vessel the want of provisions sails and water and that the negro babo replied to him he must carry them in any way that they would do and conform themselves to everything the deponent should require as to eating and drinking that after a long conference being absolutely compelled to please them for they threatened to kill all the whites if they were not at all events carried to senegal he told them that what was most wanting for the voyage was water that they would go near the coast to take it and thence they would proceed on their course that the negro babo agreed to it and the deponent steered towards the intermediate ports hoping to meet some spanish or foreign vessel that would save them that within ten or eleven days they saw the land and continued their course by it in the vicinity of nazca that the deponent observed that the negroes were now restless and mutinous because he did not affect the taking in of water the negro babo having required with threats that it should be done without fail the following day he told him he saw plainly that the coast was steep and the rivers designated in the maps were not to be found with other reasons suitable to the circumstances that the best way would be to go to the island of santa maria where they might water easily it being a solitary island as the foreigners did that the deponent did not go to pisco that was near nor make any other port of the coast because the negro babo had intimated to him several times that he would kill all the whites the very moment he should perceive any city town or settlement of any kind on the shores to which they should be carried that having determined to go to the island of santa maria as the deponent had planned for the purpose of trying whether on the passage or near the island itself they could find any vessel that should favor them or whether he could escape from it in a boat to the neighboring coast of Arroco, 
To adopt the necessary means, he immediately changed his course, steering for the island. That the Negro, Babo, and Atafal held daily conferences in which they discussed what was necessary for the design of returning to Senegal, whether they were to kill all the Spaniards, and particularly the deponent. That eight days after parting from the coast of Nazca, the deponent, being on the watch a little after daybreak, and soon after the Negroes had their meeting, the Negro Babo came to the place where the deponent was, and told him that he had determined to kill his master, Don Alejandro Aranda, both because he and his companions could not otherwise be sure of their liberty, and that to keep the seamen in subjection he wanted to prepare a warning of what road they should be made to take, did they or any of them oppose him, and that, by means of the death of Don Alejandro, that warning would best be given, but that what this last meant the deponent did not at the time comprehend, nor could not, further than that the death of Don Alejandro was intended, and, moreover, the negro babo proposed to the deponent to call the mate Raneds, who was sleeping in the cabin, before the thing was done, for fear, as the deponent understood it, that the mate, who was a good navigator, should be killed with Don Alejandro and the rest that the deponent, who was the friend from youth of Don Alejandro, prayed and conjured, but all was useless, for the negro babo answered him that the thing could not be prevented, and that all the Spaniards risked their death if they should attempt to frustrate his will in this matter, or any other, that in this conflict the deponent called the mate, Raneds, who was forced to go apart, and immediately the negro babo commanded the Ashanti Martinki and the Ashanti Lekbe to go and commit the murder, that those two went down with hatchets to the birth of Don Alejandro, that yet half alive and mangled they dragged him on deck, that they were going to throw him overboard in that state, but the negro babo stopped them, bidding the murder be completed on the deck before him, which was done when by his orders the body was carried below, forward that nothing more was seen of it by the deponent for three days, that Don Alonso Sidonia, an old man, long resident at Valparaiso, and lately appointed to a civil office in Peru, whither he had taken passage, was at the time sleeping in the berth opposite Don Alejandro's, that awakening at his cries, surprised by them, and at the sight of the negroes with their bloody hatchets in their hands, he threw himself into the sea through a window which was near him, and was drowned, without it being in the power of the deponent to assist or take him up. That a short time after killing Aranda, they brought upon the deck his German cousin of middle age, Don Francisco Massa of Mendoza, and the young Don Joaquin, Marques de Aramboaza, then lately from Spain, with his Spanish servant Ponce, and the three young clerks of Aranda, José Muzairi, Lorenzo Barrias, and Hermenegildo Gandix, all of Cadiz, that Don Joaquin and Hermenelingo Gandix, the negro babo, for purposes hereafter to appear, preserved alive, but Don Francisco Massa, José Mazairi, and Lorenzo Vargas, with Ponce, the servant, beside the boatswain, Juan Robles, the boatswain's mates, Manuel Vizcaya and Rodrigo Hurta, and for the sailors, the negro babo ordered to be thrown alive into the sea, although they made no resistance, nor begged for anything else but mercy, that the boatswain, Juan Robles, who knew how to swim, kept the longest above water, making acts of contrition, and, in the last words he uttered, charged this deponent to cause mass to be said for his soul to Our Lady of Succor. That during the three days which followed, the deponent, uncertain what fate had befallen the remains of Don Alejandro, frequently asked the negro babo where they were, and if still on board, whether they were to be preserved for internment ashore, entreating him so to order it, that the negro babo answered nothing till the fourth day, when at sunrise the deponent coming on deck, the negro babo showed him a skeleton, which had been substituted for the ship's proper figurehead the image of Christopher Colon, the discoverer of the new world, that the negro babo asked him whose skeleton that was, and whether, from its whiteness, 
he should not think it a white's that upon discovering his face the negro babo coming close said words to this effect keep faith with the blacks from here to senegal or you shall in spirit as now in body follow your leader pointing to the prow that the same morning the negro babo took by succession each spaniard forward and asked him whose skeleton that was and whether from its whiteness he should not think it a white's that each spaniard covered his face that then to each the negro babo repeated the words in the first place said to the deponent that they the spaniards being then assembled aft the negro babo harangued them saying that he had now done all that the deponent as navigator for the negroes might pursue his course warning him and all of them that they should soul and body go the way of don alejandro if he saw them the spaniards speak or plot anything against them the negroes a threat which was repeated every day that before the events last mentioned they had tied the cook to throw him overboard for it is not known what thing they heard him speak but finally the negro babo spared his life at the request of the deponent that a few days after the deponent endeavoring not to omit any means to preserve the lives of the remaining whites spoke to the negroes peace and tranquillity and agreed to draw up a paper signed by the deponent and the sailors who could write as also by the negro babo for himself and all the blacks in which the deponent obliged himself to carry them to senegal and they not to kill any more and he formally to make over to them the ship with the cargo with which they were for that time satisfied and quieted but the next day the more surely to guard against the sailors escape the negro babo commanded all the boats to be destroyed but the longboat which was unseaworthy and another a cutter in good condition which knowing it would yet be wanted for towing the water casks he had it lowered down into the hold various particulars of the prolonged and perplexed navigation ensuing here follow with incidents of the calamitous calm from which portions one passage is extracted to wit that on the fifth day of the calm all on board suffering much from the heat and want of water and five having died in fits and mad the negroes became irritable and for a chance gesture which they deemed suspicious though it was harmless made by the mate raneds to the deponent in the act of handing him a quadrant they killed him but that for this they afterwards were sorry the mate being the only remaining navigator on board except the deponent that omitting other events which daily happened and which can only serve uselessly to recall past misfortunes and conflicts after seventy-three days of navigation reckoned from the time they sailed from nazca during which they navigated under a scanty allowance of water and were afflicted with the calms before mentioned they at last arrived at the island of santa maria on the seventeenth of the month of august at about six o'clock in the afternoon at which hour they cast anchor very near the american ship bachelor's delight which lay in the same bay commanded by the generous captain amasa delano but at six o'clock in the morning they had already descried the port and the negroes became uneasy as soon as at distance they saw the ship not having expected to see one there that the negro babo pacified them assuring them that no fear need be had that straightway he ordered the figure on the bow to be covered with canvas as for repairs and had the decks a little set in order that for a time the negro babo and the negro atiful conferred that the negro atiful was for sailing away but the negro babo would not and by himself cast about what to do that at last he came to the deponent proposing to him to say and do all that the deponent declares to have said and done to the american captain that the negro babo warned him that if he varied in the least or uttered any word or gave any look that should give the least intimation of the past events or present state he would instantly kill him with all his companions 
showing a dagger which he carried hid, saying something which, as he understood it, meant that that dagger would be alert as his eye. That the negro babo then announced the plan to all his companions, which pleased them. That he then, the better to disguise the truth, devised many expedients, in some of them uniting deceit and defense that of this sort was the device of the six Ashantis before named, who were his bravos, that them he stationed on the break of the poop, as if to clean certain hatchets, in cases, which were part of the cargo, but in reality to use them and distribute them at need, and at a given word he told them, that among other devices was the device of presenting Ataful, his right-hand man, as chained, though in a moment the chains could be dropped, that in every particular he informed the deponent what part he was expected to enact in every device, and what story he was to tell on every occasion, always threatening him with instant death if he varied in the least, that, conscious that many of the negroes would be turbulent, the negro babo appointed the four aged negroes, who were caulkers, to keep what domestic order they could on the decks, that again and again he harangued the Spaniards and his companions, informing them of his intent and of his devices, and of the invented story that this deponent was to tell, charging them lest any of them varied from that story, that these arrangements were made and matured during the interval of two or three hours between their first sighting the ship and the arrival on board of Captain Amasa Delano, that this happened about half-past seven o'clock in the morning, Captain Amasa Delano coming in his boat, and all gladly receiving him, that the deponent, as well as he could force himself, acting then the part of principal owner, and a free captain of the ship, told Captain Amasa Delano, when called upon, that he came from Buenos Aires, bound to Lima, with three hundred negroes, that off Cape Horn, and in subsequent fever, many negroes had died, that also, by similar casualties, all the sea officers and the greatest part of the crew had died. And so the deposition goes on, circumstantially recounting the fictitious story dictated to the deponent by Babo, and through the deponent imposed upon Captain Delano, and also recounting the friendly officers of Captain Delano with other things, but all of which is here omitted. After the fictitious story, etc., the deposition proceeds. That the generous Captain Amasa Delano remained on board all the day till he left the ship anchored at six o'clock in the evening, deponent speaking to him always of his pretended misfortunes under the forementioned principles without having had it in his power to tell a single word or give him the least hint that he might know the truth and state of things, because the negro babo, performing the office of officious servant with all the appearance of submission of the humble slave, did not leave the deponent one moment, that this was in order to observe the deponent's actions and words, for the negro babo understands well the Spanish, and besides, there were thereabout some others who were constantly on the watch, and likewise understood the Spanish. That upon one occasion, while deponent was standing on the deck conversing with Amasa Delano, by a secret sign the negro babo drew him, the deponent, aside, the act appearing as if originating with the deponent, that then, he being drawn aside, the negro babo proposed to him to gain from Amasa Delano full particulars about his ship and crew and arms, that the deponent asked for what, that the negro babo answered he might conceive, that, grieved at the prospect of what might overtake the generous Captain Amasa Delano, the deponent at first refused to ask the desired questions, and used every argument to induce the negro babo to give up this new design, that the negro babo showed the point of his dagger, that after the information had been obtained the negro babo again drew him aside, telling him that that very night he, the deponent, would be captain of two ships, instead of one, for that great part of the American ship's crew being to be absent fishing, the six Ashantis, without any one else, would easily take it, that at this time he said other things to the same purpose, 
that no entreaties availed that before amasa's delano's coming on board no hint had been given touching the capture of the american ship that to prevent this project the deponent was powerless that in some things his memory is confused he cannot distinctly recall every event that as soon as they had cast anchor at six of the clock in the evening as has before been stated the american captain took leave to return to his vessel that upon a sudden impulse which the deponent believes to have come from god and his angels he after the farewell had been said followed the generous captain amasa delano as far as the gunwale where he stayed under pretense of taking leave until amasa delano should have been seated in his boat that on shoving off the deponent sprang from the gunwale into the boat and fell into it he knows not how god guarding him that here in the original follows the account of what further happened at the escape and how the san dominic was retaken and of the passage to the coast including in the recital many expressions of eternal gratitude to the generous captain amasa delano the deposition then proceeds with recapulatory remarks and a partial remuneration of the negroes making record of their individual part in the past events with a view to furnishing according to command of the court the data whereon to found the criminal sentences to be pronounced from this portion is the following that he believes that all the negroes though not in the first place knowing to the design of revolt when it was accomplished approved it that the negro jose eighteen years old and in the personal service of don alejandro was the one who communicated the information to the negro babo about the state of things in the cabin before the revolt that this is known because in the preceding midnight he used to come from his berth which was under his master's in the cabin to the deck where the ringleader and his associates were and had secret conversations with the negro babo in which he was several times seen by the mate that one night the mate drove him away twice that this same negro jose was the one who without being commanded to do so by the negro babo as lecbe and martinki were stabbed his master don alejandro after he had been dragged half lifeless to the deck that the mulatto steward francesco was of the first band of revolters that he was in all things the creature and tool of the negro babo that to make his court he just before a repast in the cabin proposed to the negro babo poisoning a dish for the generous captain amasa delano this is known and believed because the negroes have said it but that the negro babo having another design forbade francesco that the ashanti lecbe was one of the worst of them for that on the day the ship was retaken he assisted in the defense of her with a hatchet in each hand with one of which he wounded in the breast the chief mate of amasa delano in the first act of boarding this all knew that in sight of the deponent lecbe struck with a hatchet don francisco massa when by the negro babo's orders he was carrying him to throw him overboard alive beside participating in the murder before mentioned of don alejandro aranda and others of the cabin passengers that owing to the fury with which the ashantis fought in the engagement with the boats but this lecbe and jan survived that jan was bad as lecbe that jan was the man who by babo's command willingly prepared the skeleton of don alejandro in a way the negroes afterwards told the deponent but which he so long as reason is left him can never divulge that jan and lecbe were the two who in a calm by night riveted the skeleton to the bow this also the negroes told him that the negro babo was he who traced the inscription below it that the negro babo was the plotter from first to last he ordered every murder, and was the helm and keel of the revolt. That Atafal was his lieutenant in all. But Atafal, with his own hand, committed no murder, nor did the negro babo. That Atafal was shot, being killed in the fight with the boats, ere boarding. That the negresses of age were knowing to the revolt, 
and testified themselves satisfied at the death of their master don alejandro that had the negroes not restrained them they would have tortured to death instead of simply killing the spaniards slain by command of the negro babo that the negresses used their utmost influence to have the deponent made away with that in the various acts of murder they sang songs and danced not gaily but solemnly and before the engagement with the boats as well as during the action they sang melancholy songs to the negroes and that this melancholy tone was more inflaming than a different one would have been and was so intended that all this is believed because the negroes have said it that of the thirty-six men of the crew exclusive of the passengers all of whom are now dead which the deponent had knowledge of six only remained alive with four cabin boys and ship boys not included with the crew that the negroes broke an arm of one of the cabin boys and gave him strokes with hatchets then follows various random disclosures referring to various periods of time the following are extracted that during the presence of captain amasa delano on board some attempts were made by the sailors and one by hermenegildo gandix to convey hints to him of the true state of affairs but that these attempts were ineffectual owing to fear of incurring death and furthermore owing to the devices which offered contradictions to the true state of affairs as well as owing to the generosity and piety of amasa delano incapable of sounding such wickedness that luis galgo a sailor about sixty years of age and formerly of the king's navy was one of those who sought to convey tokens to captain amasa delano but his intent though undiscovered being suspected he was on a pretense made to retire out of sight and at last into the hold and there was made away with this the negroes have since said that one of the ship boys feeling from captain amasa delano's presence some hopes of release and not having enough prudence dropped some chance word respecting his expectations which being overheard and understood by a slave boy with whom he was eating at the time the latter struck him on the head with a knife inflicting a bad wound but of which the boy is now healing that likewise not long before the ship was brought to anchor one of the seamen steering at the time endangered himself by letting the blacks remark some expression in his countenance arising from a cause similar to the above but this sailor by his heedful after conduct escaped that these statements are made to show the court that from the beginning to the end of the revolt it was impossible for the deponent and his men to act otherwise than they did that the third clerk hermenegildo gandix who before had been forced to live among the seamen wearing a seaman's habit and in all respects appearing to be one for the time he gandix was killed by a musket ball fired through mistake from the boats before boarding having in his fright run up the mizzen rigging calling to the boats don't board lest upon their boarding the negro should kill him that this inducing the americans to believe he some way favored the cause of the negroes they fired two balls at him so that he fell wounded from the rigging and was drowned in the sea that the young don joaquin marques de aramboelasa like hermenegildo gandix the third clerk was degraded to the office and appearance of a common seaman that upon one occasion when don joaquin shrank the negro babo commanded the ashanti lecbe to take tar and heat him and pour it upon don joaquin's hands that don joaquin was killed owing to another mistake of the americans but one impossible to be avoided as upon the approach of the boats don joaquin with a hatchet tied edge out and upright to his hand was made by the negroes to appear on the bulwarks whereupon seen with arms in his hands and in a questionable attitude he was shot for a renegade seaman that on the person of don joaquin was found secreted a jewel which by papers that were discovered proved to have been meant for the shrine of our lady of mercy in lima a votive offering beforehand prepared and guarded to attest his gratitude when he should have landed in peru his last destination for the safe conclusion of his entire voyage from spain 
that the jewel with the other effects of the late don joaquin is in the custody of the brethren of the hospital de sacerdotes awaiting the disposition of the honorable court that owing to the condition of the deponent as well as the haste in which the boats departed for the attack the americans were not forewarned that there were among the apparent crew a passenger and one of the clerks disguised by the negro babo that beside the negroes killed in the action some were killed after the capture and re-anchoring at night when shackled to the ring bolts on deck that these deaths were committed by the sailors ere they could be prevented that so soon as informed of it captain amasa delano used all his authority and in particular with his own hand struck down martinez gola who having found a razor in the pocket of an old jacket of his which one of the shackled negroes had on was aiming it into the negro's throat that the noble captain amasa delano also wrenched from the hand of bartholomew barlow a dagger secreted at the time of the massacre of the whites with which he was in the act of stabbing a shackled negro who the same day with another negro had thrown him down and jumped upon him that for all the events befalling through so long a time during which the ship was in the hands of the negro babo he cannot here give account but that what he has said is the most substantial of what occurs to him at present and is the truth under the oath which he has taken which declaration he affirmed and ratified after hearing it read to him he said that he is twenty-nine years of age and broken in body and mind that when finally dismissed by the court he shall not return home to chile but betake himself to the monastery on mount agonia without and signed with his honor and crossed himself and for the time departed as he came in his litter with a monk in Filez, to the hospital of sacerdotes benito sereno dr rosas if the deposition have served as the key to fit into the lock of the complications which precede it then as a vault whose door has been flung back the san dominic hall lies open to-day hitherto the nature of this narrative besides rendering the intricacies in the beginning unavoidable has more or less required that many things instead of being set down in the order of occurrence should be retrospectively or irregularly given this last is the case with the following passages which will conclude the account during the long mild voyage to lima there was as before hinted a period during which the sufferer a little recovered his health or at least in some degree his tranquillity ere the decided relapse which came the two captains had many cordial conversations their fraternal unreserve in singular contrast with former withdrawments again and again it was repeated how hard it had been to enact the part forced on the spaniard by babo ah my dear friend don benito once said at those very times when you thought me so morose and ungrateful nay when as you now admit you half thought me plotting your murder at those very times my heart was frozen i could not look at you thinking of what both on board this ship and your own hung from other hands over my kind benefactor and as god lives dona massa i know not whether desire for my own safety alone could have nerved me to that leap into your boat had it not been for the thought that did you unenlightened return to your ship you my best friend with all who might be with you stolen upon that night in your hammocks would never in this world have wakened again do but think how you walked this deck how you sat in this cabin every inch of ground mined into honeycombs under you had i dropped the least hint made the least advance towards an understanding between us death explosive death yours as mine would have ended the scene true true cried captain delano starting you have saved my life don benito more than i yours saved it too against my knowledge and will nay my friend 
rejoined the Spaniard, courteous even to the point of religion. God charmed your life, but you saved mine. To think of some things you did, those smilings and chattings, rash pointings and gesturings. For less than these they slew my mate Ranids, but you had the Prince of Heaven's safe conduct through all ambuscades. Yes, all is owing to Providence, I know, but the temper of my mind that morning was more than commonly pleasant, while the sight of so much suffering more apparent than real added to my good nature, compassion, and charity, happily interweaving the three. Had it been otherwise, doubtless, as you hint, some of my interferences might have ended unhappily enough. Besides, those feelings I spoke of enabled me to get the better of momentary distrust at times when acuteness might have cost me my life without saving another's. Only at the end did my suspicions get the better of me, and you know how wide of the mark they then proved. Wide indeed, said Don Benito sadly. You were with me all day, stood with me, sat with me, talked with me, looked at me, ate with me, drank with me, and yet your last act was to clutch for a monster, not only an innocent man, but the most pitiable of all men. To such degree may malign machinations and deceptions impose. So far may even the best man err in judging the conduct of one with the recesses of whose condition he is not acquainted, but you were forced to it, and you were in time undeceived. Would that in both respects it was so ever, and with all men. You generalized, Don Benito, and mournfully enough, but the past is past. Why moralize upon it? Forget it. See, yon bright sun has forgotten it all, and the blue sea and the blue sky, these have turned over new leaves. Because they have no memory he dejectedly replied, because they are not human. But these mild trades that now fan your cheek, do they not come with a human-like healing to you? Warm friends, steadfast friends, are the trades. With their steadfastness they but waft me to my tomb, senor, was the foreboding response. You are saved, cried Captain Delano more and more astonished and pained. You are saved. What has cast such a shadow upon you? The Negro. There was silence, while the moody man sat, slowly and unconsciously gathering his mantle about him, as if it were a pall. There was no more conversation that day. But if the Spaniard's melancholy sometimes ended in muteness upon topics like the above, there were others upon which he never spoke at all, on which, indeed, all his old reserves were piled, pass over the worst, and only to elucidate let an item or two of these be cited. The dress, so precise and costly, worn by him on the day whose events have been narrated, had not willingly been put on, and that silver-mounted sword, apparent symbol of despotic command, was not indeed a sword, but a ghost of one. The scabbard, artificially stiffened, was empty. As for the black whose brain, not body, had schemed and led the revolt with the plot, his slight frame, inadequate to that which it held, had at once yielded to the superior muscular strength of his captor in the boat. Seeing all was over, he uttered no sound, and could not be forced to. His aspect seemed to say, since I cannot do deeds, I will not speak words. But in irons, in the hold, with the rest, he was carried to Lima. During the passage Don Benito did not visit him, nor then, nor at any time after, would he look at him. Before the tribunal he refused. When pressed by the judges, he fainted. On the testimony of the sailors alone rested the legal identity of Babo. Some months after, dragged to the gibbet at the tail of a mule, the black met his voiceless end. The body was burned to ashes, but for many days the head, that hive of subtlety, 
fixed on a pole in the plaza, met unabashed the gaze of the whites, and across the plaza looked towards St. Bartholomew's church, in whose vaults slept then, as now, the recovered bones of Aranda, and across the Rimac Bridge looked towards the monastery on Mount Agonia without, where, three months after being dismissed by the court, Benito Sereno, born on the bier, did, indeed, follow his leader. End of section 7 and end of Benito Sereno Section 8 of The Piazza Tales by Herman Melville This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Chapter 4 The Lightning Rod Man what grand, irregular thunder, thought I, standing on my hearthstone among the Acrosaronian hills, as the scattered bolts boomed overhead and crashed down among the valleys, every bolt followed by zigzag irradiations and swift slants of sharp rain, which audibly rang like a charge of spear-points on my low shingled roof i suppose though that the mountains hereabouts break and churn up the thunder so that it is far more glorious here than on the plain hark someone at the door who is this that chooses a time of thunder for making calls and why don't he man fashion use the knocker instead of making that doleful undertaker's clatter with his fist against the hollow panel but let him in ah here he comes good day sir an entire stranger pray be seated what is that strange-looking walking-stick he carries a fine thunderstorm sir fine awful you are wet stand here on the hearth before the fire not for worlds the stranger still stood in the exact middle of the cottage where he had first planted himself his singularity impelled a closer scrutiny a lean gloomy figure hair dark and lank mattedly streaked over his brow his sunken pitfalls of eyes were ringed by indigo halos and played with an innocuous sort of lightning the gleam without the bolt the whole man was dripping he stood in a puddle on the bare oak floor his strange walking-stick vertically resting at his side it was a polished copper rod four feet long lengthwise attached to a neat wooden staff by insertion into two balls of greenish glass ringed with copper bands the metal rod terminated at the top tripod-wise in three keen tines brightly gilt he held the thing by the wooden part alone sir said i bowing politely have i the honor of a visit from that illustrious god jupiter tonans so stood he in the greek statue of old grasping the lightning bolt if you be he or his viceroy i have to thank you for this noble storm you have brewed among our mountains listen that was a glorious peal ah to a lover of the majestic it is a good thing to have the thunderer himself in one's cottage the thunder grows finer for that but pray be seated this old rush-bottomed armchair, I grant, is a poor substitute for your evergreen throne on Olympus, but condescend to be seated. While I thus pleasantly spoke, the stranger eyed me half in wonder and half in a strange sort of horror, but did not move a foot. Do, sir, be seated. You need to be dried ere going forth again. I planted the chair invitingly on the broad hearth, where a little fire had been kindled that afternoon to dissipate the dampness, not the cold, for it was early in the month of September. But without heeding my solicitation, and still standing in the middle of the floor, the stranger gazed at me pretentiously and spoke. Sir, said he, excuse me, but instead of my accepting your invitation to be seated on the hearth there, I solemnly warn you that you had best accept mine and stand with me in the middle of the room. Good heavens, he cried, starting, there is another of those awful crashes. I warn you, sir, quit the hearth. Mr. Jupiter Tonans, said I, 
quietly rolling my body on the stone, I stand very well here. Are you so horridly ignorant, then, he cried, as not to know that by far the most dangerous part of a house during such a terrific tempest as this is the fireplace? Nay, I did not know that, involuntarily stepping upon the first board next to the stone. The stranger now assumed such an unpleasant air of successful admonition that, quite involuntarily again, I stepped back upon the hearth and threw myself into the erectest, proudest posture I could command. But I said nothing. "'For heaven's sake!' he cried, with a strange mixture of alarm and intimidation. "'For heaven's sake, get off the hearth! Know you not that the heated air and soot are conductors? To say nothing of those immense iron fire-dogs, quit the spot, I conjure, I command you!' "'Mr. Jupiter Tonans, I am not accustomed to be commanded in my own house. Call me not by that pagan name. You are profane in this time of terror. Sir, will you be so good as to tell me your business? If you seek shelter from the storm, you are welcome, so long as you be civil. But if you come on business, open it forthwith. Who are you? I am a dealer in lightning rods, said the stranger, softening his tone. My special business is... Merciful heavens, what a crash! Have you ever been struck? Your premises, I mean? No, it's best to be provided, significantly rattling his metallic staff on the floor. By nature, there are no castles in thunderstorms. Yet, say but the word, and of this cottage I can make a Gibraltar by a few waves of this wand. Hark, what Himalayas of concussions! You interrupt yourself. Your special business you were about to speak of. My special business is to travel the country for orders for lightning rods. This is my specimen rod, tapping his staff. I have the best of references, fumbling in his pockets. In Cricken last month I put up three and twenty rods on only five buildings. Let me see. Was it not at Cricken last week, about midnight on Saturday, that the steeple, the big elm, and the assembly room cupola were struck? Any of your rods there? Not on the tree and cupola, but the steeple. Of what use is your rod, then? Of life and death use. But my workman was heedless. In fitting the rod at top to the steeple, he allowed a part of the metal to graze the tin sheeting. Hence the accident, not my fault, but his. Hark! Never mind. That clap burst quite loud enough to be heard without finger-pointing. Did you hear of the event at Montreal last year? A servant girl struck at her bedside with a rosary in her hand, the beads being metal. Does your beat extend into the Canadas? No. And I hear that there iron rods only are in use. They should have mine, which are copper. Iron is easily fused. Then they draw out the rod so slender that it has not body enough to conduct the full electric current. The metal melts. The building is destroyed. My copper rods never act so. Those Canadians are fools. Some of them knob the rod at the top, which risks a deadly explosion instead of imperceptibly carrying down the current into the earth, as this sort of rod does. Mine is the only true rod. Look at it. Only one dollar a foot. This abuse of your own calling in another might make one distrustful with respect to yourself. Hark! The thunder becomes less muttering. It is nearing us, and nearing the earth, too. Hark! One crammed crash! all the vibrations made one by nearness another flash hold what do you do i said seeing him now instantaneously relinquishing his staff lean intently forward towards the window with his right fore and middle fingers on his left wrist but ere the words had well escaped me another exclamation escaped him crash only three pulses less than a third of a mile off yonder somewhere in that wood i passed three stricken oaks there ripped out new and glittering 
The oak draws lightning more than other timber, having iron in solution in its sap. Your floor here seems oak. Heart of oak. From the peculiar time of your call upon me, I suppose you purposely select stormy weather for your journeys. When the thunder is roaring, you deem it an hour peculiarly favorable for producing impressions favorable to your trade. Hark! Awful! For one who would arm others with fear, you seem unbeseemingly timorous yourself. Common men choose fair weather for their travels. You choose thunderstorms. And yet that I travel in thunderstorms I grant, but not without particular precautions, such as only a lightning-rod man may know. Hark! Quick! Look at my specimen rod. Only one dollar a foot. A very fine rod, I dare say. But what are these particular precautions of yours? Yet first let me close yonder shutters. The slanting rain is beating through the sash. I will bar up. Are you mad? Know you not that yon iron bar is a swift conductor? Desist. I will simply close the shutters then and call my boy to bring me a wooden bar. Pray touch the bell pull there. Are you frantic? That bell wire might blast you. Never touch bell wire in a thunderstorm, nor ring a bell of any sort. Nor those in belfries? Pray, will you tell me where and how one may be safe in a time like this? Is there any part of my house I may touch with hopes of my life? There is, but not where you now stand. Come away from the wall. The current will sometimes run down a wall, and, a man being a better conductor than a wall, it would leave the wall and run into him. Swoop! That must have fallen very nigh. That must have been globular lightning. Very probably. Tell me at once which is, in your opinion, the safest part of this house. This room, and this one spot in it where I stand. Come hither. The reasons first. Hark! After the flash, the gust. The sashes shiver. The house. The house. Come hither to me. The reasons, if you please. Come hither to me. Thank you again. I think I will try my old stand, the hearth. And now, Mr. Lightning Rod Man, in the pauses of the thunder, be so good as to tell me your reasons for esteeming this one room of the house the safest, and your own one standpoint there the safest spot in it. There was now a little cessation of the storm for a while. The Lightning Rod Man seemed relieved and replied, your house is a one-storied house with an attic and a cellar. This room is between, hence its comparative safety. Because lightning sometimes passes from the clouds to the earth, and sometimes from the earth to the clouds, do you comprehend? And I choose the middle of the room because if the lightning should strike the house at all, it would come down the chimney or walls so obviously the further you are from them the better come hither to me now presently something you just said instead of alarming me has strangely inspired confidence what have i said you said that sometimes lightning flashes from the earth to the clouds ay the returning stroke as it is called when the earth being overcharged with the fluid flashes its surplus upward the returning stroke, that is, from earth to sky. Better and better. But come here on the hearth and dry yourself. I am better here, and better wet. How? It is the safest thing you can do. Hark, again, to get yourself thoroughly drenched in a thunderstorm. Wet clothes are better conductors than the body, and so, if the lightning strike, it might pass down the wet clothes without touching the body. The storm deepens again. Have you a rug in the house? Rugs are non-conductors. Get one, that I may stand on it here, and you too. The skies blacken. It is dusk at noon. Hark! The rug! The rug! I gave him one, while the hooded mountain seemed closing and tumbling into the cottage. 
and now since our being dumb will not help us said i resuming my place let me hear your precautions in traveling during thunderstorms wait till this one is past nay proceed with the precautions you stand in the safest possible place according to your own account go on briefly then i avoid pine trees high houses lonely barns upland pastures running water flocks of cattle and sheep a crowd of men if i travel on foot as today i do not walk fast if in my buggy i touch not its back or sides if on horseback i dismount and lead the horse but of all things i avoid tall men do i dream man avoid man and in danger time too tall men in a thunderstorm i avoid are you so grossly ignorant as not to know that the height of a six-footer is sufficient to discharge an electric cloud upon him are not lonely kentuckians ploughing smith in the unfinished furrow nay if the six-footer stand by running water the cloud will sometimes select him as its conductor to that running water hark sure young black pinnacle is split yes a man is a good conductor the lightning goes through and through a man but only peels a tree but sir you have kept me so long answering your questions that i have not yet come to business will you order one of my rods look at this specimen one see it is of the best of copper copper is the best conductor your house is low but being upon the mountains that lowness does not one whit depress it you mountaineers are most exposed in mountainous countries the lightning rod man should have most business look at the specimen sir one rod will answer for a house so small as this look over these recommendations only one rod sir cost only twenty dollars hark there go all the granite taconics and hoosics dashed together like pebbles by the sound that must have struck something an elevation of five feet above the house will protect twenty feet radius all about the rod only twenty dollars sir a dollar a foot hark dreadful will you order will you buy shall i put down your name think of being a heap of charred offal like a haltered horse burnt in his stall and all in one flash you pretended envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary to and from jupiter tonans laughed i you mere man who come here to put you and your pipe stem between clay and sky do you think that because you can strike a bit of green light from the laden jar that you can thoroughly avert the supernal bolt your rod rusts or breaks and where are you who has empowered you you tetzel to peddle round your indulgences from divine ordinations the hairs of our heads are numbered and the days of our lives in thunder as in sunshine i stand at ease in the hands of my god false negotiator away see the scroll of the storm is rolled back the house is unharmed and in the blue heavens i read in the rainbow that the deity will not of purpose make war on man's earth impious wretch foamed the stranger blackening in the face as the rainbow beamed i will publish your infidel notions the scowl grew blacker on his face the indigo circles enlarged round his eyes as the storm rings round the midnight moon he sprang upon me his tri-forked thing at my heart i seized it i snapped it i dashed it i trod it and dragging the dark lightning king out of my door flung his elbowed copper scepter after him but spite of my treatment and spite of my dissuasive talk of him to my neighbors the lightning rod man still dwells in the land still travels in storm time and drives a brave trade with the fears of man End of section 8. The Lightning Rod Man.
Section 9 of the Piazza Tales by Herman Melville, read by John Greenman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Encantadas, or Enchanted Isles, Chapter 5a, Sketch First, The Isles at Large. That may not be, said then the fairy man, least we unweeting hapt to be fordoon, for those same islands seeming now and then are not firm land, nor any certain won, uh, but straggling plots which to and fro do roan in the wide waters. Therefore are they height the wandering islands, therefore do them shone, for they have oft drawn many a wandering wight into most deadly danger and distressed plight, for Suhoever once hath fastened his foot thereon, may never it secure, but wandereth evermore uncertain and unsure. Dark, doleful, dreary, like a greedy grave that still for carrion carcasses doth crave, on top whereof I dwelt, the ghastly owl shrieking his baleful note, which ever drave far from that haunt all other cheerful fowl, and all about it wandering ghosts did wail and howl. Take five and twenty heaps of cinders dumped here and there in an outside city lot. Imagine some of them magnified into mountains, and the vacant lot the sea, and you will have a fit idea of the general aspect of the Encantadas, or Enchanted Isles a group rather of extinct volcanoes than of isles, looking much as the world at large might after a penal conflagration. It is to be doubted whether any spot of earth can, in desolateness, furnish a parallel to this group. Abandoned cemeteries of long ago, old cities by piecemeal tumbling to their ruin, these are melancholy enough but like all else which has but once been associated with humanity they still awaken in us some thoughts of sympathy however sad hence even the dead sea along with whatever other emotions it may at times inspire does not fail to touch in the pilgrim some of his less unpleasurable feelings and as for solitariness the great forests of the north the expanses of unnavigated waters, the Greenland ice-fields, are the profoundest of solitudes to a human observer. Still, the magic of their changeable tides and seasons mitigates their terror, because, though unvisited by men, those forests are visited by the May. The remotest seas reflect familiar stars even as Lake Erie does, and in the clear air of a fine polar day, the irradiated azure ice shows beautifully as malachite. But the special curse, as one may call it, of the Encantadas, that which exalts them in desolation above Idumea and the Pole, is that to them change never comes, neither the change of seasons nor of sorrows. Cut by the equator, they know not autumn and they know not spring, while already reduced to the lees of fire, ruin itself can work little more upon them. The showers refresh the deserts, but in these isles rain never falls. Like split Syrian gourds left withering in the sun, they are cracked by an everlasting drought beneath a torrid sky. Have mercy upon me! the wailing spirit of the Encantada seems to cry, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Another feature in these isles is their emphatic uninhabitableness. It is deemed a fit type of all forsaken overthrow that the jackal should den in the wastes of weedy Babylon but the Encantadas refuse to harbor even the outcasts of the beasts. Man and wolf alike disown them. Little but reptile life is here found. Tortoises, lizards, immense spiders, snakes, 
and that strangest anomaly of outlandish nature, the aguano. No voice, no low, no howl is heard. The chief sound of life here is a hiss. On most of the isles where vegetation is found at all, it is more ungrateful than the blankness of Atacama. Tangled thickets of wiry bushes, without fruit and without a name, springing up among deep fissures of calcined rock and treacherously masking them, or a parched growth of distorted cactus trees. In many places the coast is rock-bound, or more properly clinker-bound, tumbled masses of blackish or greenish stuff like the dross of an iron furnace, forming dark clefts and caves here and there, into which a ceaseless sea pours a fury of foam. Overhanging them with a swirl of gray, haggard mist, amidst which sail screaming flights of unearthly birds heightening the dismal din. However calm the sea without, there is no rest for these swells and those rocks. They lash and are lashed, even when the outer ocean is most at peace with itself. On the oppressive, clouded days, such as are peculiar to this part of the watery equator, the dark, vitrified masses, many of which raise themselves among white whirlpools and breakers in detached and perilous places off the shore, present a most Plutonian sight. In no world but a fallen one could such lands exist. Those parts of the strand free from the marks of fire stretch away in wide level beaches of multitudinous dead shells with here and there decayed bits of sugar-cane, bamboos, and coconuts, washed upon this other and darker world from the charming palm isles to the westward and southward, all the way from paradise to Tartarus. While mixed with the relics of distant beauty, you will sometimes see fragments of charred wood and moldering ribs of wrecks neither will any one be surprised at meeting these last after observing the conflicting currents which eddy throughout nearly all the wide channels of the entire group the capriciousness of the tides of air sympathizes with those of the sea nowhere is the wind so light baffling and every way unreliable and so given to perplexing calms as at the encantadas nigh a month has been spent by a ship going from one isle to another though but ninety miles between for owing to the force of the current the boats employed to tow barely suffice to keep the craft from sweeping upon the cliffs but do nothing towards accelerating her voyage sometimes it is impossible for a vessel from afar to fetch up with the group itself unless large allowances for prospective leeway have been made ere its coming in sight. And yet, at other times, there is a mysterious indraft which irresistibly draws a passing vessel among the isles, though not bound to them. True, at one period, as to some extent at the present day, large fleets of whalemen cruised for spermaceti upon what some seamen call the enchanted ground. But this, as in due place will be described, was off the great outer isle of Albemarle, away from the intricacies of the smaller isles, where there is plenty of sea-room, and hence to that vicinity the above remarks do not altogether apply, though even there the current runs at times with singular force, shifting too with as singular a caprice. Indeed there are seasons when currents quite unaccountable prevail for a great distance round about the total group, and are so strong and irregular as to change a vessel's course against the helm, though sailing at the rate of four or five miles the hour. The difference in the reckonings of navigators produced by these causes, along with the light and variable winds, long nourished a persuasion that there existed two distinct clusters of isles in the parallel of the Encantadas, about a hundred leagues apart. Such was the idea of their earlier visitors, the buccaneers, and as late as 1750 the charts of that part of the Pacific accorded with the strange delusion, 
and this apparent fleetingness and unreality of the locality of the isles was most probably one reason for the spaniards calling them the encantada or enchanted group but not uninfluenced by their character as they now confessedly exist the modern voyager will be inclined to fancy that the bestowal of this name might have in part originated in that air of spellbound desertness which so significantly invests the isles nothing can better suggest the aspect of once living things malignly crumbled from ruddiness into ashes apples of sodom after touching seem these isles however wavering their place may seem by reason of the currents they themselves at least to one upon the shore appear invariably the same fixed cast glued into the very body of cadaverous death nor would the appellation enchanted seem misapplied in still another sense for concerning the peculiar reptile inhabitant of these wilds whose presence gives the group its second spanish name gallipagos concerning the tortoises found here most mariners have long cherished a superstition not more frightful than grotesque they earnestly believe that all wicked sea officers more especially commodores and captains are at death and in some cases before death transformed into tortoises thenceforth dwelling upon these hot aridities sole solitary lords of asphaltum doubtless so quaintly dolorous a thought was originally inspired by the woe-begun landscape itself but more particularly perhaps by the tortoises for apart from their strictly physical features there is something strangely self-condemned in the appearance of these creatures lasting sorrow and penal hopelessness are in no animal form so suppliantly expressed as in theirs while the thought of their wonderful longevity does not fail to enhance the impression nor even at the risk of meriting the change of absurdly believing in enchantments can i restrain the admission that sometimes even now when leaving the crowded city to wander out july and august among the adirondack mountains far from the influences of towns and proportionally nigh to the mysterious ones of nature when at such times i sit me down in the mossy head of some deep wooded gorge surrounded by prostrate trunks of blasted pines and recall as in a dream my other and far distant rovings in the baked heart of the charmed isles and remember the sudden glimpses of dusky shells and long languid necks protruded from the leafless thickets and again have beheld the vitreous inland rocks worn down and grooved into deep ruts by ages and ages of the slow draggings of tortoises in quest of pools of scanty water i can hardly resist the feeling that in my time i have indeed slept upon evilly enchanted ground nay such is the vividness of my memory or the magic of my fancy that i know not whether i am not the occasional victim of optical delusion concerning the gallipagos for often in scenes of social merriment and especially at revels held by candlelight in old-fashioned mansions so that shadows are thrown into the further recesses of an angular and spacious room making them put on a look of haunted undergrowth of lonely woods i have drawn the attention of my comrades by my fixed gaze and sudden change of air as i have seemed to see slowly emerging from those imagined solitudes and heavily crawling along the floor the ghost of a gigantic tortoise with memento blank burning in live letters upon his back End of section 9, The Encantadas, sketch first, The Isles at Large. Section 10 of The Piazza Tales by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Chapter 5b, The Encantadas, sketch 2, Two Sides to a Tortoise. 
most ugly shapes and horrible aspects such as dame nature self mote fear to see or shame that ever should so foul defects from her most cunning hand escaped be all dreadful portraits of deformity no wonder if these do a man appall for all that here at home we dreadful hold be but as bugs to fearin babes withal compared to the creatures in these isles and trawl fear not then said the palmer a well avised for these same monsters are not there indeed but are into these fearful shapes disguised and lifting up his virtuous staff on high then all that dreadful army fast can fly into great zethe's bosom where they hidden lie in view of the description given may one be gay upon the encantadas yes that is find one the gaiety and he will be gay and indeed sackcloth and ashes as they are the isles are not perhaps unmitigated gloom for while no spectator can deny their claims to a most solemn and superstitious consideration no more than my firmest resolutions can decline to behold the spectre tortoise when emerging from its shadowy recess yet even the tortoise dark and melancholy as it is upon the back still possesses a bright side its calipi or breastplate being sometimes of a faint yellowish or golden tinge moreover every one knows that tortoises as well as turtle are of such a make that if you but put them on their backs you thereby expose their bright sides without the possibility of their recovering themselves and turning into view the other but after you have done this and because you have done this you should not swear that the tortoise has a dark side enjoy the bright keep it turned up perpetually if you can but be honest and don't deny the black neither should he who cannot turn the tortoise from its natural position so as to hide the darker and expose his livelier aspect like a greek october pumpkin in the sun for that cause declare the creature to be one total inky blot the tortoise is both black and bright but let us to particulars some months before my first stepping ashore upon the group my ship was cruising in its close vicinity one noon we found ourselves off the south head of albemarle and not very far from the land partly by way of freak and partly by way of spying out so strange a country a boat's crew was sent ashore with orders to see all they could and besides bring back whatever tortoises they could conveniently transport it was after sunset when the adventurers returned i looked down over the ship's high side as if looking down over the curb of a well and dimly saw the damp boat deep in the sea with some unwonted weight ropes were dropped over and presently three huge antediluvian looking tortoises after much straining were landed on deck they seemed hardly of the seed of earth we had been broad upon the waters for five long months a period amply sufficient to make all things of the land wear a fabulous hue to the dreamy mind had three spanish custom-house officers boarded us then it is not unlikely that i should have curiously stared at them felt of them and stroked them much as savages serve civilized guests but instead of three custom-house officers behold these really wondrous tortoises none of your schoolboy mud-turtles but black as widower's weeds heavy as chests of plate with vast shells medallioned and orbed like shields and dented and blistered like shields that have breasted a battle shaggy too here and there with dark green moss and slimy with the spray of the sea these mystic creatures 
suddenly translated by night from unutterable solitudes to our peopled deck, affected me in a manner not easy to unfold. They seemed newly crawled forth from beneath the foundations of the world. Yea, they seemed the identical tortoises whereon the Hindu plants this total sphere. With a lantern I inspected them more closely. Such a worshipful venerableness of aspect! such furry greenness mantling the rude peelings and healing the fissures of their shattered shells. I no more saw three tortoises. They expanded, became transfigured. I seemed to see three Roman coliseums in magnificent decay. Ye oldest inhabitants of this or any other isle, said I, Pray give me the freedom of your three-walled towns. The great feeling inspired by these creatures was that of age, dateless, indefinite endurance, and, in fact, that any other creature can live and breathe as long as the tortoises of the Encantadas, I will not readily believe. Not to hint of their known capacity of sustaining life, while going without food for an entire year, Consider that impregnable armor of their living male. What other bodily being possesses such a citadel wherein to resist the assaults of time? As lantern in hand I scraped among the moss and beheld the ancient scars of bruises received in many a sullen fall among the marly mountains of the isle, scars strangely widened, swollen, half obliterate, and yet distorted like those sometimes found in the bark of very hoary trees, I seemed an antiquary of a geologist, studying the bird tracks and ciphers upon the exhumed slates trod by incredible creatures whose very ghosts are now defunct. As I lay in my hammock that night, overhead I heard the slow, weary draggings of the three ponderous strangers along the encumbered deck. Their stupidity, or their resolution, was so great that they never went aside for any impediment. One ceased his movements altogether just before the mid-watch. At sunrise I found him butted like a battering ram against the immovable foot of the foremast, and still striving, tooth and nail, to force the impossible passage. That these tortoises are the victims of a penal or malignant or perhaps a downright diabolical enchanter seems in nothing more likely than in that strange infatuation of hopeless toil which so often possesses them. I have known them in their journeyings ram themselves heroically against rocks, and long abide there nudging, wriggling, wedging, in order to displace them, and so hold on their inflexible path. Their crowning curse is their drudging impulse to straightforwardness in a belittered world. Meeting with no such hindrance as their companion did, the other tortoises merely fell foul of small stumbling blocks, buckets, blocks, and coils of rigging, and at times in the act of crawling over them would slip with an astounding rattle to the deck. Listening to these draggings and concussions, I thought me of the haunt from which they came, an isle full of metallic ravines and gulches, sunk bottomlessly into the hearts of splintered mountains, and covered for many miles with inextricable thickets. I then pictured these three straightforward monsters, century after century, writhing through the shades, grim as blacksmiths, crawling so slowly and ponderously that not only did toadstools and all fungus things grow beneath their feet, but a sooty moss sprouted upon their backs. With them I lost myself in volcanic mazes, brushed away endless boughs of rotting thickets, till finally in a dream I found myself sitting cross-legged upon the foremost, a Brahmin similarly mounted upon either side, forming a tripod of foreheads which upheld the universal cope. Such was the wild nightmare begot by my first impression of the Encantada's tortoise. But next evening, strange to say, I sat down with my shipmates 
and made a merry repast from tortoise steaks and tortoise stews and supper over out knife and helped convert the three mighty concave shells into three fanciful soup tureens and polished the three flat yellowish calipes into three gorgeous salvers end of section ten the encantas sketch two two sides to a tortoise section eleven of the piazza tales by herman melville this librivox recording is in the public domain read by john greenman chapter five c the encantadas sketch third rock rodondo for they this tight the rock of vile reproach a dangerous and dreadful place to which nor fish nor fowl did once approach but yelling meows with seagulls whores and base and cormorants with birds of ravenous race which still sit waiting on that dreadful cliff with that the rolling sea resounding soft in his big bass them fitly answered and on the rock the waves breaking aloft a solemn inane unto them measured then he the boatman bade row easily and let him hear some part of that rare melody suddenly an innumerable flight of harmful fowls about them fluttering cried and with their wicked wings them oft did smite and sore annoyed groping in that grisly night even all the nation of unfortunate and fatal birds about them flocked were to go up into a high stone tower is not only a very fine thing in itself but the very best mode of gaining a comprehensive view of the region round about it is all the better if this tower stands solitary and alone like that mysterious newport one or else be sole survivor of some perished castle now with reference to the enchanted isles we are fortunately supplied with just such a noble point of observation in a remarkable rock from its peculiar figure called of old by the spaniards rock rodondo or round rock some two hundred and fifty feet high rising straight from the sea ten miles from land with the whole mountainous group to the south and east rock rotondo occupies on a large scale very much the position which the famous campanile or detached bell tower of st mark does with respect to the tangled group of hoary edifices around it ere ascending however to gaze abroad upon the encantadas this sea tower itself claims attention it is visible at the distance of thirty miles and fully participating in that enchantment which pervades the group when first seen afar invariably is mistaken for a sail four leagues away of a golden hazy noon it seems some spanish admiral's ship stacked up with glittering canvas sail ho sail ho sail ho from all three masts but coming nigh the enchanted frigate is transformed apace into a craggy keep my first visit to the spot was made in the gray of the morning with a view of fishing we had lowered three boats and pulling some two miles from our vessel found ourselves just before dawn of day close under the moon shadow of rodondo its aspect was heightened and yet softened by the strange double twilight of the hour the great full moon burnt in the low west like a half-spent beacon casting a soft mellow tinge upon the sea like that cast by a waning fire of embers upon a midnight hearth while along the entire east the invisible sun sent pallid intimations of his coming the wind was light the waves languid the stars twinkled with faint effulgence all nature seemed supine with a long night watch and half suspended in jaded expectation of the sun this was the critical hour to catch rodondo in his perfect mood the twilight was just enough to reveal every striking point without tearing away the dim vestiture of wonder from a broken stair-like base washed as the steps of a water-palace by the waves 
the tower rose in entablatures of strata to a shaven summit these uniform layers which compose the mass form its most peculiar feature for at their lines of junction they project flatly into encircling shelves from top to bottom rising one above another in graduated series and as the eaves of any old barn or abbey are alive with swallows so were all these rocky ledges with unnumbered sea-fowl eaves upon eaves and nests upon nests here and there were long bird-lime streaks of ghostly white staining the tower from sea to air readily accounting for its sail-like look afar all would have been bewitchingly quiescent were it not for the demoniac din created by the birds not only were the eaves rustling with them but they flew densely overhead spreading themselves into a winged and continually shifting canopy the tower is the resort of aquatic birds for hundreds of leagues around to the north to the east to the west stretches nothing but eternal ocean so that the man-of-war hawk coming from the coasts of north america polynesia or peru makes his first land at rodondo and yet though rodondo be terra firma no land bird ever lighted on it fancy a red robin or a canary there what a falling into the hands of the philistines when the poor warbler should be surrounded by such locust flights of strong bandit birds with long bills cruel as daggers i know not where one can better study the natural history of strange sea-fowl than at rodondo it is the aviary of ocean birds light here which never touched mast or tree hermit birds which ever fly alone cloud birds familiar with unpierced zones of air let us first glance low down to the lowermost shelf of all which is the widest too and but a little space from high water mark what outlandish beings are these erect as men but hardly as symmetrical they stand all round the rock like sculptured caryatids supporting the next range of eaves above their bodies are grotesquely misshapen their bills short their feet seemingly legless while the members at their sides are neither fin wing nor arm and truly neither fish flesh nor fowl is the penguin as an edible pertaining neither to carnival nor lent without exception the most ambiguous and least lovely creature yet discovered by man though dabbling in all three elements and indeed possessing some rudimental claims to all the penguin is at home in none on land it stumps afloat it sculls in the air it flops as if ashamed of her failure nature keeps this ungainly child hidden away at the ends of the earth in the straits of magellan and on the abased sea story of rodondo but look what are yon woebegone regiments drawn up on the next shelf above what rank and file of large strange fowl what sea friars of orders gray pelicans their elongated bills and heavy leathern pouches suspended thereto give them the most lugubrious expression a pensive race they stand for hours together without motion their dull ashy plumage imparts an aspect as if they had been powdered over with cinders a penitential bird indeed fitly haunting the shores of the clinkered and cantatas whereon tormented job himself might have well sat down and scraped himself with potsherds higher up now we mark the goni or gray albatross anomalously so called an unsightly unpoetic bird unlike its storied kinsman which is the snow-white ghost of the haunted capes of hope and horn as we still ascend from shelf to shelf we find the tenants of the tower serially disposed in order of their magnitude gannets black and speckled haglets jays sea hens sperm whale birds gulls of all varieties thrones princedoms powers dominating one above another in senatorial array 
while sprinkled over all, like an ever-repeated fly in a great piece of broidery, the stormy petrel or Mother Carey's chicken sounds his continual challenge and alarm. That this mysterious hummingbird of ocean, which, had it but brilliancy of hue, might, from its evanescent liveliness, be almost called its butterfly, yet whose chirrup under the stern is ominous to mariners as to the peasant the death-tick sounding from behind the chimney-jam, should have its special haunt at the Encantadas contributes, in the seaman's mind, not a little to their dreary spell. As day advances, the dissonant din augments. With ear-splitting cries, the wild birds celebrate their matins. Each moment flights push from the tower and join the aerial choir hovering overhead, while their places below are supplied by darting myriads. But down through all this discord of commotion I hear clear, silver, bugle-like notes unbrokenly falling like oblique lines of swift-slanting rain in a cascading shower. I gaze far up and behold a snow-white angelic thing with one long, lance-like feather thrust out behind. It is the bright, inspiriting chanticleer of ocean, the beauteous bird, from its bestirring whistle of musical invocation, fitly styled the boatswain's mate. The winged, life-clouding Rodondo had its full counterpart in the finny hosts which peopled the waters at its base. Below the waterline the rock seemed one honeycomb of grottoes, affording labyrinthine lurking-places for swarms of fairy-fish. All were strange, many exceedingly beautiful, and would have well graced the costliest glass globes in which goldfish are kept for a show. Nothing was more striking than the complete novelty of many individuals of this multitude. Here hues were seen as yet unpainted, and figures which are unengraved. To show the multitude, avidity, and nameless fearlessness and tameness of these fish, let me say that often, marking through clear spaces of water, temporarily made so by the concentric dartings of the fish above the surface, certain larger and less unwary whites, which swam slow and deep, our anglers would cautiously essay to drop their lines down to these last but in vain. There was no passing the uppermost zone. No sooner did the hook touch the sea than a hundred infatuates contended for the honor of capture. Poor fish of Rotondo! In your victimized confidence you are of the number of those who inconsiderately trust, while they do not understand, human nature. But the dawn is now fairly day, band after band, the sea-fowls sail away to forage the deep for their food. The tower is left solitary, save the fish-caves at its base. Its bird-lime gleams in the golden rays like the whitewash of a tall lighthouse, or the lofty sails of a cruiser. This moment, doubtless, while we know it to be a dead desert rock, other voyagers are taking oaths it is a glad populous ship. But ropes now, and let us ascend. Yet soft, this is not so easy. End of section 11, The Encantadas, sketch third, Rock Rodondo.